everyone, and welcome to the 2022 Airbus Summit. We are broadcasting live from the Airbus Henry Ziegler Delivery Center here in Toulouse. About 100 journalists and special guests are with us. Thank you for making the effort to join us here in Toulouse. And a warm welcome to everyone who has connected from around the world. My name is Jennifer Newlands. And I'm Alexander Lieper. We are both working for Airbus Communications and we are truly delighted to be your host for the next couple of days. We'll be guiding you through the round tables, panel discussions and presentations. And each moment will be followed by a Q&A session. Our guests here in the room will have the opportunity to ask the questions live directly to our panelists. And online viewers can use the Q&A function on their YouTube screen on the right hand side. And Jen, I think I will now let you kick off the summit. And ladies and gentlemen, you will see me later for the first panel. Thanks, Jen. Alex. Now, the first edition of our summit last year generated positive coverage around the world. The summit brought the aerospace industry together again as the world emerged from the pandemic. Our focus was on the sector's path to reaching net zero carbon emissions by 2050. We talked about technologies being implemented now to reduce the environmental footprint of air transport. We presented new partnerships. We unveiled City Airbus Next Gen and laid out our roadmap towards cleaner vertical flight. Airlines from around the world shared their vision for future sustainable operations. Our space colleagues showed us how Earth observation technologies contribute to the fight against climate change and we took stock of the formidable collective challenge we all face throughout the industry to meet our net zero objectives. This year, we'll take a closer look at the tangible, concrete progress being made every day on our journey towards decarbonization. New innovations and key partnerships are appearing by the month as airlines, manufacturers, airports, research bodies, and energy companies come together to reshape the sector. 2022 is also a pivotal year for policymakers, with the COP27 earlier this month and the ICAO General Assembly a few weeks ago, where the member states agreed to a long-term aspirational goal of net zero carbon emissions by 2050 for our sector. We'll be touching on all of these topics and more, demonstrating how, as an industry, we are truly gathering pace towards sustainable aerospace. So let's get started. To kick off this second Airbus Summit, I am happy to present, beaming in from Paris, our Chief Executive Officer, Guillaume Fauri. Good morning, Guillaume. Hi, good morning. Can you hear me? We certainly can. Okay, so good morning, everyone. And uh, welcome to Toulouse and to the uh, and to the other summit. Um, also, a warm welcome uh, from my side to those of you who are joining uh, virtually from across the world. Actually, um, a bit like me. I had uh, long plans to be in Toulouse with you today, uh, but for a very specific reason, I have to to travel to the uh, United States on uh, on late notice, on short notice. It is. Uh, it is not really avoidable um, for me, and um, I apologize for not being with you in person, and I sincerely regret it. However, I know uh, that um, I'm leaving you in good hands with my um, Airbus colleagues, and um, I uh, look forward to taking uh, questions, few questions, um, in a few moments. This is our second Airbus summit. Last September, we brought the aerospace industry together um, as parts of the world emerge from the pandemic. Our focus, you remember, was on the sector reaching net zero by 2050. We set out a credible pathway to get there uh, with uh, several uh, core elements that I will just um, share again. The first one is more efficient planes and air traffic management. For example, the A321XLR will reduce fuel consumption and CO2 emissions by up to 30% compared to um, previous generation um, single aisle aircraft when it enters into service in 2024. And that, that's a very uh, feasible and credible uh, 
uh, elements. Uh, as those planes exist, uh, they need to be produced and delivered, but that's, that's a very concrete one. Another element is the growth of sustainable aviation fuels, the SAP, to curb emissions from today's aircraft, uh, with Airbus working towards certification of aircraft to fly on 100% SAF by uh, 2030. Again, SAF, the SAF, the Sustainable Aviation Fuels, exist today. There are plenty of them. Um, they need to be produced. It needs to be scaled up, but that's doable. That's feasible. A third element is obviously the arrival of hydrogen-powered commercial flights in the 2030s. Airbus Zero Emission Airliner is planned to enter into service by 2035. And for those of you who join uh, the summit in person, tomorrow you will be in Munich visiting the Airbus E-Aircraft System House. This is one of the cradles of the zero emission revolution. As you can see, the light is, uh, is being automatically switched off. Um, and this is one of the cradles of the zero emission uh, revolution. By the way, it's the first time that we are uh, opening its door to the public. And yes, a hydrogen plan is something doable. Um, it's more about the ecosystem, and that's why that's one of the reasons why we have uh, this summit. It's also to onboard and to gather uh, all the forces around that transformation that goes beyond uh, Airbus and um, the, uh, the aviation industry. More generally, the sector will undergo transformation by digitalization, autonomous flights, automation, robotization, and other exciting innovation. One thing was clear. For this vision to become reality, we have to make the 2020s, this decade, a decade of change, a decade of profound, far-reaching, and fast change. So this is our theme for this year's summit action in a time of crisis. As an industry, we want to stand up and be transparent on sustainability. We've seen stark evidence of the scale of the climate crisis from wildfires in Europe to flooding in Pakistan. At COP27, we've heard influential voices raising concerns about the environmental impact of aviation. So at this summit, at the Airbus Summit. We want to show how Airbus and the sector are acting on sustainability. Show what we do and where we are. What's the state of play? Overall, it's a mixed picture. But I need nevertheless to say how impressed I am of the way this sector has come together this year. I've seen a shared resolve to use this energy and economic crisis to accelerate progress on sustainability. Undeniably, there has been strong progress. This year, for the first time, the sector has united around a viable decarbonization roadmap. The Toulouse Declaration in February saw 42 countries agree to reach carbon neutrality for commercial aviation by 2050. Then, this autumn, the ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, adopted a long-term aspirational goal, LTAG, for net zero carbon emissions for the first time again. ICAO is the only worldwide civil organization body comprising more than uh, 100 members. What it means is that governments fell into line behind the aviation industry's net zero targets. This is a vital step towards a global policy framework for this uh, global industry. ICAO's decision was the result of several years of painstaking advocacy by Airbus and other players, culminating in a final push at the autumn assembly of the ICAO in Montreal. So the outline of a Korean policy framework is taking shape around us. Further impetus on renewable energy has come from the US IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, and in Europe with uh, Fit for 55. There's also been progress on transparency. Airbus climate targets have now been independently assessed and validated by SBTI, 
this demonstrates the credibility of our roadmap towards reaching net zero. The SBTI helps companies to set emission reduction targets in line with climate science and the parent agreement goals. Earlier this year, we committed to defining science-based targets for the entire set of our emissions and submitted midterm targets. To be uh, concrete, for example, we committed to reducing by 46% the greenhouse gas emissions intensity generated by our commercial aircraft in service by 2035. The rigor of SBTI means there will be no hiding place for us if we fall short. The energy picture is changing too. More airlines are acting to secure supplies of sustainable efficient fuels of staff from the US to Europe and Australia. At Airbus, we've announced a SAF fund to enable our partners to invest with us. Since spring 2021, three Airbus aircraft types have flown with at least one engine running on 100% SAF, most recently the A380 at the end of March. A number of proof points I'd like to share with you. The defense sector is also embracing sustainability, and that's quite new. Two weeks ago, the Royal Air Force in the UK, Airbus and other industry partners carried out the world's first 100% SAF flight using an in-service military aircraft. The Royal Air Force Voyager, the military variant of the Airbus A330, took to the sky above um, Bryce Norton in Oxfordshire, powered by 100% uh, sustainable aviation fuels on both engines. Meanwhile, this year Airbus has announced partnerships to develop direct air carbon capture technology, not only to remove CO2 from the atmosphere, but also as a source of power to liquid synthetic fuels. Hydrogen herbs have been appearing around the world, bringing together airlines, airports, and energy providers, and a lot of alliances and cooperations in that field. I can't wait for you to see and hear about the progress Airbus is making with our partners on the first zero emission airline. In February, we announced that we'll use an A380, the largest passenger jet, to test the hydrogen powered engine together with our partner from uh, CFMI, from CFM International. The test aircraft is expected to fly in the middle of this decade with a new engine fitted alongside four conventional turbines. This should help resolve complex engineering challenges, such as how to store the liquid hydrogen on board. Meanwhile, our very fuel-efficient A321 XLR made its first flight this summer en route to entering service in 2024, as I say. Finally, against the backdrop of uh, a lot of geopolitical tensions, We've also stepped up our efforts to develop the next generation of European defense technology through the Future Combatant System and Eurodrone. So this is proving to be a time of action and innovation, and as I said, a time of speed and acceleration. All about speed. But is the world moving fast enough towards net zero. Is the aerospace industry on track to meet its targets? I think the realistic answer is not yet. That's why it's all about speed and acceleration. By 2030, stuff will need to be produced at many times the level of today. Ambition is not yet matched by action. There needs to be more investment in new refineries and production facilities and more ambitious mandates, objectives for sustainable aviation fuel. Similarly, the infrastructure for producing and distributing in green hydrogen is still in the early stages of development, but the clock is ticking for it to be in place to fuel commercial aviation 
by the 2030s and probably many other sectors much earlier. Indeed, I believe it's difficult to overstate the scale of the energy challenge. According to the International Energy Agency, the IEA, international clean energy investment will need to reach $4 trillion annually by 2030 for governments to be on track for net zero. Currently, the figure is projected to reach $2 uh, trillion by then, so half of the $4 billion. So, and trying to, to come to conclusion, in the face of multiple crises, governments and the aerospace industry are taking collective action to tackle climate change and improve um, energy availability and energy security. The pace of change may feel uncomfortable, but radical change always is. So this must be just the beginning. At Airbus, we are pushing and we will push for even more speed, and as you can see, uh, energy savings, uh, alignment and investment in the next 12 months. We've organized this summit in this spirit. We want to show how Airbus and the aerospace sector are taking actions in a time of multiple crises and how much further we believe we have to go. Our sector now has a credible roadmap to net zero by 2050. The time for excuses is over. The time for action is upon us. Thank you for your attention. And I think now I'm ready to take a few questions um, to lose. Thank you very much, Guillaume. Thank you. So we're now ready to open the floor for some questions here in the room. Uh, if we give you a microphone, please make sure you tell us your name and the publication you work for. Um, and viewers online can submit their questions via the Q&A function. So who wants to start this off? Over in the back here. Good morning. Good morning. Angel Calvo from the Spanish Press News and CFA. You are going to the U.S., and I suppose you will discuss about the IRA, which is uh, an act uh, between other things to the sustainable world in the future for the U.S. Can you explain us which are the implications for Airbus, and if it would be uh, and between these implications that you can choose to invest more in the U.S. and less in Europe, for example, and if it's the case, do you have an advice for European authorities? Well, indeed, um, IRA is, um, is a very important uh, change um, in the landscape for many industries, including for aerospace. Uh, it has indeed a lot of positive elements to accelerate in the direction of uh, decarbonization and is really uh, encouraging investment, a lot of investment um, in the US um, supported by, by heavy um, uh, public money. Uh, so it has the ingredients of acceleration in the US, acceleration in the right direction with incentives, um, and that, that's very encouraging, uh, but it's also creating um, unbalance uh, and, and probably uh, unfairness uh, between the way the US is moving forward and the solution uh, decided by Europe. So yes, I see a lot of projects that are making by far more sense now in the US with the IRA uh, than they would uh, in Europe. And there is a need to have a dialogue on what it means uh, for the, uh, uh, the cooperation and the alliance between, uh, between the two blocks, between the US and Europe. So I'm really worried that this would uh, make investment in the US by far more uh, meaningful than in Europe. I hear industries where IRA is making short term a very big difference. And there is a need uh, to discuss uh, this unbalance. But I think IRA shows as well the strong resolve of the US to move fast in that direction. And indeed, IRA is uh, accelerating things um, much faster than what I was expecting uh, still a couple of months ago. So the US is really on, on uh, this uh, acceleration uh, trajectory. And we need in Europe probably to think on the way we are uh, driving change, we are driving uh, decarbonization. There's probably more to be done to help, to support, to encourage uh, the, the positive attraction to investment 
rather than regulate and, uh, and put constraints on what we don't want to see happening. So um, it's a stimulus, maybe, and uh, let's try to make good use of it. Thank you, Guillaume. Next question, down here, please. Good morning, Richard Schumann, Aaron Seid. Mr. Fari, how worried are you that you are having a plane flying on hydrogen in 2035, fully designed, fully tested, but then there is no hydrogen? Is there a scenario that this is really becoming a problem because the initiatives are going so slowly? Yes, thank you. That, that's a very important question to us. Um, I, um, I like to, to uh, share the perspective in the following way. To fly, to have airlines flying a hydrogen plane in the second half of the next decade, uh, we will need to have a plane developed, certified, produced. That's in our hands. Uh, that's probably not the most difficult part of the equation. Uh, we will need to have a regulatory framework. What has happened in the ICAO uh, with Corsia and with LTAG will help, but there are many more uh, regulations that we need to see changing or being invented to be able to use um, hydrogen, to be able to certify planes uh, using hydrogen, how to, to uh, transport hydrogen, how to distribute hydrogen, and so on. So the regulatory framework, and that's an area where we are trying to collaborate, to involve other parties, to drive uh, that change. We're participating into a number of um, uh, multi-sectorial um, organizations and companies uh, to drive that uh, regulatory framework. Uh, and the third one is, well, we need uh, green hydrogen in large quantities in the second half of the next decade uh, to be available at the airports in the right level of quantity at the right price and so on, okay? So this is indeed something that is uh, very important for us. That's why we are working a lot on what we call the ecosystem. We are no longer just focusing on planes. That was probably enough for the past decade. It's not gonna be enough for the future. That's why we are gathering uh, groups of people like, like you today to fully understand the implications um, on this broader ecosystem and to be able to drive change in those directions and indeed, uh, availability or lack of availability, I'm sorry with this, <laughs> um, availability or, or lack of availability of green hydrogen uh, at the right quantity, at the right place, at the right price uh, in, the, in the second half of the next decade is a big concern for me. And that's why we are acting a lot with the energy sector to understand and to drive. Uh, it's now hydrogen for planes, like for ships, is probably much easier to plan and to structure than for cars, for instance, because you have a small number of points of distribution in the case of airports versus uh, the need for a very large network of distribution would you want to power cars with hydrogen. So we think starting with ships and starting with planes is something that would have a lot of sense uh, for the uh, energy sector. But that's in the making and that's part of what we need to achieve. Would we face the situation by 2027, 20, 2028, 20, when we will have to launch uh, to make the decision for the launch of the hydrogen plane at Airbus. Would we face a situation where there would be no certainty that by entering to service around 2035, there would not be enough hydrogen in the right conditions available? That could be a reason for delaying the launch of the program, even if the technologies for the plane themselves are mature. So we take this energy dimension very seriously. Thank you, Guillaume. And, and sticking on the hydrogen topic, we have um, an online question from one of our online viewers who's asking um, if the future hydrogen-powered flight will be a gas turbine or fuel cells or powered by both. Well, it's uh, one of the most important questions we have to answer. Uh, we're working today on technologies and we are assessing the potential of those different uh, pathways. Um, they have in common the fact that you need to, to store and distribute hydrogen on board. That is already a big challenge. That's what I explained uh, with the uh, A380 demonstration that we're gonna be uh, doing um, later in a couple of, uh, of years now. Uh, so the, the, the common piece is uh, hydrogen storage and distribution. You need to be able to 
to uh, fuel to fill the tank as well. So there's a lot of things we need to, to design. But how the hydrogen is used on board um, with uh, burning hydrogen in a turbine, that is probably the easiest way to go to hydrogen, but there's also some negative sides. Or going to a fuel cell that is probably uh, much more demanding compared to where we start from, uh, or a combination of both that has maybe a lot of merits. That's what we're working at the moment. So that's too early to answer the question, but that's indeed a very, very relevant question. Thank you. Another question down here. This gentleman, thank you. Guillaume, uh, John Ostrauer. Uh, there are currently seven approved pathways for SAF conversion uh, in creating the, the actual fuel required for fueling aircraft with what was once known as biofuel, but now we call, we call SAF. Given the Airbus target for 2030, and what I hear from you is a, an existential urgency to, to have the industry in place to be able to get to 2050 net zero, and along the way, it sounds like there won't be an industry unless it's uh, achieved. Why is there not a greater focus from Airbus in terms of its funding commitment and product development for a the, create the demand side of aircraft to have an aircraft that is available for SAF 100% before, well before 2030 when it takes you six, seven years, five, six, seven years to develop an all new commercial aircraft and engine combination knows the tail. Um, well, maybe I need to, to share some data with you. Um, first, all the planes we are producing and delivering today are already certified for 50% of SAF dropping today. So, so the, the technology of the plane and the engines is not the limiting factor to go up to 50% of SAF now. And airlines with the planes they are buying, they are taking from us today, can do this. Okay? And we, Airbus, want to go to that 50% very quickly. Uh, second point, um, to get to 2050 net zero, um, the trajectory that, that we have designed, that we have agreed with uh, all stakeholders in the industry and that we believe uh, leads to uh, net zero 2050 is to cross 10% by 2030. We need to have 10% of use of SAF by 2030. We are end of 2022. And today, the use in service is less than 1%. So what we are doing at the moment is first putting together or trying to gather, to collect the data so we can really measure the quantity of SAF that is being used worldwide. Second, at Airbus, we will be using by far more SAF, so we will be leading by example, and we have defined objectives. We are defining objectives now for next year, which are significantly ahead uh, of the trajectory for others. Third, um, there are a lot of different types of uh, SAFs, uh, from bio to e-fuels, and there's a huge diversity and, and things in the middle. We, we are playing in the energy sector to drive investment as much as we can uh, to SAF and to convince that this is a good business case for energy providers. And we like the idea that or what we have seen so far, that more and more airlines are making commitments that they will be at 10% SAF by 2030. And some have already started to disclose the contracts they have in place to source that SAF. Uh, and last, uh, I, I, have, I will stop here. Last, we have decided to invest our own money uh, in two funds to develop, to be part of projects that will develop SAF to contribute to this uh, um, acceleration on the SAF production. And I could also mention the uh, contribution we have made to uh, Fit for 55. We wanted to have the mandate um, in Europe at 10% of SAF by 2030. Uh, today, I understand that the figure that is uh, selected is 6%. That's not enough. We think we need to go up to 10%, and we will be using other ways to convince the uh, airlines, the aviation industry, that they need to commit and to go to 10%. So uh, the technology, if I got your question right, is not the limiting factor. We will be at 100% uh, we will have planes capable of 100% of SAF by 2030. We could be much faster, but we don't see the need to get there faster. And would we see the need in the next years, we would accelerate. 
Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Guillaume. It's time for us to wrap up, I'm afraid. Thank you all for your questions. Guillaume, thank you very much, um, and happy I'm travels. I'm really sorry, I'm not with you. I'm really, really sorry. Thank you for joining us this morning, and I'm handing over to my friend, Alex. Thanks, Guillaume. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank Have you. Have a good summit. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really excited to now lead through this very first panel of our Airbus Summit 2022. What's next in space? Nearly 50 years on from the last crewed mission to the moon, the world has once again turned its attention to the opportunities presented by our uh, only natural satellite. On 16th November, NASA launched the Artemis I mission, a test flight that will help us prepare for a return to the moon in 25. If we can establish a presence on the moon, as the Artemis program envisions, that achievement will not only broaden the human understanding, but unlock a wide range of innovation opportunities back home here on Earth. Central to achieving this, will be the partnerships between public agencies and commercial enterprises, which are giving shape to the next space era. But before I introduce our guest today, let's take a look at a short video on why we believe that humanity has to go to the moon and even beyond. Sometimes we try to cross the seven seas, to move mountains, to reach for the stars. But why? Because sometimes we need to push our limits to advance our society. The Apollo missions kicked off the computer revolution and accelerated breakthroughs in medicine. Technology boosts from exploring space enable us to live better lives today. And tomorrow will boost scientific breakthroughs back on Earth. That's why we're going to further explore the moon, pioneering a sustainable human presence on our natural satellite and unlocking its potential for a better tomorrow on Earth. <coughs> Our first roundtable will ask these related questions. Why go back to the moon now when we have so many issues in crisis to solve back on Earth? And what should you be Europe's role um, alongside the US, China, India and other space nations? To tackle these questions, I am delighted to introduce you to the Head of Future Space Exploration Programs at Airbus Defence and Space, Laura Todd. Hello, Laura. Hello. The, European, the Orion European Service Module Industrial Manager, also at Airbus Defence and Space, Jean Cleaver. Hi, Jean. Hi there. And I think the selfie star of today, our very own Pablo Alvarez Fernandez, who is today still project management officer at Airbus, but he is fresh from the selection to be part of the new class um, of the European Space Agency astronauts. Congratulations, Pablo, and thank you for being with us today. <laughs> thank you, Robert. John, may I start with you and also with the latest news? Um, Artemis Orion spacecraft has already broken the Apollo mission's distance record. It has traveled more than 430,000 kilometers from our planet. Truly amazing. It's the furthest a spacecraft built for humans which has ever flown. The capsule has started now its journey home, when I'm not mistaken, with a scheduled splashdown in the Pacific Ocean on the 11th of December. So what's happening with Artemis right now? Um, what are the latest news from the control center? 
Yes, so the latest news, so we're halfway through the mission now, is that everything is going really, really well. We're in lunar orbit right now. There are three correction burns um, before we'll have a final burn uh, on Monday, and that will be when Orion leaves the environment of the moon and starts its journey back towards the Earth. So in terms of mission performance, we've actually found that our spacecraft is um, it far exceeding our expectations. So for example, in terms of power, we've actually found that we're generating more power and consuming less power than we expected to, which is really great news. And it really means that we can start looking forward and thinking about the optimizations for future European service modules. Because of course, we're really talking about the future with Artemis. Um, the Artemis program will last for well over a decade. Uh, we're just at the start now of this whole new chapter of space exploration. We're going back to the moon for the first time in over 50 years, which is really, really exciting. Um, but what makes this even more special is that this is actually the first time that NASA has entrusted a company that's based primarily out of the US, so Airbus, um, with providing a mission critical element of a human rated spaceflight mission. So this is really, really special. Uh, the way that this works is that Airbus um, is working under a European Space Agency contract, uh, and we're responsible for building and testing these European service modules. Now, this is one of the most critical elements of the whole Artemis missions. Uh, they, the European service module provides everything that we need to keep a crew of astronauts alive on their journey to the moon. So it has all the water on board. It has all the oxygen and the nitrogen that forms the air that the astronauts will breathe. And of course, it also has a big propulsion system, which is actually what we need to push us towards the moon. So it's a pretty important module, um, and Airbus is one of the only companies worldwide with the heritage, uh, the knowledge, and the experience to do something like this. Without Airbus's contribution, then humanity's return to the moon simply wouldn't be possible. Really exciting news. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Pablo, just a few days ago at the European Space Agency's Ministerial Conf uh, Council, you were selected as part of the new class of only 17 astronauts. So again, congratulations. Um, and you will soon change, unfortunately, the working environment out of Airbus, but going on a training journey for around two, three years. Um, as a soon-to-be astronaut, um, what is for you the significance of the Artemis program for us all, the European citizens? So I think it's key to highlight that the uh, uh, service module we are building is really at the heart of the mission. And uh, we really couldn't go back to the moon without European technology. And this has been built by many, many years of hard work and excellence from the European industry. and concretely by Airbus. Uh, and it's really nice to see that NASA is trusting in, in Europe for, for such a key element. And uh, well, I cannot wait, I dream, to actually ride that spacecraft. And uh, um, I wouldn't have any, any fears, because it's, it's built by the best engineers in the world. Thank you, Pablo. Um, Laura. Let's turn to you and I think a question which is very important to ask. We need an entire ecosystem to be developed. Um, so the question is, how will we um, develop this ecosystem? What knowledge and techno technology can we provide as Airbus to unlock the potential of the moon? So a couple of great questions in there, Alex. So I'll come back to the how do we build on the lunar ecosystem afterwards. But let's start with the expertise. Now, I love Airbus, and I think everyone knows our products quite well, especially the aircraft, helicopters, satellites, telecommunications, Earth observation, whatnot else. But we have an incredibly proud heritage in space exploration. And so what Airbus brings is we're building on our experience from the space programs we've led in human spaceflight, in particular in low Earth orbit. So, for example, Airbus was responsible for developing and building the automated transfer vehicle, which served as the delivery mechanism or delivery service, so to speak, or UPS, to the International Space Station between 2008 and 2015, bringing everything that the astronauts might need, so uh, air, Air is important, water, food, spare parts, etc. So we did that. We also, um, Airbus, developed and built the 
Columbus Science Laboratory, which is the European module of the International Space Station. And I think um, I'm not wrong to say that the astronauts, in terms of what's been built on the the number of experiments the science research, I think 2,000 up until now, since it's been launched in 2008. So we've got a lot of great heritage on it, but we're looking towards the future and looking at the bigger picture of the why and, and, and the what and the how, and, and wrapping that, though, in terms of a user experience. Um, and we're already doing this in a number of different ways. So we've mentioned uh, the program that you are so wonderfully running industrially, Sean, on Artemis and it being absolutely critical in terms of being able to go back to the moon and to enable humans to actually live. So we've got that e element. We've also got a lot of experience thanks to self-invested R&D funding, thanks to uh, ESA-funded concept studies and initiatives. Um, for us to be ready, Airbus is ready to provide a sovereign capability for the delivery service to the moon, for rovers, for scientific payloads, um, any cargo that needs to go. So one other element I actually would like to share with you, which I found fascinating when I moved to this position, we've got groundbreaking technologies that we've demonstrated in doing extraction of oxygen and metal from simulated lunar regolith, which, again, is going to be a critical element for that human survival. So those are kind of some of the technologies that we've done, which are excellent. But our mission is to ultimately enable the full human experience in space from low Earth orbit to the moon and beyond. And you might ask, what does that mean? So I've already done some technological, but let's look at it in a different way. You and I, Alex, we're having a conversation. We're talking about our working day over a nice cup of coffee or maybe a nice glass of red wine as we're in France. So, um, but the only difference is we're doing it on the moon. But what do we need for that? We need exactly the same things as we have here on the Earth. We need a safe environment with energy, with heat, with fuel. We need to have water, a good coffee or the good wine. We need food. We need all of these elements not just the launcher, not just the spacecraft vehicle. So how do we package that together in those different building blocks to enable that overall infrastructure so it comes together to enable that human experience, that human presence on the moon? And we need to do that in a way that that framework works for all the different partners. It can be scalable, it can be incrementally developed so we're not reinventing the wheel each time. And we, so essentially what we need to do is to build the operating system for lunar exploration and the lunar ecosystem. I love that you're talking about the human experience. And Pablo, maybe you can share with us the experience you will now go through, as I've said, in the next two to three years. Um, what is ahead of you now in terms of training to becoming a full-blown astronaut? So um, first thing, I have to move to Cologne, where I'll start my basic training as an astronaut in April next year. That lasts for a year, and it's basically to get everyone up to speed as we have different backgrounds. Uh, second year, it's a phase of incremental training, where you get more details about how to operate in the International Space Station, and we'll be traveling a lot in well, United States, Canada, Japan, Russia, and so on. And, and then once you are assigned to a mission, you have two years more of specific training for that mission where you get to know everything you'll do from what you, you have to install, the experiments you, you have to perform, etc. cetera. Um, overall, the earliest we could fly is uh, 2026. Um, but if I'm lucky, maybe 2028 will be, <laughs> I will sign for that already. Okay, so as you just mentioned the date, in 2025 we are expecting to have the third Artemis mission with astronauts on board. So, as you just said, unfortunately it won't be you then at this time of, um, um, of this first flight. Um, but could you explain to us already what you think will be the technology challenges of living and working on the Moon? So. Technological challenges are huge, and we need to make sure that we create the right environment and right ecosystem. And to do that, we need to develop lots of things from well, solar arrays that can can give us the power we need. We need to develop the, the landers to, to transfer all the cargo. 
and we need to do loads of things. But uh, what I would like to highlight is that uh, everything we we do is ultimately to benefit the life we all have here on Earth. Uh, in a way, I always say that you could lock the 20 most brilliant people from Earth in a room and tell them to solve all the problems we have, you'll get nothing. Uh, you need to go through a process. And uh, basically, we are going to the moon, at least from my point of view, to struggle there, to give the most brilliant minds in the world the problems we have, and be able to develop the technology that we will end up using here. And we have loads of examples. Uh, for example, uh, I know that last year, the air purification systems used in, in the International Space Station were on demand, or the technology that we had developed due to the COVID crisis. We have lots of examples with biotechnology um, or, um, I don't know, material science. Uh, and at the end, it all comes to, to having put brilliant minds through that process. But it really sounds that there are a lot of challenges ahead of us until we can really do a next step on the moon. Um, and this is linked to my next question, which I will give to you, Jean. Um, our societies today are facing a lot of critical challenges, from the global economic slowdown and growing conflicts with a war in Europe. Um, so we also see a threat of climate change and also pending sustainable energy transition. So there's really a lot going on here down on Earth. So the qu question a lot of people are asking themselves, okay, why should we now invest for a live on moon um, and not for the existing issues we have right now on Earth. So the key question is to make it very simple. Why we are going back to the moon and why now? Yeah, great question. Um, this time we're going back to the moon for, um, for many reasons. We're going firstly for the purposes of scientific discovery, to learn more about the moon and our solar system. Um, but we're also going there to reap economic benefits and to lay the foundations for future exploration um, of Mars with humans. Um, and then, of course, we're also going to inspire a, a next generation of future uh, engineers and technologists and to grow our knowledge base back here on Earth. So the Artemis missions are all about technology development and demonstration. And of course, if we have mastered all the technologies that we need to live on the moon, then there will undoubtedly be a number of benefits that we can bring back here um, on Earth in terms of technology and processes. I mean, we saw that after the Apollo missions, didn't we? Um, that led to a real acceleration in computing and also the digitalization that we've seen in the last 50 years or so. And we will see that again with Artemis. Um, we will see a real boost to technology development, which is really something that's worth investing in. And actually, I, I prefer not to think in terms of cost when we talk about going back to the moon, but in terms of the benefits that pioneering exploration can bring to us. So at Airbus, we know how important it is to have a pioneering vision. Uh, 50 years ago, in October 1972, um, we saw the world's first twin-engined wide-body commercial aircraft, the Airbus A300, that flew for the first time. Airbus was born. And it took several years for airlines to really commit to that idea, but yet none of us would be sat here today in this forum without that original pioneering vision that we had from Airbus. And now we are Airbus, we are pioneering exploration on other planetary bodies, which will open up a whole new set of opportunities for humankind. It's only by having this pioneering spirit that we open the door to more possibilities, um, and then therefore, of course, the returns that come with that in the future. And we've seen, of course, what happened when um, Europeans didn't invest in computing and digitalization in the past. We became observers. So those who make it possible for humans to go and live on the moon, those, uh, these leaders in this new era of human exploration, those will be the people reaping the benefits of that kind of investment. And if we come a little bit more pointedly to this question of cost, then it's really worth noting that per citizen, the European Space Agency just spends the equivalent of just one cinema ticket per person per year to fund the entire space program. 
And that includes everything from monitoring and helping to protect our planet with ESA's climate programs. Um, it includes uh, making sure that we can find our way around every day with our navigation systems, making sure that we can stay connected to our Netflix streaming service wherever we are in the world, that sort of thing. And it also helps us as a humanity to really deepen our understanding um, of our solar system and its origins. So I think actually, given the issues that we have on the Earth today, I think a lot of us would be prepared to pay that 15 euros from our own pocket each year to continue to unlock the incredible potential of space exploration and human spaceflight. And I mean, those things that I've mentioned there are very tangible things. Um, of course, space missions also stimulate um, technological innovation. They widen our scientific knowledge base. They create industrial know-how. They attract young talent, and they help us to avoid a brain drain. Investment in space really does give Europe a leading edge for worldwide competition. Ultimately, money spent in space is money well invested. Space offers us an, enormal, um, an enormous economic potential, uh, given that the global space revenue is expected to reach billions of euros by the end of the next decade. So this is definitely something worth being a part of. It's a great pitch. I'm in with my cinema ticket. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sean, you talked already a little bit about benefits. Pablo, maybe you can remind us a little bit about the benefits space exploration and human spaceflight has brought to us every day, everyone, um, in terms of technology development on Earth. I mean, imagine where we would be without the space. Like, probably I wouldn't have reached this <laughs> building today. I wouldn't have all the data from Copernicus. Um, Maybe I wouldn't have been inspired to study aerospace engineering, the first thing, or many of us. Like, I think we all share this love for space. And at the end, it's an investment in the past, uh, because we, we, need, we will know more about the Earth and ourselves by exploring the moon. But it's uh, definitely a, an investment in the, in the future that you'll see uh, first in the shape of high skill jobs that we, we have within this company and and then with the all the benefits to come in the in the future from all the technological uh, developments that that we will make thank you um laura um another question which is also going around every time when we talk about uh, this topic is that it's clearly visible that the interest in the moon has been renewed not only in the united states but really Every spacefaring nation has, again, the moon in their sights, very much looking onto it. Are we now entering a kind of a second space race? So I'm going to come back to you with something, and it's a sentence you know very well because you were the first person to speak it and to share it with the Airbus community, which is the Airbus purpose. We pioneer sustainable aerospace for a safe and united world. So for Airbus, it is not a question at all of a space race. It is about the human race. This is not us trying to flee this planet to go and populate the moon. And it's about starting that journey with these first pioneers to have that sustainable presence that drives that innovation and helps us unlock the potential that we see on the moon. And what we've got to think about is how do we do that in a sustainable and responsible way based on the lessons we've learned, hopefully, on this planet. Um, but also to take advantage of this gift that we have in this geological twin and to unlock the potential of its resources. But again, and I come back to it, the innovation angle. I think you alluded to it, Pablo. Necessity is the mother of invention. So by getting ourselves up there, we can start to drive new technologies. We can start to look at new manufacturing processes. I can't tell you what it will be, but I do know that humanity is capable of discovering and unlocking on these potentials. But if we come back just specifically to the resources, so looking at the technological advancements we're doing, uh, electric cars, uh, trying to have cleaner energies in general, so specifically lithium. On Earth, we use 40,000 tonnes per year of lithium, 35% of which is used to manufacture batteries that go towards these cleaner technologies with electric cars and whatnot. On the moon, we know that to be I think it's 40 million tons that's currently available, with the possible 26 million tons that can be possibly utilized in the future. So 
if we look at what we have on the Earth currently, we've only got until 2075, 2080. I think there was an excellent question earlier towards Guillaume about resources and, and the limits that they have. So we know we've got these resources on the moon. Another example is uranium, where there's 3.3 million tons available of reserve on the moon. That could be utilized. So that's taking into account the technologies that exist today that we have been developing. But if we look towards the future and we talk about um, new technologies, new energy sources, because the other thing, when Pablo here is on the moon, he's not going to be able to run down to the local supermarket and buy batteries. Um, there's not going to be any bin men coming to collect the rubbish on a Friday. So we've got to change our mentality of how we do the resource and energy management. And one of the things that we see is speculation on how we can use helium-3 as a clean energy source in the future, which unlike uh, most nuclear fusion reactions generates uh, large amounts of energy without causing the surrounding material to become radioactive. And we know there's an abundance of helium-3 on the moon. So we've got all these opportunities. It's just a question of being there, being able to sustainably extract and utilize these materials. And then, and this is the key, and it's what we talked about earlier for that whole user experience, the human application. If we can do it on the moon, we can do it on Earth. So this is why it's important. Sounds truly exciting. Pablo, maybe the one million dollar question, um, and I guess you will hear it uh, a long time. We talk a lot about now about the moon. Um, do you think that one day humans will inhabit other planets? So next moon, eventually the Mars, and eventually even beyond? What's your point of view? I think that exploration is embedded in our DNA. So I think it's clear that if you look at our evolution as a species, we've always tried to explore everything. We've reached the Antarctic, the Arctic, the top of the highest mountains, the oceans, and we, we need to, to explore. We need to explore. And this is the perfect segue now to you exploring this panel, it's time for the q and A. I I hope you in enjoyed and you learned a lot about space exploration, the Artemis program, going back to the moon. Um, we will start again with the questions right here from the audience, as Jen has already introduced before. If you could please take the microphone and first state your name and the publication you work for, and then you can shoot your question. So, do we have questions in the room? Yeah, right here in the front, the gentleman. Hi there, uh, Tim Robinson, Aerospace uh, Magazine. Um, does, does Europe need its own space access system to get humans into orbit? Um, obviously, uh, you can't rely on the Russians now as Soyuz, and we rely now on the goodwill of the US. So uh, why isn't there a European alternative to get into low Earth orbit? Thanks. I'll take that question then, shall I? Thank you very much for that wonderful question. Um, so this is something that we are already developing, which I'm sure you're fully aware of, and I think Ariane Group is doing a great job on that. Um, what I would change the approach of it is, though, is it worthwhile that everyone's doing the same thing when, again, I talked about those building blocks and the elements we need for collaboration. And as we already show in Artemis, this is a joint collaboration with like-minded partners to deliver a service, to deliver a capability. And I think that's what we need to be looking at. What's the minimum viable product and working in lean, agile mentality, bringing the individual expertise so that we get there quicker and faster and that we're able to do these developments in a more agile way. But again, we do have this expertise and we do have the wonderful competencies. And I'm incredibly privileged that I get to work with not only the people in Airbus, uh, with future astronauts, with wonderful engineers, but the people in the agencies, the people in different companies that have the same kind of vision and the same goal and objective. So for me, that's more important. What is the end objective, the user experience, and what are the enabling blocks? Thank you. Another question from the room. Just raise your hand and the microphone will be brought to you. Up, also in the front. 
Good morning, Sebastian Steinke from Flugrevue in Germany. I have a question concerning your handling of advanced technologies, especially hydrogen. What can the commercial aviation industry learn from the space people concerning hydrogen? I know you handle everyday hydrogen stuff, you have engine experience. Is there something we can sort of directly take from your space guys and transpose into the commercial aviation segment in order to make things happen faster? Thank you. Who wants to pick this up? That Laura, Sean? One for Laura. <laughs> All right, so I'll go again. Um, Excellent question again, and this is something that when we look at, and, and, and it's also changing our mindset about how we approach things. It's not about an individual product, but the technology itself and how that can be applied across, if we're honest, different markets, because we are a business after all and we want to have investment, but also taking use of these technologies into the different areas. And it's certainly one of the things that I know that the um, technology office are looking at on these different technologies, how we can apply anything that's generated in space onto commercial aircraft and including uh, cold fuel sources and, and whatnot else. So, so that you're absolutely right and it is something that's considered. It's just, of course, it's a longer lead time on these topics. So. Maybe I take um, a question right now from the live stream. Um, Pablo, um, the question, what excites you most about this new chapter in your life? Well, everything about it is super exciting. It's, it's like uh, suddenly starting living a movie and, <laughs> <laughs> you know, from the training where uh, you have to, to learn how to well, do scuba diving, parachuting, uh, survival, uh, some caves, speleology, uh, so on, to, to being ready to be put in a rocket and, and fly to the first to the ISS. And the moon is still a dream, but uh, who knows? I mean, I, I, I thought I wouldn't be here uh, two years ago. I couldn't even imagine it. And, and now I have this huge opportunity. So the answer is everything. Yeah. As you said, you're now living your dream. Yes. Do we have another question here in the room? But I have many from our live stream. Sean, um, you talked, no, let me quickly check because I have, now I can see it. Um, you talked, or we talked in this panel about the topic of mining. Mm. Um, do we not fear that we are now really going to mess up our little moon with all the mining and everything what we want to do and then we have a similar situation as we have on Earth? Do you know, I think this time we're in a really unique position. We know a lot about our Earth. We know what's endangering our Earth. We know the things that we're doing wrong on the Earth. So for me personally, I see this venture to the moon as an opportunity to do it right this time. We can work together collaboratively with other nations and build almost like building a society from scratch. We can define the rules ourselves, we can define the policies, we can define the way that we do things. So for me, this is really an opportunity to go, to go somewhere new, to exploit, I don't like that word, but to make use of the moon's resources, but in a clever, in a smart, and hopefully in a sustainable way that benefits everybody back on Earth. That's the way that I really like to see it. And space, in my mind, is always about international cooperation. We can't go there alone. We need to work together. And I think we've got a real opportunity to do just that on the moon. To build on that, do we already have an idea? When can we expect a first spacecraft coming with whatever resources from the moon back to the Earth? That's a good question. I don't know the exact date, for example, but in terms of the Artemis program itself, we're looking at um, landing astronauts on the moon in uh, 2025. And then after that, we've got Artemis 4, 5, 6, 7, and so on. And with each Artemis mission, there will be a new element of infrastructure that is taken to the moon. So in the earlier missions, that'll be elements of this orbiting gateway space station around the moon. And it will just grow from there. So. We're sort of talking a decade or so of planned activities with the Artemis mission on the moon, and then who knows where it goes from there in terms of bringing things back to Earth and reaping the benefits on our planet. Thank you. In the meantime, is there another question here from the room to our space panel? Yes, 
in the front. Microphone is coming. Go on. Sorry, uh, me again then. How, do, how does the panel see, in terms of international partnerships, how does the panel see Europe's role in between, uh, obviously, NASA uh, and the kind of Western powers, as it were, and China, who's also uh, investing heavily in space exploration? They've got ambitious plans. Is, is there a possibility that uh, Europe could be a bridge between the two? Maybe. <laughs> I would say yes, seeing as how Europe is built on collaboration and working together. Um, but I want to turn this into a different way as well, because it's something that I understand the geopolitical situation on Earth, and I understand uh, everyone's in a, you, you mentioned space race, and people are trying to make it into a competition. I'm pretty confident, though, that once you get off this planet, and suppose we do go to Mars and we meet a Martian, that Martian is not going to say, so which bit of the landmass of that little blue ball over there are you from? Okay? This is where I think also, when we come to this whole, we are explorers, we are pioneers, we are dreamers, pushing those boundaries is what's going to also bring us together, and I truly believe in that. And I work for a company who is, its foundation is built on bringing together different cultures, different perspectives, different expertise, way of doing things to generate something that's fabulous. You are going to fly later on the wonderful A350, which is a marvelous feat of engineering. And that's because of the strength of Airbus, it's its diversity and bringing it together with the best people and the best technologies to have something, a product such as the A350. And we will do the same thing on space exploration. So can Europe do that? The answer is yes. Again, a question for you, Laura, sorry. Um, how will the recent funding, uh, which was in, uh, announced recently um, by ESA, support our moon ambition? Do you already know how much money will be fed into the entire moon program? Well, I won't be doing a breakdown of the mathematics and the sums, but let's just say, first of all, to have uh, the amount of money that's being invested, the 17% increase we're seeing on the last ministerial, that's a, it's a huge signal of confidence in what Europe's ambition is in terms of space. Um, specifically for the moon, it means that we will be securing and continuing the programs that, again, we do in partnership with uh, the US, with NASA, uh, through ESA, with the different agencies in the member countries. Um, so for Artemis in particular, the key component of, again, the human, uh, humans being able to live to go to the moon, but also uh, Argonaut, which is the new delivery service, shall we say, so follow on from ATV in a way, but that will be capable of delivering the payload so that it's formerly known as the Large Lunar Lander. So that's been secured as well with the funding structure. And I don't want to, to leave out the science element that you said earlier, Sean. So continuing our ExoMars program, so going to Mars, taking the first samples and bringing them back to Earth. So these are huge steps and advances. And I just want to say it's something, again, to celebrate that Europe came together to agree that this was important to do and move forward. A question from the room? Yes, here in the front. The US have a space plane, an unmanned mini space shuttle sort of thing. Is this something Europe would need or you would suggest to do research on for Europe? Thanks very much. So in terms of, I don't know if you were at IAC a few weeks ago or a couple of months ago now, but you know, you had, we, we talked, there was a discussion about SUSE, which is a similar concept. Um, so there are all these different concepts. And again, what's more important is that we have the current maturity in technology and the willingness to collaborate to produce these elements. But it's not just doing spacecraft for the sake of doing spacecraft or launches for the sake of doing launches. There's got to be a purpose and objective towards it. And this is where, let's focus on where we are at the moment, getting back to the moon, starting to build the infrastructure, and then looking at what are the next incremental developments that will need to be done on those various technologies, and still coming back to how we are then able to apply those technologies and that maturity for challenges here on the Earth as well. So not just focusing on the space exploration angle. Thank you. And we have a question here in the room. Hello. Is it audible? 
Yeah, uh, I'm Abhishek. I'm from the Press Trust of India. I had a larger question. Uh, is there any framework on the equitable distribution of space resources? So, for example, uh, I assume Moon, Mars, they belong to everyone on Earth. So, suppose NASA uh, finds a 10 million ton uranium deposit on Moon. So, does it belong to the US or is there any framework on it'll be how it will be distributed globally? Wow. Okay. I'll let you, Laura. <laughs> okay. So that's another fabulous question. Um, I did a panel at IAC, and we had someone that's uh, working on the legal and the compliance framework and all these kind of questions. And the answer is today, no, we don't have something that's structured. But again, this is another marvelous opportunity. And what you said about the sustainable environment, building things for the full life cycle, and to do it so we don't go and mess up the moon. But in the same way, how do we structure that international collaboration? Because once again, when we're off this planet, we are all humans. So I'm taking that as an opportunity. I'm a positive person. I like to think of things optimistically. This is going to be that opportunity to look to see how we build those frameworks together in a collaborative way so that I, I, I'm pretty sure that if we look at things that are happening on the planet, everyone's got the same challenges. So it's not going to be, oh, we just solve it for one country and it we don't give it to another country. That's not how it works. If, if I may add one thing, it's, it's also not the Wild West. We, for example, I work in the ExoMars rover, Rosalind Franklin, and we have a strict planetary protection rules. So you manufacture everything in a, a bio-clean room with extreme, extreme cleanliness. Like, it took me between 15 and 20 minutes just to get in. But you have to, to wear all these suits. Uh, we had. We, you couldn't even sneeze if you were close to it to avoid having any um, biological contamination on the rover that could then uh, affect uh, Mars. So from Europe and from NASA, ESA, and of course uh, Airbus, we took that issue very seriously. So um, really, we, we think about it every time we, we work in, in any spacecraft or we do any, any activity in a space. A question which is a little bit linked coming also from our live stream. Um, so we talked a lot about we can use the resources um, from the moon, but the question is, isn't that a little bit too easy? Should we not really think about redefining how we think and work around growth and value for mankind and really use Earth in a more sustainable way, rather than to say, okay, on Earth we don't have any more of lithium, let's go to a, a different place, and then we continue with this, and then in, I don't know, thousands of years we have gone through all the planets in the solar system, and then we move forward. Should we not first treat the issues right here on planet Earth? I mean, yes, but I think it's what Laura said. It's uh, We're going to the moon as well to learn and to develop new processes. It could be that we develop something that's cleaner, more efficient, and better that we can then apply back on Earth. So I see it as sort of one and the same thing. We go to the moon to, to discover and learn, but it should directly benefit the Earth and hopefully solve some of the problems that we have down here as well. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen here in the room, also directly on the live stream for all your questions. That's the end of our first panel around what's next in space. Many thanks also to you, my dear panelists. Um, and I'm now handing back to Jen for the next part of our Airbus Summit. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. over here and so thank you so much and thank you Alex um, really enjoyed that panel on uh, on our on our space technologies um, now we're coming back down to earth we're coming back down to earth and down here 
we're ready to talk about some of the solutions to the decarbonization challenge. Um, these are solutions that are effective and that are being implemented now. Sustainable aviation fuel, for instance, or SAF, is one of the key components of the decarbonization roadmap and will increasingly replace conventional jet fuel in the coming years. This complex global challenge of getting enough SAF to the right places at the right time at a reasonable price will require a whole new level of collaboration between a number of industries and institutions. And I believe we have the right people around the table to tell us more. Starting with the world's leading producer of SAF, Neste, we are happy to welcome Executive Vice President of Renewable Aviation, Torsten Lange. Thanks for having me. Welcome. Very pleased to have you. Also on the panel this morning from Air France, Vice President of Sustainability and New Mobilities, Vincent Echebert. Hello, everybody. Glad to be here. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you for being with us. And from Airbus this morning, a big welcome to our Head of Sustainability and Environment, Nicolas Chrétien. Thank you, Jen. Hello, Nicolas. Um, Nicolas is standing in for our EVP, um, Communications, Sustainability and Corporate Affairs, Julie Kitcher, who unfortunately has caught a cold and lost her voice. So we're making sure she recovers for tomorrow's, um, tomorrow's panel. So Julie's watching here um, and, uh, and will be making all sorts of gestures throughout the panel. I hope you get, get, be get better soon, Julie. So thank you so much. Um, and. Um, and let's get cracking on our, on our panel on uh, decarbonization and SAF. So I'm going to start with you, Vincent. Air France has been active and quite vocal on the decarbonization challenge. Can you share what you're doing today to decarbonize, including how you use SAF in your operations? Sure. Uh, maybe let's, uh, let me start with uh, information about new customers' uh, behaviors change and customers' expectations. And it's key because, of course, it's a great driver for our accelerated sustainability actions uh, within our friends and within our friends KLM. Uh, we can note two things. If we look at individual customers, what we have seen before the COVID crisis and we, what we see even more exiting it is uh, our new behaviors uh, that are emerging. Uh, for example, the, um, the the fact to, to travel maybe less often, but to stay longer inside, to mix uh, business motive uh, le um, travel and leisure motive travels. At the same time, we see as well from our customers and in general from the public society, uh, a better or stronger environmental consciousness. Uh, the fact that they are more and more sensitive and aware of the concrete carbon footprint of the product and services that they buy. And they also require and demand full transparency on those information. And also, last, uh, they, we see clearly that uh, a growing number of our customers are willing to contribute concretely to mitigate the environmental impact of, the, of their uh, consumption habit habits. So what we are doing, uh, trying and reinforcing there uh, is first full transparency on our carbon emissions um, at total level for our uh, full uh, activities at, tr at uh, TRIPS level. Uh, we especially launched a, a new site called Air France Act in April 2022, where you can find all those uh, information in a full transparent and I hope pedagogic basis. We also implemented in January 22 a SAF purchase voluntary offer for our individual customers. So when at the end of their booking process on our website, they can voluntarily contribute to the SAF purchase by Air France. And it's of course key for us to invest in this decisive uh, decarbonation lever. I will, we will discuss about that uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the next minutes. Then if we talk about corporate customers, maybe the segment which is the fastest changing in terms of new behaviors. Uh, and the main driver for that uh, is that, like Air France, like Airbus, our corporate customers are reinforcing their climate goals, their sustainability strategy. They are taking more and more climate uh, objectives, CO2 emissions reduction targets, especially short term and shorter term than before. And this includes for them their, what we call their scope three, indirect emissions where business travels are counted in. Um, 
especially uh, we see a, a strong rise in, uh, in climate uh, related targets uh, based on SBTI, science based targets initiative referential. And there, the, the, the way we, uh, we respond uh, to this trend is to, to propose also voluntary uh, SAF purchase offer for our corporate customers. We launched it on, on Air France KLM side in January 2021. And we see a strong appetite from our customers. We have 90 corporate customers to date, cargo and passengers, uh, having signed for this agreement. And it's key also for them because it enables them to deduct from their carbon emissions the negative emissions allowed by, by SAF. Um, then a quick update on our sustainability strategy and roadmap, because in the last uh, year we have been fulfilling, I, I think, uh, important steps for our strategy. Uh, the key and the first step of, our, uh, of a sustainability strategy is fixing a goal. This goal, uh, if we want it to be at the level of the stakes, if we want it to be credible, it has to be ambitious, because the challenge ahead of us generally and especially for the travel industry is of course uh, huge. It has to be science-based. Uh, that's absolutely critical and we see really a turning point there. And it has to be mid-term, meaning that 2050 claims targets are necessary. Uh, also uh, looking at the works by IPCC, we see, we know that carbon neutrality by 2050 at a global level will be a prerequisite to stay under the plus two degrees uh, limit of global warming. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. Also because all our stakeholders are waiting, expecting from us uh, quick and short-term actions. So we committed, just like Airbus, and we prize ourselves that Airbus also embarked in this great uh, science-based targets initiative journey. And so we submitted to the scientific referential our 2030 target, minus 30% carbon intensity by 2030 versus 2019. If we talk about absolute emissions for the company Air France, it's minus 12%. Challenging, but at the same time, we consider it's not an option. And for that, the two most impactful levers to reach this uh, demanding target, first is fleet renewal. And of course, thanks to the uh, great partnership that we have with Airbus, we are in a very accelerating uh, trend on that. We had 7% of new gen aircraft in our fleet in 21. We are moving fast to 45% in 25 and 70% in 2030. The second, last but certainly, certainly not least, uh, is of course sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, to comply or to reach this SBTI target by 2030, we have the ambition to incorporate more than 10% of SAF worldwide by 2030. And for that, we, we did quite a critical step uh, at the end of October because we, we signed our two first massive offtake agreements for a total of 1.6 million tons of SAF in the coming years. One of them uh, is with Neste, uh, allowing us to secure, especially with Neste, 1 million of tons of SAF between 23 and 2030. So as you can see, I hope uh, we are uh, working on all fronts in order to accelerate our sustainability actions and concrete results. Great, thank you very much. So I understand that passenger behavior is changing, that there's a real appetite to embrace the changes that the industry needs to undergo. And then obviously there's quite a bit of pressure on um, getting enough staff to the right places at the right time. So Torsten, how do you see us meeting these SAF objectives in the future? Yeah, thanks. You just made me feel a bit guilty. Sorry. We need enough stuff. Um, I think Nesta did its bit already, but we are still on the journey. Um, and I have to just to torture you a bit with numbers. I mean, we heard... Uh, um, that uh, there's not enough stuff available and just to give you ballpark numbers the world global consumption of conventional fuels is you know depending on who you ask between three and 360 million tons a year Nestle being the world's largest producer of sustainable aviation fuel has been producing and delivering in this year 100,000 tons that shows you a bit the calamities uh, we are in here and the challenges that we have but we had started our journey and we started the journey quite a while ago already as a renewables company, first starting with renewable diesel and now also introducing renewable SAF or sustainable aviation fuel as we call it. Um, and we increased our production 
massively uh, next year. Um, our Singapore refinery will come on stream April next year with a production capacity of a million tons. Um, then added to that equation, we will have another 500,000 tons that we can make available from end of 2023. So that's already one and a half tons. And if you then continue the journey, we had announced uh, the next greenfield refinery be being built in Rotterdam, uh, producing another 700,000 tons. So with, that will make us 2.2 million. Um, but if you turn it the other way around, we need another 20 nestes to meet the targets that Vincent was just referring to, 10 million tons. 10% uh, uh, in 2030, or in other words, let's say roughly 40 million tons mm. that we need. Will we manage? I'm, I'm optimistic we will do. Aviation industry was always on the forefront, also when it comes to sustainability. Um, um, the aviation industry is under pressure. Um, realistically, I mean, our greenhouse gas contribution is around 2 to 3 percent, or let's say the climate impact. But if you ask, normal passengers or people, they think, you know, it's 20, 30 percent, whatever. This is not the case, but we're acting like it is, which is good, because mm. we are already working on that, and it was always aviation being in the forefront. It was aviation having the first global industrial approach on reaching certain targets. ICAO, Corsia is a scheme that comes from the aviation industry. So the aviation industry is capable, but it definitely needs help and it needs support. Referring to what uh, Vincent was just saying, um, um, the normal passenger is certainly somebody we have to talk to and we have to educate, because if, you, if you're talking to people nowadays, most of them don't have a clue what stuff is. Let's be serious. Most of them are thinking it's not possible, so we have to demystify that. Uh, we have to educate them jointly with Airbus, with the airlines, with Air France, KLM being in the forefront, you know, being a leader um, in, in that field, but also with all the other airlines, and also helping the airlines that yet have not understood what is that stuff. Can we really use it? Is it, is it dangerous? I mean, if you're asking people, I think, cannot use it. You're flying with French fries fat. I mean, how can that, how can that be possible? Yes, it is possible. It is used cooking oil, one component. The other one is animal fat, and there's much more technologies to come. It will cost, and it has cost a lot of money. Um, why are we uh, a leader in sustainable aviation fuel? Because we had the courage to start when regulations have not been in place. Um, others were sitting just on the fence, and, and still they do see, OK, what is, what is Nestor doing there? So it's a bit of a challenge. It's fun. It's, it's, it's great. But you know, wherever we go, what we do is the first time. So you say, you say that you need help. Yes. You need that help coming from, from where? From the policymakers? Um, from the ecosystem? I mean, we have the help ecosystem? from the airlines, we have the help from Airbus. You know, this is the corporations we need, but regulations are key. Uh, we heard uh, Guillaume earlier saying we need higher, more ambitious mandates. Because the plan for Europe currently is to having a 2% mandate in 2025. Um, it's good, but it's, it's from my enough. perspective, it's not ambitious enough. We can do more, and, and um, history has shown people and mankind always needs a nudge um, um, to go that little yeah. extra mile. Um, so policymakers really, really have to have trust in what we're doing, um, and then let the industry do. Because if you have that regulatory environment, be it mandates or the incentive schemes that we now have in the US, they will help us over the bar and they'll help the industry over the bar to investing. I mean, we have to invest more than a billion on an annual basis in new production capacity. That's a, that's a lot of money. But we're happy to do that together, um, even with competitors. Yeah. I invite competitors to cooperate, because this is a joint, a joint mission and a joint journey, and, and we're happy to, to do that and to be on board with, with all the stakeholders. So once again, collaboration is truly the name yeah. of the game in Maybe a solving final any word of on these the corporates. challenges. Maybe a final word on the corporates, because they are playing a, a key role. One is the regulated market, um, where people basically have to buy, but the corporates around the globe are playing a very important role um, uh, to being the blueprint and, and you know, to, uh, to, to leading by example to buying that, to compensating for the business travel emissions. Yeah. Um, and this is what we actually can do together as a society, but also with Airbus, with the airlines. That's key. Speaking of corporates, Nicolas, um, what is 
Airbus's strategy regarding SAF now that we've listened to Torsten and Vincent? Well, um, obviously, SAF is important not just for Airbus, for the global ecosystem, as we've seen. And perhaps maybe to start with the fact that we have developed, as well as Air France, uh, climate targets which are uh, meaningful, science-based. And I want to uh, uh, go back to um, Guillaume. So the process is ongoing at the moment. So we're still in a validation process with SBTI, but we have submitted our targets on all of our scope, scope one, two, and three. And if you, look at, if you look at the carbon footprint of our products, 98% of the carbon footprint is related to the use phase, the famous scope three use of sold products. And it's essentially linked to the type of fuel and the energy carrier that we're using. And the relative dependency we have on fossil energy, because as Guillaume said, we already have the potential to fly our airplanes with sustainable aviation fuels. So in a sense, we can't disconnect and we can't achieve our climate targets and the net zero commitment of aviation if we're not capable of enabling SAF ramp up at scale. So that's what we're looking at. And when we look at our um, scope three strategy, obviously we've tried to reduce our dependency on SAF over the years. Over the last three decades, we've reduced the energy intensity of our products by more than 50%, but that's not enough. So we need to be able also to shift the ecosystem to a fully decarbonized one. So when I look at our scope three strategy, um, I see three main areas that we're focusing our efforts on. The first one is to prime the demand pump. As you said, Torsten, our industry has been quite early adopting aligned targets and goals. If you remember back in 2005 under the ATAG framework, but we've been leaving, and we have to recognize this, on a relatively weak signal in terms of demand. And this is why we have joined the First Mover Coalition, because as Guillaume said, and as Air France is committed to, do we believe that we need to be able to send a strong signal that we need to converge by 2030 to an element of state in the ecosystem where we can actually source 10% of the global fuel for aviation through SAF. That represents, as you said, 30 to 40 million tons from where we are today. So priming the demand signal is essential, but it's not enough. Obviously, we have to work on the capability. And it was a very interesting question around the technical capability. Today's aircraft are capable of flying with 50% SAF, but we want to make them capable of flying with 100% SAF to unlock, if you want, the constraint. Why is that? Well, if you think about it, the aircraft that will be delivering at the end of this decade, they will still be flying in 2045, 2050. And we want to make sure that those aircraft are capable of flying with more than 50% SAF. So again, that's what we're looking at as a roadmap. And this is why we are conducting a series of flight tests, such as Vulcan on the A319 or Eclipse, where we're partnering also with Neste on the A350 to be able to demonstrate the feasibility of 100% SAF uh, flights. So priming the demand pump, getting the right capability, and when we look at capability, it's both technical capability and the set of policies and regulations that we need to set up to incentivize SAF, and perhaps we'll come back to this. But the third, obviously, and the biggest challenge we face, um, I would say collectively, is to prime and accelerate the supply. Um, I think that, um, again, here we're um, leaving off a state when everybody mentioned that already, but today's obviously uh, uh, availability of SAF is very limited. You were talking about we're counting kilotons where we ought to count million tons, obviously. So when we look at our strategic action plans, we want to foster and act a bit as a catalyst. So we want to foster the production through partnerships. And that's actually what we're doing by bringing the right capacity building, I would say, in some specific regions of the world, like the example of our partnership with Qantas to try to really build up um, the SAF supply and infrastructure in Australia. Uh, we have set up, and I think Guillaume mentioned that, a dedicated sustainability SAF fund to be able to promote actually capacity building across the world. We need to invest in CapEx, we need to invest in those projects, but we also need to mature some key technology bricks. And this is why earlier this year we announced uh, a partnership with uh, 1.5 and carbon engineering on direct air carbon capture. Because we see 
carbon capture, the ability of capturing carbon and recirculating carbon as a way to fuel our um, aircraft in the future as a key technology brick, specifically to pave the way for new advanced pathways such as power to liquid, which we will need and which we believe could represent up to 50% of the total SAF landscape by 2050. So what about the scope one emissions at Airbus? <laughs> How are um, we handling those? Thank you. Indeed, it's, it's interesting. So obviously, scope three is um, the 500 million ton challenge, and scope one and two at Airbus is uh, the 1 million ton challenge, but it's one that we directly control and can operate. So we have submitted targets on scope one and two. Uh, we have revisited those targets to be able to align with a 1.5 degree trajectory, so we are targeting to reduce by 63% by 2030, our emission on scope one and two. Uh, and the interesting part is if you look at the scope one and two footprint of Airbus, it's not just about our stationary activities. So about 60% of the footprint is operating buildings, machines, so that's the stationary part. But 40% of it is actually mobile operations because we have a huge logistic flow through Beluga operations. We also operate aircraft through flight tests. We also operate big maritime ships that are transporting main component assemblies between Europe and US. So actually the deployment of SAF is a core element of our strategy when we're looking at uh, our scope one and two trajectory. So what are we doing on this? Well, today we're already operating our Beluga with 5% SAF. So we can compare 5% to less than 1% at global level. Obviously, we're not running an airline the size of Air France, but that's actually a good step forward. And next year, we're looking at actually already ramping up to 10% for Beluga and flight test operations. And we're looking at really fully exploring the capability of the aircraft to be able to operate those aircraft with up to 50% SAF by 2030. So that's what we're doing. It's a great opportunity for us to also lead by example. This means not just commercial aircraft, by the way, it's helicopters, it's not just Europe, it's Toulouse, it's Hamburg, but it's also the US and it's also China. So we are also confronting, if you want, the difficulty of bringing SAF safely at the gate and the local for global challenge that SAF represents. Great. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you, Nicola. Um, okay, I have, a, I have a question for all three of you. Um, there are people out there that don't believe that this is possible, that don't believe in our ability as an industry to decarbonize. Um, and they think the only solution would be for a degrowth strategy in aviation. So I'd like your take on that, maybe starting with you, Vincent. <coughs> First of all, that's, I think, to my point of view, a legitimate question. When you look at uh, the, let's say, historical trend uh, from 2005 to 2019, if you look at the evolution of the CO2 emissions of the whole industry, of the whole air sector, uh, those emissions have raised in absolute value plus, uh, by plus 42%. And when you look at why, you had a decrease in uh, what we call uh, energy intensity, so as described by Nicola, by 1.5% decrease on average per year, and that was thanks to technical evolutions and new, uh, new aircraft technologies. But at the same time, traffic worldwide increased by an average yearly growth of plus 5%. So it more than uh, counterbalanced, let's say, the improvements in terms of technology. This is where we are, this is where we have been as, a, as an industry. And at the same time, and when we look, when we read uh, reports, works by IPCC, we know very well that uh, all the sectors, including uh, airline industry, has to uh, embark as soon as possible into a trajectory of degrowth of its carbon emissions. So yes, it's a legitimate question. Then will it be possible in the coming years to combine growth and of the traffic uh, and degrowth of the carbon emissions, to decouple both. First of all, if we take the humble uh, example of Air France, 2005 to 2019, we had our traffic increase, increasing by plus 32%, and at the same time, we managed to decrease our emissions in absolute value and without any uh, counting, any offsetting, by minus 6%. So yes, mathematically, I would say that this is possible. Then the question is, is it possible for the whole industry and at the level of the stake, at a rhythm and at the level <coughs> recommended by science? I think it's not a question of, is it possible or not? Let's do it. 
and uh, there was one historical lever again of decarbonation strategy. It was to limit as much as possible the energy intensity, the quantity of energy used by the airline industry, and this has been the only lever that we used. Now we are in a new era where you have a second huge lever that we can play on, which we have not played on because uh, since the beginning of the aviation history, we have only used one source of energy, kerosene. And now we have access and we have to develop and to accelerate what we call a carbon intensity lever. So the possibility to use a new uh, energy source, reducing carbon footprint on average by 80%. So that's absolutely massive. So yes, for me, it's not a question of is it feasible or not. It's a question of Let's doing do it, it and being determined to do it. Great, thank you. Torsten, what's your take on the Well, I'm on the convinced it can be done. That's maybe the first uh, important message. And, and, and do we have to shrink the industry? Uh, I don't think that this is the right answer. And, and let's face it, um, 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 aviation is, is developing and, and we cannot see Europe just in isolation. Um, there is a massive development going on also in Asia. Um, in, in not too far from now, 60% of the aviation growth and aviation, aviation development is taking place in Asia. So we have a huge responsibility here to embarking and to, and to showing the way forward um, uh, with ambitious targets. And, and again, uh, we forget it's not only, it's not only the stuff, it's also the technologies. 65% of the greenhouse gas reductions is expected to come from sustainable aviation fuel um, in 2050, m meaning there's another 35% uh, coming from uh, technology improvement from higher efficiency, from hydrogen flying, from electric flying, but also from air traffic management, ATM. which is part of the equation here. Um, can we do that? Um, the answer would be a bit into uh, Vincent's direction. We will not be able to do it if we're not starting. But I'm more than optimistic that we will be able to cope. Um, let's not forget there's a huge demand coming. Uh, people that have not been flying yet thinking about India, you know, thinking about the developing countries. They will all be flying, replace, replacing other means of transportation rather than riding two hours, uh, two days with the bus. They have a one hour flight in India, meeting their families, doing medical flights, you know, all those things. It will grow. Do we want it or not? That's another question, but that's a fact. Thank you. Nicolas? Yes, I think um, when we submitted our scope three targets, Basically, Airbus consolidates half of the emissions of the sector. So that question about can we achieve actually what I would call responsible growth at sectoral level is at the heart of our commitment towards science-based. Um, we need to operate our, I would say, uh, business model within the boundaries of a, of a carbon budget. What does that mean? I think there is a way for us to grow responsibly if we are mindful of the pace at which we can continue to improve the technology and the energy efficiency of our products. And if we are mindful of the pace at which we can scale up the energy ecosystem that supports it. So that triangulation between responsible growth, energy efficiency of our products, and the readiness of the energy ecosystem is at the heart of what we're trying to pursue here. So there are many people that are busy actually developing scenarios of the impossible. Um, I'm more, as all of the people around this table here, um, looking at what are the scenarios of the possible, and I think it starts now, yep. and it has to start quickly. Definitely. Thank yes. you. Thank you for your candid responses. Thank you very much. Now, um, before we go to the questions from the audience, I think there is an announcement to make, Nicola. Indeed, uh, and thank you, Jen. So I'm um, very uh, pleased um, to uh, share the stage with uh, Torsten here today. Um, I talked a lot about the fact that this is not something that Airbus obviously can achieve alone and that any of us, whether airlines, energy providers can achieve uh, single-handedly. Um, so partnerships are essential and I'm very pleased to report that Airbus has signed a new collaboration agreement uh, with Neste to try to uh, prime the demand signal, as I was saying, to build up the right capability also, exploring 100% uh, uh, SAF feasibility, but also to try to detect some uh, business opportunities around priming and accelerating the supply um, basis. So yeah. very happy, yeah. um, Torsten, and perhaps you want to say a few words as well. Well, I can just echo what, what you just said, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a great opportunity um, to working on various fields. I mean, one is what uh, Nicola was just referring to, is the business opportunities that we have, also helping um, 
Albers. Beluga was mentioned just here, so you know it's a, to a certain extent, a normal business relationship, but this relationship goes beyond. Uh, we agreed to working on projects together technically, um, um, to thinking about next technologies, um, where can we cooperate, where can you know our perfect set of engineers can, can collaborate and find new ways, working on the pathways, somebody asked you know, how many pathways we have, basically we're working on all those pathways and we're happy to sharing our knowledge uh, with Airbus to seeing where can it bring us, but then um, there's a third pillar, I would call it education, training, uh, you name it, where, where we jointly do have a mission to educating the people what is it that can be done today and not in 2030 or 2035. Um, we don't have the time. We are at the 11th hour. You mentioned IPCC earlier, Vincent. They're saying there's a high probability that within the next five years, at least one year, we will be exceeding the 1.5 already. Um, this is an alarming signal. So Guillaume said that the time for excuses is over and the time to acting is now. And I'm really proud to being able to announce that cooperation that opens a lot of opportunities. Thank you and congratulations on the cooperation agreement. Congratulations. It's time to open up for some questions from the room here. So why don't we start with uh, John? Well, Andreas, go ahead. Or <laughs> First John, then Andreas. Given the amount of uh, SAF that is available and the economics you're looking at in terms of the price per barrel of SAF and how much is actually needed versus the amount that's being consumed, do airlines need to rethink the economics of their business and to make the sustainability question actually close? Are the expectations that they have around what it costs to fly an airplane, are those now outdated given the climate challenges we we're looking at? You yes. Want to take Thank you for the for the question. <clears throat> uh, you are fully right in the sense that yes, uh, the decarbonation strategy and roadmap of Air France, but it will be the case for any airline taking strong uh, uh, commitments uh, in terms of climate goals, will have a massive financial impact. It will cost a lot. Uh, if we look at the Air France KLM Group, already by 2030 the cost of our decarbonation is counted in a couple of uh, billion euros. So that's absolutely massive for a sector, for airlines, where, as you know, the, historically, the margins have been uh, pretty modest. Uh, that being said, of course, it will be a challenge. And at the same time, we consider, in terms of responsibility versus uh, fight against uh, global warming, in terms of pressure expectations by civil society, by our customers, that it is not an option. So very concretely, uh, this means if we talk about SAF, for example, or if we talk about uh, fleet renewal first, as I said, uh, it's a massive investment for the Air France Group. One figure right now in this voluntarist, voluntarist uh, trajectory of fleet renewal, the cost for Air France Group is more than 1 billion euros per year. As you know, uh, as the sector has been uh, much hit financially by the crisis. In reality, it's most of our investment, the essential part of our investment capability, which is oriented and uh, towards our fleet renewal trajectory in the short term. Then for SAF, this economic equation that you were uh, referring to means, and we want to be transparent towards our customers on that, uh, that yes, it will have an impact on the uh, cost of uh, airline tickets. Uh, we have actually made a first step in January 22 um, in the context of the implementation of the French uh, mandate in terms of SAF incorporation. Uh, one one percent of SAF incorporation for uh, obligation for all flights departing France as of 2022. Huh? Uh, it's happening now on average in the year. And we introduced, because we wanted to be fully and transparent about that, we inf introduced uh, what we call a SAF contribution in the price of all tickets with departure from, from France. Uh, it's a challenge when you communicate to your customers that yes, you will proceed to, uh, well, you will introduce a contribution of, on top of the price of the ticket, but if you explain why you do so, and what and how 
concretely those funds in each ticket will be invested uh, to secure and to uh, yeah to secure our SAF investment. We saw by experience that the reaction by our customers was actually pretty positive. And this trajectory uh, and this uh, necessary contribution of our customers may it be through the contribution in the ticket, on top of the ticket price, may it be, and that would be an essential, essential part for us on a voluntary basis, as I was discussing before, for our individual customers, for our customer co corporate customers, will be indeed key in our capacity to source SAF, as, uh, uh, as, we, as we say, the SAF price are currently, depending on the technology, four to eight times uh, more expensive than kerosene. And, and to finish my, uh, my answer, in order to limit and to reduce the price gap between fossil kerosene and SAF, uh, a very important point was raised by, by Torsten, because yes, public authorities, regulation can have a role there in order to reduce the gap. Uh, and especially, uh, I think we can be uh, inspired by the examples in the US in terms of uh, incentivization uh, of the SAF usage by airlines. Maybe if I, if I add to that, because you said, do, they have, do airlines have to rethink their, their pricing strategy? I would say it's an opportunity for airlines to, to also developing new business models. I was referring earlier to the corporates, and, uh, and you know, you would wonder how would a corporate now buy stuff, but you can, technically, you can decouple the physical supply from the additional uh, environmental benefits. So corporates can already now compensate for their business travel, for their scope three emissions. So airlines can forward sell scope three emissions um, to corporates that would then be able to compensate. And, and you know, it's a, y you can make the difference as an airline. You can offer things to corporates that maybe others can't. And you can also develop your own business models around. And the beauty of this combined with SAF is, is real greenhouse gas reduction, because you would now say, what is, he, what is he talking about? That has been around all the time. But that was all the, you know, the offsetting measures that are getting more and more criticized. What we are offering here is greenhouse gas reductions immediately, by the credits or by the environmental ben additional benefits, and get the stuff burned by an airline in reality now. So there's a lot of opportunities you can, you can develop, but you need the corporates on board. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. I promised Andreas here. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Andreas Speed, German aviation journalist. Um, two questions, one to Vincent. Um, hello, Vincent again. Hello, Vincent. <laughs> um, How are you? You mentioned that uh, after COVID, it seemed that the customers are more receptive to all these offerings. We all know that over time, the compensation offers that airlines have made to their customers, and also, I think Lufthansa also offers the SAF option to buy that for individual or corporate customers. People have been very reluctant doing that so far overall. So do you see an uptick now? Are people actually, even private customers, actually opting into this SAF option? Can you give us some figures by, I don't know, how many percent it has increased or just kind of some kind of trend? And for Torsten or the overall panel, I'd like to just recheck the numbers. Torsten said with all the new refineries that uh, Neste will bring online, they would have 2.2 million output a year in SAF. Um, how much is the entire production of the current SAF industry, so all the suppliers together, how much can they provide? And can you repeat again, how much would we need in the industry to have 50% SAF share, or what's again the overall current number of fuel needed, or tons of fuel needed per year in the entire aviation industry, just to get the relation again. Thanks. Do you want to start, Ransom? Yes, I will start quickly. Uh, great question, Andreas, thank you for that. Uh, can I provide figures in terms of SAF contribution from our individual customers? It's a bit early because we introduced this option in January. Uh, what I can say is that uh, the adoption is growing very fast. I hope in the coming months and with a little bit of history, a bit more of history, I will be able to share figures. But yes, we see definitely in, in intake, an intake on that. And I would like to point out that uh, we have also, of course, a role to play in order to further enhance this intake. As Torsten was saying, the key here is to explain transparently with pedagogy what is SAF to our customers, 
how they are produced, where the emissions reduction come from. For example, it's important to say that uh, the combustion of SAF in an airplane will emit at the end exactly the same amount of uh, CO2 emissions as kerosene. The reduction that we are talking about comes from the uh, production phase, where uh, the, the, it implies some negative emissions, so some absor absorption uh, of CO2 in the atmosphere. So it is absolutely key to be transparent, to explain what it is, because if there is no understanding, there is mistrust, and the, if there is mistrust, there is no contribution uh, and adoption of, uh, of this stuff. So we are actively uh, contributing and actively working. Actually, we just revised all our information uh, available on our website to be as clear and as transparent and as science-based as possible. Uh, to explain what is SAF and to continue to enhance this very positive trend that we witness. Yeah, um, thanks. Andreas, to your question, um, again, the 2.2 million is correct. That what we will have available as Nest in 2026. Um, on the overall availability of SAF, it's a bit a difficult call because you see a lot of announcements. Um, announcements are getting more and more firm now, and they are all in the order, in the magnitude, let's say, of between 300 and 500,000 tons a year. I would say roughly, and, and uh, don't quote me again on that, it's maybe around 10 to 12 announcements that we have been seeing globally so far that would come on stream between 26 and 27. So ballpark numbers, let's say 10 times 500, that's another five million tons, so that would bring us to, to seven, eight million. Um, still not enough, but time will tell. Regulations will tell and help, because again, only uh, the voluntary market is one, but if the regulations are not there, people will still wait, because also big oil and other companies do have an obligation to provide a decent return to their shareholders. So don't, let's not be overly romantic here. Um, and we would love to invest, but if the returns are not there, um, others will not come on board. How are the returns secured? By demand certainty. Where is demand certainty coming from? It's coming from regulation, from regulation, from regulation. And then we have the voluntary market on top. 50% of SAF, again, you asked the question, um, ballpark numbers in 2030, we'll be talking about a global consumption of roughly 400 to 420 million tons of fuel no matter of what quality. So half of that, 200 to 210 in 2030, would, would, be, the, would be the requirement. W will we meet that? No. We come to 10% in 2030, and I can, I can guarantee that almost. Yeah, I think the 10% is roughly 30 to 40 million. So just to give you a sense as well, and to provide maybe a more global and positive note, I think what we have seen is the the full lineup of take-up commitments from the industry today is amounting to something that is getting closer to 30 million tons between now and 2030. So we're getting that momentum as well. Obviously, we're not in terms of supply basis, and this is why we want to foster those partnerships to be able to really co-develop everywhere. Um, I think the notion of cost that we alluded to is fundamental, obviously, but there's a notion of cost affordability and there's a notion of cost allocation. Um, and I think uh, the affordability, if I look at 150 trillion of investments on a daily basis in capital markets, I think there is affordability to, and there needs to be focus on energy transition, globally speaking. So if we trust that there would be greater relocation of funds towards energy transition, there is the means for affordability, globally speaking, towards energy transition. The cost allocation is perhaps the question that we need to, you know, every C I mean, obviously, the, the cost cannot go on the balance sheet of airlines only. It cannot go. So it will be an allocation throughout, obviously, the value chain. So some passengers will have to pick up the cost in ticket prices. This may influence also the growth. By the way, we took into consideration ourselves when we uh, updated our global market forecast, uh, the impact of increased energy prices. So we see that also that will flow in. And obviously, there is the uh, sort of intimidation and how we structure, basically, uh, the cost policies uh, that support the incentivization. And I, I agree, I think the US is a good framework for this, and we need to push for this to uh, develop much uh, further. Thank you. There's an awful lot of interest yes. for this topic. So we've got a number of questions online, and we're almost completely out of time. So Torsten, this one's for you. If really, a quick answer, please. Are you pursuing efforts to use existing CO2 in the atmosphere to produce SAF on a large scale? 
Um, well, we heard uh, uh, Nicola talking about uh, direct air capturing. This is something. This is future music. Let's let's face it. It's it's quite it's energy intensive. Um, it's complex. It's cost intensive. Um, uh, we will be working on that because you know we have to find a way. Um, um, to sourcing enough CO2 in the future. You know, the silver bullet everybody's waiting for is the PTL long term, you know, the e-fuels, like they call it. But it needs massive volumes of CO2 in a world where, where we are reducing CO2. So direct air capture is certainly one of the answers. Um, are we working on that directly already? We, you know, we, we're experimenting, we're thinking, but it's, uh, it's a long way to go. And it needs that kind of partnerships. Yeah, great. We're going to take one last question from the gentleman over in the corner here who's been waiting. This is the last one, thank you. And a short answer, please, guys. This is Amir Joshi from Network Thoughts uh, from India. Uh, very short question, how volatile are the SAF prices? Are they as volatile as ATF? And how is the ecosystem working with airports to get them ready towards SAFEs? Um, starting with the last question about the ecosystem, I mean, we're talking about a fantastic thing here. We're talking about drop-in solutions. So we don't need to create um, a new ecosystem at airports. Uh, it can be used, we heard that earlier, currently up to 50% as a blend in every engine that is flying around the globe. It can be put into every airport system. It's mingled, you know, it's, it's, it's been put in and it's been treated as standard Jet A1 or Jet in total. Um, do we have volatile prices? Indeed we have. Um, this is by far everything but a mature market. Um, it's a market that's floating up and down, depending on how the results of the Super Bowl was and how many fried chicken have been eaten. Um, um, to the Chinese New Year, um, availabilities. I mean, there's a lot of things playing a role here. This is why it's very difficult to commoditize that thing. And we're still trying to find a way. The matter of the fact is what Vincent said, it's four to eight times if you're talking about other technologies uh, and more expensive than standard fuel. And this is talking about the business models. This is something we have to have in mind when we do future models on flying. Thank you so much, gentlemen. I'm afraid we have to wrap up. I think we could have gone on for another hour or so. Um, thank you so much. It's time for us now to take a short break. So I invite our online viewers to check back in with us at 11.30 Central European time. Uh, we'll be taking a short break. So uh, see you in a few minutes. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. Welcome to the Airbus Summit 2022. And uh, we're ready to start our discussion on hydrogen technologies. In 2020, we launched our Zero E ambition. And at last year's summit, we provided an update with a focus on the need to build a whole new ecosystem around these innovative energy solutions. So here we are again ready to take stock and see what's happening concretely and show how that ambition is becoming a reality. And who better than the teams themselves to talk about the progress they're making? There is also some exciting news to share. So I'm going to hand over to Airbus's Vice President Zero Emission Aircraft, Glenn Wellen, who will guide us through the important steps taken since last year. Glenn. Thank you, Jen, and it's a real pleasure to be back on stage with you this year, this time with my colleagues, uh, to share some of the progress that we've made on Zero E. And, and first, maybe I'll start with some introductions. So, Matthias Andre Messina is head of demonstrator and testing for Zero E. Uh, Karine Guénon is responsible for the ecosystem, a hugely important part of our overall ambition. Hauke Luders is responsible for the fuel cell propulsion system and Chris Redfern, uh, Head of Manufacturing for the Zero E activities which are ongoing. First, let's start with the ecosystem, where the many announcements we've made uh, over the last period are really just the tip of the iceberg of our Zero E progress. On the screen right now, you can see all of the hydrogen ecosystem announcements which we made prior to the summit in 2021. Since the last summit, we've signed more partnerships all over the world. In Asia Pacific, we've created a hydrogen hub in Singapore with an MOU with CAAS, Shanghai Airport and Linda. A H2 hub in South Korea with an MOU with Incheon Airport with Korean Air and uh, Air Liquide. In Japan, we have signed a partnership with Kawasaki Heavy Industries, with Kansai Airport and with ANA. In Australia, we have partnered with Fortescue Future Industries to produce clean hydrogen in Oceania, but also all around the world. Irish. In the US, we signed an MOU with Delta and a few others which are still undisclosed. In Europe, we signed an MOU with Wizz Air. In Italy, we've partnered with Milan Airport, Venice Airports, and SNAM, the national gas company. In the UK, we've partnered with EasyJet, Bristol Airport, and Hynamics as part of a wider Southwest Hydrogen Hub initiative in the UK. And all of these partnerships you can now see on the map behind me. So, Karin, why all of these partnerships and what's next? What a year indeed, uh, Glenn, and we are very grateful to our partners because you see there is no point having a zero emission aircraft if this aircraft doesn't match airline needs. Hence, all the partnership we've announced uh, with uh, full service carriers, with low cost carriers, with airline based in the US, in Europe and in Asia Pacific. We will continue to grow our collaboration with airlines to come up with the best possible zero emission aircraft to serve our customers. There is no point either having a zero emission aircraft if it can't run on decarbonized hydrogen. And that's why we need to secure the right volume of decarbonized hydrogen to power our aircraft at the right price, at the right quantity, and from the right renewable and decarbonized sources. It all started partnering with hydrogen suppliers, leaders in their domain, namely Air Liquide, Linde, Plug Power, and more recently Fortescue Future Industries, and few others to be soon disclosed. We've also been discussing a lot with various electricity suppliers, and we are very pleased to be partnering with SNAM in order to study how the current gas pipeline could be used or reused to distribute hydrogen. Because securing hydrogen is not enough for us, we want to make sure that we access green or decarbonized hydrogen. 
securing an entire end-to-end -end clean hydrogen value chain is absolutely key. And third, there is no point either in having a zero emission aircraft if airports can't host and operate that aircraft. And on that front, we made great progress. And I share with you two very concrete examples to illustrate how the airport of tomorrow would look like. And first, let's share an artist's view of what we've been working on with our joint partners, Group ADP and Air Liquide. And what you can see here is a complete hydrogen infrastructure for a large hub airport, say in the 2050s and beyond. This type of infrastructure will be able to support significant volume of hydrogen propelled aviation. What you can see on this um, picture includes a complete water electrolysis hydrogen production plant, a liquefaction unit, storage spaces, an entire distribution system. This infrastructure will not de be deployed in one go, but rather in few steps approach. We'll first supply liquid hydrogen to the airport by ground refueler trucks, and then, as from 2040s onwards, we'll be able to start liquefying and storing liquid hydrogen onto the airport, increasing capacity thereafter to keep pace with increased traffic. We've also made great progress with our partners, Vinci Airports and Lyon Saint-Exupéry Airports. And I'll share in a minute a short extract video of what I just described. We'll first start deploying liquid hydrogen uh, usage for non-aviation, such as uh, AV uh, duty truck and preparing for the next steps in order to deploy onto the airport the fueling of liquid hydrogen to support the successful entry into service of our zero emission aircraft, first by supplying through ground refueler trucks and then um, deploying on-site production, liquefaction and distribution facilities. You see, with these two concrete very examples, we are in a position to prove that, yes, deploying hydrogen ecosystem is feasible. It is feasible from the technology point of view as well as for the space study. And we are working on other partnership with many other airports and hydrogen and energy suppliers around the world in order to design jointly those solutions that will make deployment of hydrogen possible in the future. And we are even something closer to home that will help Airbus reduce its own carbon footprint. I want to share here image of the FAR project, which is just next door here in Blagnac. The FAR project, you can see here, is a local partnership between Airbus iPort and soon Aeroport Toulouse Blagnac to make this platform amongst one of the very first European airports to produce, distribute, and operate hydrogen produced from renewable energies. And we are currently exploring many other potential applications um, uh, on, the, uh, on the platform. Um, light mobility, uh, airport vehicles, power and heating, logistics, that all of them will be contributing to reduce the carbon footprint of our sites. So Glenn, you, tell, you ask us what's next. We'll keep expanding on other airports to better understand how they could be adapted to the hydrogen ecosystem. Stay tuned for our future announcements on that front. It's only through close collaboration with all those actors 
cross and multi-sectorial beyond our traditional boundaries that we will be able to deploy timely the uh, shared vision of the hydrogen up at airport. Thank you, Karine. So, so you can see that there's a huge amount happening on the ecosystem side, and it highlights the importance we attach to the development of that ecosystem because we're convinced that if we don't have the ecosystem in the necessary shape, we essentially don't have a zero emission aircraft. But what about this aircraft and the technology activities that we've been progressing? Uh, and to start with, I'd like to ask Matthias to talk about our hydrogen combustion demonstrator, which we announced last February, uh, and discuss where we stand today. Thanks, Glenn. So uh, in February, we have announced this uh, partnership with, uh, with CFM uh, with the objective to, uh, to convert the A380 MSN1, which is one of our uh, flight tests, into an hydrogen combustion demonstrator. So really the objective is to have a, a converted turbofan to be able to, um, to, to combust uh, hydrogen and to, to fly test it on this, uh, on this platform. So since then, well, what we have done is that we have set up a joint team uh, with uh, CFM and Airbus. Uh, we have defined the way of working, so it will be a, an iterative process. And during this first iteration, we have been working on the maturation of the concept, so we have been working on the architecture, really to, uh, to define the kind of uh, element, the kind of system that we want to test and th that will be uh, needed in order to achieve uh, this, uh, this test. We have also done the first uh, concept of a physical integration of these uh, elements uh, inside aircraft. We have been working also on the safety requirement that will be uh, needed and that will be uh, specific to this, uh, to this demonstrator. And we have also been working a lot on the, on the controllability and on the operation of this, uh, of this aircraft. Talking about operation, Karin, you mentioned it uh, uh, earlier, it's really important to have the ground operation and the ground support in order to operate an hydrogen aircraft. And it's also the case for a demonstrator. So for that, we needed an hydrogen refueling station, and we have launched earlier in the, in the year a call for tender in order to, um, uh, to, to get that, that partnership. And I'm really happy uh, to share with you the outcome of this, uh, of this consultation uh, with you. And we have selected uh, Ariane Group to be our partner for the hydrogen refueling station for the demonstrator. So I will let you in, um, in a <coughs> short video uh, showing you a bit the concept of this, uh, of this hydrogen refueling station. Ariane Group has, uh, has decades of experience in, uh, in managing uh, hydrogen thanks to, to the involvement in, uh, in Ariane Launcher. So in designing uh, hydrogen system, in testing uh, uh, hydrogen uh, uh, engines for rockets, also in supporting the, the operation for, for, the, for the launchers. Combined with the expertise of Airbus in, uh, in developing uh, aircraft, we will do, uh, in the frame of uh, this demonstrator, we will achieve the first refueling of, uh, of uh, an Airbus aircraft with, uh, with hydrogen. So this partnership is really uh, dedicated to the demonstrator, uh, but as uh, explained by, Car by Karin, we really need to further go in, uh, in, uh, in partnership for the long term in order to support also the serial, the serial aircraft. So beyond this uh, bilateral partnership, which is dedicated to the demonstrator, uh, Safran and Airbus, who are the shareholders of, uh, of Ariane Group, also decided to position Ariane Group as uh, one of the, um, of the center of excellence in order to support the zero emission uh, roadmap of both companies. Super. Thank you, Matthias. So many of you already know that there are basically two ways to use hydrogen in its raw form on board an aircraft. 
We've just heard Matthias talking about our demonstrator, which is planned to combust hydrogen in an engine uh, in a gas turbine on board the A380. Uh, but there are other ways to convert hydrogen into useful power on board an aircraft. Uh, and one of those ways is, is, is fuel cells with motor control units and electric motors to power a propeller or a fan. Uh, hydrogen fuel cells are of particular interest to us uh, because they may allow uh, flight, commercial flight, with no NOx, no contrails, and of course if we're using the green hydrogen that we're uh, fighting to have available, uh, it will have, of course, no, no CO2. In fact, we believe fuel cells are such an interesting technology uh, for onboard power generation that we've established a joint venture with an automotive player, uh, which we already communicated two years ago in, in 2020. There's for sure still plenty to overcome to achieve something scalable uh, and commercially viable, but we believe that the prize is so significant that it's worth making these investments. Essentially, uh, investing in fuel cells, investing in fuel cell propulsion systems is adding to the technology options which we're giving ourselves without making any decision on what ultimately we will end up uh, commercializing on a zero E aircraft platform. Uh, this fuel cell propulsion pathway is one that we've progressed quite a lot on and if successful, could one day lead the way to a fuel cell powered commercial aircraft. And we're all really excited to share with you today a video of what a fuel cell propulsion system could look like if we achieve our technology targets that we're working on right now. And here to tell us all about this new type of engine, this fuel cell propulsion system, is Hauke, uh, as we said, head of the fuel cell propulsion system activities in Zero E. Yeah, hello. Thank you, Glenn. I think this video was already worth a cinema ticket. So, <laughs> how does it work? This is a question. And in order to answer this, let's watch together a short infographic which explains the details of the technology. Yeah, you have seen there's a lot of technology inside and actually this kind of engine concept which you could have seen in the infographic and in the video has a shaft power of more than two megawatt and four of these engines are able to power a regional aircraft of more than 100 packs. And actually also important to say is that we are confident that we get the technologies already developed in time in order to support a zero year aircraft in 2035 based on this technology. 
Yes, actually, if you said you heard right. And it's important to say that Airbus is working on this technology for quite a while now already. And this journey actually started more than 15 years ago already. And also important to remember the Fenix demonstrator project. And the ambition at this time was to replace one of the four jet engines with a two megawatt electric motor. At this time, we learned a lot about the integration uh, of high voltage systems on board of an aircraft. We learned a lot about uh, this, how to really implement the aircraft to these needs. But we also realized the difficulty of bringing battery technology on board of an aircraft at the scale in order to allow powering the aircraft with it. So we needed to find a new way. However, the ambition and the spirit of electric propulsion of the EFNX demonstrator continued within Zeri. When actually Zeri started, the first step was really to build up the team, to build up the team which allows us to match and to continue on our ambition of electric propulsion, but this time based on an enhanced concept, on an improved concept using fuel technology. So we started with 10 ultra motivated engineers with different skill sets. We integrated our colleagues from EFNX. We went to see our colleagues from space because of the knowledge about hydrogen systems. And we knocked at the door of our colleagues from helicopters because of the knowledge about gearbox and propeller blade design. However, this wasn't enough by far. And for this reason, we in Airbus, we in Zuri, as a part of Airbus, we started a significant hiring campaign worldwide to really find the best talents which we need for this significant ambition. And we combined this one with our own in-house experts to really form a star team, a huge team, in order to work on this ambition. And it's important to say that we scouted worldwide for the best suppliers and partners we could find in order to develop all the different technology bricks you could have seen before and all the different systems you have seen in order to make this engine concept a reality. So you can imagine that especially the fuel cell stacks at the core heart of a fuel cell powered engine took a lot out of our energy. And here we scouted worldwide, really in an intensive manner, to find the right and the best players to go with. And we actually met a company called Aaron Klinger, which is developing and producing exceptional fuel cell stacks for the automotive market already. And we have seen this as a perfect starting point to develop the next generation of fuel cell stacks, especially uh, fitting the, uh, the stringent aeronautic requirements. And for this reason, Aaron Klinger and Airbus decided together to, to, to create really a special partnership and to create, a, to create a company which is really specializing on this ambition to bring fuel sets to aviation and to develop the first fuel set sticks really for this sector. It was the time when the joint venture already mentioned by Glenn was born. So the joint venture is Aerostack, and we are really proud of having uh, them on board uh, and the significant ambition in front of us. So step by step, together with our partners in Airbus, we started to learn. We started uh, to learn from each other's competences and to build up on these. We started to understand really what it means to create a propulsion system. And actually, we started the development and progressed a lot on the development of the different technology bricks and systems required to build a future fuel cell engine concept. And today, I'm very happy to announce to you that we achieved there a very important milestone. In a quite of record time of two and a half years, we have been able to design and to, to develop the first fuel cell engine uh, uh, demonstrator at lab scale basis, which is already reaching the megawatt class. And this demonstrator actually will bring us significant learnings with regard to the integration, operation, and controls of a future engine. So, you have heard I have used the word fusel almost in every second sentence. Um, however, what is this technology about and what we have already achieved with regards to this and what we have achieved already with the fusel system? And this is a good moment to watch the first time our brand new uh, episode of our con content series exactly about this topic fusels. 
hier now live on stage. A fuser is a device which generates electricity via an electrochemical reaction. And this is being done out of hydrogen and oxygen which we are taking from the air. This one is done on a direct way and not via a combustion beforehand. And this brings an advantage and this one is efficiency. Apart from the efficiency, there's another advantage coming from the fuser technology and it is that it can be done almost emission free, meaning no uh, CO2 no NOx and even low or almost no contrails in the end. The biggest challenge is to get enough power to power an aircraft out of this technology and this as an acceptable weight level. We achieve the required power level by stacking the, the fuel cells inside a fuel cell stack, which means we are putting multi hundreds of fuel cells inside one stack. Then we have a fuel cell stack, but it's alone uh, it's not enough. We then combine the fuel cell sticks in several channels and hence coming to the 400, 500, 600 kilowatt uh, level. However, it's even not enough to power an aircraft and hence we have multiple channels inside one aircraft in order to ensure enough power to operate it finally. We actually checked the fuel cell market and we realized by doing this that the current uh, fuel sets which are available are not fulfilling our stringent aeronautic requirements with regards to performance. In 2020, we actually founded together with a Ringklinger a joint venture, which we call Aerostack. And this joint venture has a task and the purpose to develop a forefront fuel cell uh, technology and hence a fuel cell stack for the aviation industry. The manufactured fuel cell stacks our partner, uh, the joint venture and Erin Klinger, are delivered here to Airbus Hamburg. And here in Hamburg, we made of, of the fuel stacks the fuel system. And this is by doing the design, the assembly, and in the end, the testing. We needed to start really at the scratch in order to understand how this technology works. We are doing it at a really impressive speed. Actually, the first fuel systems under tests are intentionally designed with many, many sensors inside and having the equipment really segregated from each other. This allows us a good accessibility on the one hand and on the other hand allows us to really understand and to read the detailed behavior of the systems. Both of them will help us in learning how to operate the system in the best way. Once we have installed the fuel cell stacks and the balance of plant components, it's time to test them. So we put the system in the test rig chamber. We connect the electrical and fluid interfaces. That's air, hydrogen and coolant. We close the test bench doors and we're ready to start the test. We monitor the operating conditions, the byproducts of the chemical reaction, and of course, the total power output. Actually, it's an iterative process and it's not always going as we wish and as we intended to go. So we definitely have um, encountered several issues and challenges, which is very good because we have seen them. And we have not stopped uh, looking at them, but we have really overcome them. It's really amazing to be working in this project. We are confident, it's super exciting, we're changing the world here and we learn every day. So once we have tested and, and everything is ready, we put it in a box and it's sent to the next destination. Yes, actually what you could have seen, what was put in this wooden box was one of the fuse systems on the way to be delivered to the EAS test house in Munich. But what are the next steps? Matthias, maybe you can tell us more about? Yes, I can. Okay. <laughs> so in the EIS uh, test house, what we are doing is really to, to assemble all the techno bricks, all the building blocks that are developed by the different teams inside the Airbus divisions, but also with uh, all the partners that we have uh, all over the world 
So really the, the objective here is to make a large scale uh, integration of uh, all of this system, which, which has an architecture that will be uh, as close as possible as what you described for, uh, for a future product. So this, is, this exists currently, and we are not starting it. We have started uh, a bit earlier to, uh, to, to build and to design this, uh, this uh, lab test demonstrator. Currently, what we have there is that we have uh, most of the, the power modules, so the, the fuel cell systems. We have also the air systems. Uh, we have uh, a part of the cooling system because we are on ground, so there are some simulation to do because obviously we don't have uh, the, the aircraft environment. Uh, we will have also uh, a part of the electrical system. Uh, some elements are still in test, for example, I can talk about the electrical motors that are still in test in, uh, in a sub-test uh, bench for the moment. Uh, we will also have the complete uh, high-voltage system fitted there. We will have the, the, the control and monitoring system. So really, we will have all the elements in order to start learning a lot about uh, integrated uh, full uh, system which could be used for, uh, for, for the propulsion of, uh, of an aircraft. So this first step is really about learning. So the equipment that we have on the lab are equipment that are not optimized. It's equipment that are made in order to be able to, to do different type of configuration, to access the internal parameters, to really understand what is the behavior and what is the best arrangement, the best architecture that we need uh, in order to, to, to make it. But this is only a first step because our approach is really to go step by step and we plan by the end of next year to really have the second step which will be more integrated e equipment but also flight qualified equipment and i'm really talking here about flight qualified equipment and i'm really really proud to announce you that we will take this technology in the air and i'm presenting you what will be our fuel cell demonstrator and I let you uh, have a look at the concept on the video. So you have seen briefly the, the, the concept of, uh, of this demonstrator. So our S380 MSN1, as I explained earlier, will be really our flight lab in order to test the different type of, uh, of uh, hydrogen technology. So we will test the, uh, the hydrogen combustion engine for sure, as, as we explained earlier. But we will also uh, test a scaled version of this uh, uh, hydrogen fuel cell propulsion uh, uh, system that will be uh, in the megawatt class. And we really plan to make this flight test during the hydrogen test campaign, which is planned between 2026 and 2028. Glenn, you may be a bit voiceless about this uh, big mm -hmm. announcement, but I, I hand over the mic to you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Matthias, and thank you, Hauke. So you've heard about the hydrogen combustion demonstrator and the hydrogen fuel cell demonstrator. And one of the common uh, elements of both of those demonstrators is, of course, we need to store hydrogen on board and distribute hydrogen uh, in its liquid state in order for those demonstrators to function. Uh, I'd now like to invite Chris, who, as I said earlier, is head of manufacturing for Zero E, uh, to explain where we're at in our manufacturing journey on this project. Okay, thank you, Glenn. Now, the, the fuel cell technology explained by Hauke a moment ago, this will address the scope three emissions of the aircraft. These are the emissions produced by the aircraft itself. But to achieve net zero, we need to go even further. On one hand, we need to address the, the quite complex manufacturing challenges ahead of us to actually manufacture the aircraft. But on the other hand, we must eliminate the industrial emissions during the manufacturing process itself. Now, at company level, we shall address three dimensions of sustainability. It's economic, environmental, and social. In future, this will be our license to operate. But we must go further. We must ensure the future industrial system is resilient to the types of global events that we continue to face today. And in fact, 
such is the importance of this topic on Zero E. We are already at this early stage defining the industrial system, working hand in hand with the design of the aircraft itself. In Airbus, we call this co-development. Now, aside from the sustainability dimension, there are some very specific technical challenges that we need to overcome in manufacturing this aircraft. If you take, for example, the hydrogen fuel system, there are, in fact, similarities with the fuel system on launcher applications or, or space rockets. But for our aircraft, we have to make the fuel system operate over many thousands of flight cycles, not only one. We must also learn how to scale up the manufacturing so that we can produce the aircraft at commercial aerospace rates compared with perhaps just one or two launchers per year. Now, to accelerate our understanding, and that's as shown on the, uh, on the slide here, to accelerate our understanding, we actually launched a project last year to, to design, to manufacture, and to test our first prototype cryogenic fuel system. Now, one of the aims of this project was to learn fast, perhaps fail fast, but crucially is to understand the challenges that we must overcome if we are to put a cryogenic hydrogen fuel storage system on board a commercial aircraft. Now, what we didn't expect with this program, and perhaps just click on to the next slide, what we didn't expect was the, the, the human connection, the, the real effort, the, the tenacity, the engagement, the enthusiasm, the commitment that the whole project team put into this. Um, so much so that in a little over 12 months, uh, the team have successfully completed the first test at cryogenic temperature of our prototype fuel system. And as if that wasn't enough, just last week the team told me that already in production are components for our second, more advanced, more representative prototype fuel system. So what comes next? Well, last year we announced two zero emissions development centers, or ZEDC. These are located on our Airbus sites in Nantes and Bremen. The intention of these sites is to, to scale up the production of hydrogen storage systems so that we can manufacture something like 50 tanks over the coming years. But also, we need to be able to, to, um, to um, implement the very strict aerospace manufacturing controls necessary because in just a few years' time, we will actually deliver to Matthias the full hydrogen fuel system for one of the A380 flight test demonstrators. Now, initially, our focus with these ZEDCs will be on the hydrogen fuel system. But in future, we plan to scale this ambition to develop a network of ZEDCs so that we can develop the capabilities on fuel cell propulsion, and in future, the aircraft itself. So this is the fuel system and airframe integration and testing. Now, for the ZEDCs to succeed, we will join forces with companies that have relevant technologies so that together we can co-develop on optimized product solutions and manufacturing processes. Now, personally, what I find, one of the things I find very interested on the Zero E project is that a lot of the suppliers we talk to today, they're not part of the aerospace sector, but they see the opportunity in aligning their technology strategies with the needs of a future decarbonized aerospace industry. Now, since collaboration will be key to our success, over the next few years, we will strengthen our connections with both the supply chain and the research ecosystems, working hand in hand, peer to peer, with companies that have both relevant technologies, but also a shared interest in our climate goal. Now, watch this space next year for more information on our ZEDCs and how we will be looking for collaboration on those projects. But with that, I'll hand back to you, Glenn. Thank you, Chris. I remember saying at the last summit in 2021 that I believed this was one of the most exciting moments in aviation history. And everything we are doing now allows me to reiterate that thought here today. Of course, there are still huge challenges ahead and we're not uh, hiding them or ignorant of them. 
Um, but these are the right challenges for our industry and for us at Airbus to be trying to solve. We're building a highly capable team and partner network whose contributions I, I really want to uh, be explicit about. I'm very, very grateful for. And all of us are dead set on making zero emission aircraft a reality. Thank you, and now I pass you back to Jen. Great progress um, on the hydrogen front. Thank you so much. I'm sure we're going to have just a bundle of questions from the room, so let's get cracking. And who wants to go first? Why don't we go to this gentleman here? Good morning, Richard Schumann, Aaron Seid. Um, your research has been very much focused on fuel cell technology. What does this say about your selection of fuel cell versus direct injection of hydrogen? Or is the latter something that you leave to the engine manufacturers to solve? Yeah, so maybe I can talk a little bit about that. Um, we, I, I think you've seen, have two parallel paths. One is focusing on the gas turbine, so the combustion, the direct injection, I think you refer to it as, of, of hydrogen inside a gas turbine. Uh, that's one pathway which we're full speed on, and like Matthias was talking about, we have a demonstrator plan with CFM to push the limits of that pathway. At the same time, we have the fuel cell path, which is the one we haven't spoken about that much until today, and we've revealed quite a lot of what we're doing there in, in, this, uh, in this exchange. But they are today two parallel paths, and we're exploring the potential of those different technologies, both from a climate perspective and from a scalability, a technology perspective. Uh, and we are making decisions later about what finally the technology would be that we take to a commercial aircraft, but we're not at that point yet. Question over here. Bjorn Perm, uh, Liam News. Uh, to what extent are you using the cryogenic capability of the heat sink that you have in the liquid hydrogen in the fuel cell system that you are designing? To, are you using superconducting motors, uh, distribution system and so on? Because you describe that in a zero E, I think, uh, uh, episode before. Yeah. So maybe I take this question. Um, yes, we are looking at uh, also at really forefront technologies at going to cryo uh, cold uh, uh, power electronics. We are looking at it. The question is if we get the technology mature in time for the entry into service date in 2035, we are exploring on this. However, anyway, we need to use the cryogenic heat or negative heat actually stored inside the hydrogen uh, for two reasons. On the one hand, we don't want to invest additional uh, energy to uh, to uh, evaporize the hydrogen. But on the other hand, it's really it's it's a gift for especially for the fuel cell technology. It's a gift because we can uh, uh, let's say dump up to eight to ten percent of the heat load of the entire combustion system inside. And this is of course something we are definitely want to use. Thank you. Down here. Andreas Spree, German aviation journalist. This is the first presentation of Zero E I've ever seen where you didn't show the blended wing body or not many other aircraft <laughs> platforms at all. So I wonder if you could give us a short update on your plans on how the aircraft, the Zero E aircraft, with whatever propulsion you choose in the end, or which combination you choose, might look like. I understand this pod system is a bit has a bit fallen out of fashion. The blended wing body is also never was never very very likely to happen, as we all know. So. A little bit of update would be great, and I would also like to have a short timeline on what you actually, when you actually touch the A380 MSN1 or the other one, to actually modify. When, when will this process start of the A380, 8080s, the both, getting them ready for these test purposes? Thank you. Okay. So, may, so maybe I'll talk a little bit about the aircraft, and then Matthias can talk about the A380 mod modifications. So the um, the blended wing body, for sure, it's the one that has circled the world several times in, in the media, but it's also the least likely of the different options for us to bring to commercial service by our target of 2035. 
Um, it's, a, it's a really interesting concept from a performance perspective because the extra volume that hydrogen requires for it to be stored is easily handled by that geo, geometric uh, shape and it's a very efficient aerodynamic shape. But going in one single step to change completely the propulsion system and change completely the aircraft configuration would just be simply too, too much and it would push the targeted entry into service date out by several years. So we're much more concentrated on what we would call a classical uh, tube and wing configuration with nonetheless a very, very different uh, propulsion system. Um, we've uh, been running a lot of studies on, on where, for example, to store the hydrogen. Uh, you've perhaps seen concepts that, that have been studied across the world previously, uh, potentially storing hydrogen above the fuselage, potentially storing it in sponsons either side at the bottom of the fuselage. In the pods, we reveal the concept uh, which is, is exploring that way of storing hydrogen uh, pods, so under the wing. And, and I, I think it's, uh, it's safe to say that at the moment the, the trend is more towards uh, what we've seen, what we've revealed in fact to the public, which is a um, storage of the hydrogen in two tanks behind the rear pressure bulkhead uh, in the fuselage. That looks like what makes the most technical and also um, per performance sense at an overall aircraft level. Uh, and then perhaps just to come back on to the A380 and when we start to modify it, I'd let Matthias take that one. Yes, in terms of modification of the S380, as you have seen on the concept, we tried to have really a similar concept between the H2 combustion demonstrator and the fuel cell demonstrator. That means that we will be able to really uh, prepare in advance most of the building blocks in order to be able to, uh, to, to fit the, 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 the two systems. So. The modification of the aircraft itself will not start now uh, because the S380 MSN1 uh, still have some tests to do in order to support the, the, the S380 uh, program. So this is the, the priority up to now. But we are starting to build some of the blocks. For example, you have seen on the, on the concept that uh, we have what we call a tent, which is a, a bubble where we will store all the hydrogen cryogenic tanks in order to, to have the the unpressurized condition inside the pressurized cabin in order to, to, to expose these tanks to the, to the external conditions. So these blocks are, uh, will be uh, starting to be designed, uh, tested in a, in a small scale, and then uh, built in a larger scale starting of, uh, of, of next year. But the modification of the aircraft itself will really uh, uh, start beginning of uh, 2025 in order to be ready uh, for the flight test campaign, which is planned in uh, 2026. Great, thank you. I believe there's a question over here. Yeah, hi, Sid Philip from Bloomberg News. Just a quick question. You have a timeline for 2025 to 2028 to test out the various configurations, and you also have an entry of service in 2035. So how do the sort of timelines square away, given the fact that, one, you have to sort of finalize what propulsion you choose and then get that certified? So are you realistically saying that by 2035, you'll actually make it into service. Yeah, uh, absolutely. That's that's definitely still our target, and the dates you mentioned are totally correct. Um, so 2028 to 2035 would give us uh, about seven years. Um, the the key, um, I guess, way to manage that seven years and make sure that it can be secured is to do what we call as much as possible out of cycle development. In fact, some of the activities we're doing now, some of the de-risking and maturing of the technologies that we're doing now, uh, you want to put those as early as possible in the plan so you de-risk the, the, let's say, program development phase which would come in the time frame, time frame we were just mentioning. Thanks, Glenn. I have a question from an online viewer for Karine um, asking, is there, uh, are there any partnerships in Africa and in the Middle East, and would you be interested? So the beauty of our industry is that we are having aircraft flying everywhere, and uh, of course we are looking at uh, every region in order to support uh, the operation of our zero emission aircraft. And as such, we are indeed interested in exploring as well the capability into Middle East Africa that uh, I can't disclose as of today, but we are having very interesting discussions that we should be able to disclose soon. Good, looking forward to that. 
Let's take another question from the audience. Down here, Tim. Hi there, uh, Tim Robinson, Aerospace. Um, the refueling station from your, uh, that Ariane Group is working with, is that, is that uh, just for the demonstrator? Is that likely to be in airports of the future? Because I can see some airports and maybe local councils looking at that and going, hmm, massive big blast pen. Um, we're not sure we want our airport turned into Cape Canaveral. <laughs> this, this specific partnership that, um, that I have been uh, presented to you is really dedicated to the demonstrator. This is really a technology demonstration of the, of the refueling, so we need to learn about, the, about how to handle uh, hydrogen, how to refuel aircraft, how we manage the communication between the, the ground and the onboard system. So all of this is really about learning, so this partnership is really dedicated to, uh, to, to, the, to the demonstrator. Maybe for the longer term, maybe Karin, I'll, I'll let you go a bit more in the details for the longer term plan. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Matthias. I, I did mention a few times in our deployment of the hydrogen ecosystem that we would start deploying by a first phase of liquid hydrogen through uh, ground refueler trucks. So this um, ground refueler is, is a full part of our solutions to bring hydrogen to the airports in a first phase. So we'll obviously uh, team up with uh, Matthias and his team in order to learn from this first phase of demonstration, as well as working with our uh, very great partners in the hydrogen ecosystem to uh, bring to market uh, the uh, liquid hydrogen ground refueler solutions uh, to enable that operations. And maybe, maybe just to, to tackle the, the blast pen uh, part of the question, um, I, I don't know if, if you're all aware, but there was a liquid hydrogen refueling station in the center of Munich in the 2010s. There are liquid hydrogen refuelings happening uh, already on, on trucks. Uh, we're going to see much more of that as we progress through this decade. If we just take the European numbers, they're talking about uh, close to 100,000 hydrogen trucks being on the road by, by, the 20, by 2030. Uh, hydrogen refueling is, is going to start to get um, closer and closer. It's going to be replacing, hopefully, the kerosene that we're using, the, the, the petrol, the diesel that we're using to fill ground vehicles and maritime vessels. That is, is, is a safe process. It's a, it's a process which is, um, has matured significantly over the last decades, and we're building on that by working with people like Ariane, by working with people um, doing this in the ground sector and developing commercial uh, ground sector implementations of these technologies right now. So I hope that's reassuring for you. I have a manufacturing question for Chris from an online viewer who is asking if there's a, if there's a decision been made on what we will make the hydrogen tanks out of. Will it be composite, metallic? I, I guess a, a, a common theme that we've reiterated um, several times across the panel, at, this, at the moment we are developing technologies, we're exploring technologies. We want to put ourselves in the strongest position towards the end of the decade to uh, to select those technologies and, and to configure them onto one aircraft. Um, we are currently exploring technologies in aluminium. Um, we, we believe that aluminium, um, based on experience from the space launcher business, is an available technology. Um, and so that is, is certainly something that we are uh, today working on. Um, we do see an opportunity in future, probably not by 2035 timescales, but we do see an opportunity in future to, to really improve the gravimetric index of this fuel system, so to reduce the weight um, if we can move to a CFRP tank, to so a carbon fibre based tank. Um, the, the science, the physics is, is complex with CFRP, we're, we're not there yet, and so we are in an early stage of, of research and, and technology uh, on the CFRP. Thank you. Another question from the room, John? Uh, John Ostrauer, The Air Current. Uh, you're obviously focused predominantly on technology development, but Glenn, what, what have you learned about the economics of, of hydrogen, of, of actually delivering an airplane that can be flown theoretically profitably for mm -hmm. commercial operation? Sure, I can say a few words about that. Uh, probably the the biggest uh, variation on the cost of uh, operating a, a hydrogen aircraft will be the cost of the hydrogen itself. And it's why Karine and the team um, uh, are, are focused so much on understanding how we can get 
hydrogen in its liquid state uh, at airports and, and at what price we can get it at in, in different locations. And it's why Karin has uh, started developing a concept uh, of launch clusters um, because we, we will need to think in a different way about how we introduce this aircraft into service. We'll need to think about where in the world does have the most attractive hydrogen cost. Where, where is the regulation uh, most incentivizing for such an aircraft, as well as what we typically think of, which is, you know, is there a market and are there airline customers uh, wanting to operate it? So that's, that's quite a different approach that we're, we're having to, to take. And, and depending on how things evolve on, on hydrogen cost, if we look at, for example, some of the International Energy Agency forecasts, they're, they're saying that there are various regions in the world uh, which could get to around $1 per kilogram of hydrogen production. That is uh, an extremely attractive price point and would even allow us to be competitive with uh, kerosene. Now, our, our view is that in terms of the global picture, we're not going to get to that. It's likely to be more expensive than the sort of aviation we're used to today, but not disruptively so. Uh, we will still be able to provide what I believe is the the, the gift of being able to physically connect across the world to billions of people, uh, even in, in such a, a future of hydrogen aircraft or sustainable aviation fuel aircraft for that matter. Great, thank you. Question here. Thierry Dubois, Aviation Week. A question on the power of the fuel cell. Is it correct to say that what allowed you to go from hundreds of kilowatts to the megawatt class was the partnership with Erling? Is that correct? Perhaps, Hauke, you could take that. So, first of all, it's very important to get the power density to the right level, which is uh, acceptable for the aviation target. And there we need to start from a really good uh, set point uh, on this journey. And yes, uh, we see the Ring Klinger as one on the forefront uh, in the automotive sector. However, this kind of scale going really from the kilowatts to the megawatts, which is from automotive to aviation, it's of course an additional effort which is required and that's the reason why we have the joint venture in place. But also what you might have seen in the infographic is that you could see that a fuel cell engine is not one fuel cell stack alone and also as explained in the video, there will be several modules inside which brings also even on top several advantages. Thank you. I have an interesting question from an online viewer. Are there some standards that need to be defined for hydrogen fuel distribution? And are you working or cooperating with any other companies or international organizations, Boeing, OACI, or whatever? I can take that one, maybe. Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. Regulation and standardization is at the earth of what we do uh, um, about deploying the uh, hydrogen uh, ecosystem. And we are part of uh, multi-sectorial initiatives uh, for standardization and regulation in all regions of the world. And we are happy to collaborate with many of those. And our colleagues from aviation are certainly part of our efforts to uh, set the standard, I think, in this industry, uh, we've been able to, s to, to be leader in setting standards. So do we uh, for the uh, standardization of uh, hydrogen uh, usage on ground, but also uh, in, in flight. Thank you. Question here. Hi, Dominic Perry with Flight Global. Um, why go to the trouble of developing your own hydrogen fuel cell propulsion system rather than going out to the market where there are several examples already in test? And secondly, if you go to market with this, does it change the dynamic of Airbus from being a customer to a supplier of uh, propulsion systems? So I, th I think the, the first point to highlight is that right now what we're doing is developing the technologies. We're developing uh, the, the methods for integrating those technologies into a, a fuel cell type engine. Uh, it doesn't mean that Airbus will do this on its own uh, in a subsequent step if we decide to commercialize that technology. We, we might decide that that's the best approach, um, but we could easily also decide to, 
to partner. Um, and, and in fact, for many of the technologies already in that fuel cell uh, system and in the ground demonstrator that we're doing already, we've got significant partners involved to help us to, to get there. Maybe to add even on this perimeter, it's important to say that we need to drive the technology forefront and that's why we see it as our duty to really significantly invest and to really understand it because also this technology will influence the overall aircraft design and we need to consider it as a global package. Thank you. Another question here. Bjorn Fam again from Liam. Uh, there is one gas turbine on the aircraft which is the most polluting one that we are not talking about, the APU. If we get hydrogen on an aircraft, the, there's a slam dunk of actually going and replacing the APU first uh, because that could be play, replaced with a fuel cell. So where is Airbus on that? How, how much have you done? So it's, it's definitely uh, a possibility to replace the APU with uh, fuel cells, especially if you've already got hydrogen on board. Um, it's a bit more difficult for aircraft that are currently flying today because you, you don't have hydrogen on board and you would need an infrastructure to be available at significant scale while only achieving very small percentage improvement because the APU, it's, it's, it's tiny overall in, com in comparison to the engines in, in terms of overall um, CO2 emissions, for example. So the, we don't see the balance as being quite right in terms of uh, benefit versus pain uh, for, for that sort of implementation until we go to an aircraft which has already hydrogen on board. And then, like you said, it's potentially a slam dunk. Yes, yes, definitely. As part of what we're doing, the APU is absolutely considered in the activities. Yeah. yeah. Another question down here. Uh, how could you said something about uh, the, the, the uh, fuel cells and uh, the, these various packs that you need. Do you have an inkling what the weight penalty is of such a thing? And maybe a question on the storage tanks. Uh, that's a complicated design as well to make them as uh, light as possible. Uh, what's the progress on that? So I can start with the first question and then... Uh yeah, let's start with it first. So it's a very complex question and it's not easy to answer right straight away um, like this within a few minutes. However, it's important to say that you need to look at the global system with regards to this. Of course, a fuel cell will be likely or a fuel cell engine will be likely more heavy or will have, let's say, significant higher challenges compared to a combustion engine which is based on hydrogen. However, you need to look at the full equation and their efficiency also plays a role and we see there really a promising pathway for this technology to be in the end really attractive for the market and in the end attractive for the economics of the aircraft. Yeah and and then maybe on the the tank question so uh, maybe just to share a few numbers so kerosene has about 12,000 watt hours per kilogram so that's the content of energy in in kerosene 12,000 watt hours per in in one kilogram uh, hydrogen uh, has 33,000 watt hours in, in one kilogram. Uh, the, the beauty of kerosene, uh, even if it has lots of disadvantages, uh, the beauty is that you can more or less put that inside the wing structure uh, and fuselage structure and you don't need any tank around it. So you, you have 12,000 watt hours per kilogram essentially available to the aircraft. The challenge with hydrogen is that you've got to put, and as uh, Chris showed, a twin-walled vacuum insulated tank around your, your hydrogen to store it in a cryogenic state. And that essentially takes your 33,000 uh, back to more or less what we've got with kerosene, down to the, let, let's say, 12,000 watt hours per kilogram number, when it is integrated in, into the aircraft. So the, the penalty isn't so, uh, significant. We're, we're trying to make it as, as equivalent as, as possible. The, the, the big advantage is that hydrogen as a molecule carries much more energy than, than kerosene. But yeah, it's, it's trickier to store it. 
Speaking of the tanks, I have an online question, maybe for, for Chris, asking if um, the two tanks uh, behind the rear bulkhead, would that change the center of gravity for longer range aircraft and how would we manage that? So at the moment, the, the, the focus is on a, is a hundred packs, a uh, thousand nautical mile aircraft. Um, we we recognize that, that there is significant challenge ahead of us to, to make that configuration work for, for longer range. Uh, twin aisle aircraft, long haul aircraft, it's really not something we're studying at the moment. Now, clearly, if you, as Glenn has just explained, if you transfer the, uh, the fuel from wing tanks to the rear of the aircraft, aircraft, clearly it does have a change on the C of G of the aircraft. Um, and one of our colleagues is not with us on the panel today, but he, he has, and with his team, he's been studying for, for over three years different aircraft configurations and, and step by step, trade study by trade study, we, we start to converge on, on some viable aircraft configurations. Uh, and yes, the, the fuel tanks in the back and the rear fuselage do have an effect, but, but we consider that a, a, a viable option, a viable aircraft configuration. Yeah, yeah may, maybe just to add to that. So if, if that was kerosene stored in that location, uh, it would be a problem because the change in center of gravity during the flight would be very significant. The, the, there's a big difference with hydrogen. I, th I explained earlier that the tank is actually a large part, large part of the weight. So as you actually consume your hydrogen, you're not changing the weight of the aircraft so much. What, what we're concerned about is a change in center of gravity rather than that the CG is, is in a given location. Yeah. And the change of the center of gravity is the, uh, quite the same challenge when, when we have configuration with uh, rear-mounted uh, uh, engines. So the way to tackle it is just to move a bit forward, the, the, the backward, sorry, the, 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 wing. the wings, and, and we address that. And with the hydrogen, we have the body that there will not be a variation of the center of gravity. So it, it is the way we will deal with this kind of, uh, of problems. Yeah. Thank um, you. Manju from the Times of here. India. Um, this is about the liquid hydrogen production at the airport. You showed a model. Um, how large is the area of, of that plant? And do you see airports with space constraints like Heathrow or Delhi or, and Bombay? How do you see them move to phase two? Thank you for the question. <laughs> this is indeed what uh, about the rationale of uh, conducting a study and pre-feasibility engineering study of what it means to develop uh, liquid hydrogen infrastructure on site. And uh, we recognize that certain airports would be more constrained than others. And that's the reason why we are running to studies in the various clusters that, uh, that we mentioned. We'll, we'll first develop uh, the usage of uh, hydrogen onto the airport platform for non-aviation uh, users. We mentioned light mobility, buses, heavy duty transport and then start uh, ramping up and scaling up uh, by uh, adding the liquefaction capability to uh, fuel the aviation needs. In the uh, requirements to have liquid uh, hydrogen to fuel aviation needs, um, we have uh, various uh, ways to, um, to make it a reality. As I mentioned earlier, we have identified various scenarios in order to make it a reality at airport, and it will depend on the setup of that airport. We will be able to utilize um, ground refueler trucks to bring that liquid hydrogen from the uh, production plant uh, in the nearby a few uh, hundred kilometers from there. We would be also able, in certain circumstances, to utilize gas pipeline or other means in order to bring the molecule of the gaseous hydrogen up to the airport platform, liquefy it, and store it on the airport. And then the third solution is when um, space allows it, which in, in all cases we've uh, done so far, it does, uh, in order to um, uh, study the full engineering of an entire production, liquefaction, storage and distribution unit. And from that distribution unit onto the airport, you have again various ways in order to distribute up to the uh, aircraft point whether by trucks still or by hydrogen pipelines. So we have many ways in order to cover and adapt the deployment of such hydrogen ecosystem to the real conditions of the existing infrastructure. Great, thank you, Karine. 
and thank you to the panel. It's time for us to wrap up now. Um, it was great to hear so many interesting questions um, from our online viewers and also within the room. Thank you very much for your great, your great questions and your enthusiasm for our hydrogen topic. Um, it's time for us to take a break now here in Toulouse. Um, so um, for our online audience, if you could please connect back at 1.45 Central European time. We'll be picking up again this afternoon with news from the teams working on hybridization and on clean vertical flight. So we will see you later. Thank you very much.
back, everyone. Welcome to the afternoon session of uh, the Airbus Summit 2022. Delighted to have everyone back in the room and our online viewers watching us. Just a reminder, uh, details from the morning sessions are now available on the Airbus.com website. So you can catch up on what you might have missed this morning. Um, and the remaining uh, moments will also be coming up on the website over the next day or so. So, we are now ready to look at one of the levers to improve aircraft performance and reduce fuel consumption, hybridization. And again, collaboration is the name of the game. Last year, when we spoke about electrification, we introduced City Airbus, the eVTOL multi-copter concept. Today, we will look at where we are on the road to electrification for commercial aircraft. Reaching carbon neutrality by 2050, in line with the Paris Agreement, won't be a walk in the park, as we say here at Airbus. Here to explain how we are joining efforts with other European players and initiatives, please welcome, from the European Commission, Head of Unit Low Emission Future Industries, Jane Amilat. Welcome, Jane. From the automotive giant Renault, we have two special guests, VP Advanced Technologies, Jean-François Salissi. Hello. And Head of Research, Patrick Bastard. Hello. Bonjour. Bonjour. And from Airbus, Chief Technical Officer Savina Klauke. Welcome, Savina. Hello. And we also have with us the head of the electrification roadmap, Karim Mokadem. Bonjour. Bonjour, Karim. And the head of engineering propulsion at Commercial Aircraft, Frank Hasselbach. Good afternoon. Fantastic. Great panel for you this afternoon. And I am going to start with Karim and ask you simply to give us an update on where we are on our roadmap to carbon neutrality here at Airbus. Happy to do it, uh, Jennifer. So yes, indeed, last year we, we presented a little bit what we intend to do uh, in terms of electrification roadmap. And since there, we've been all together working actively on that. So you've seen this morning Nicolas Chrétien uh, talking about SAF and our ambition to, to be uh, 100 SAF compliant by 2030. Uh, you've seen also Glenn and his outstanding team talking about hydrogen and, and what we unveil today, which is a, a major event uh, for this summit. And all those activities are part of a very structured and comprehensive Airbus roadmap that I would like to share with you today. So this roadmap is structured around three trends. And again, it's not sequential trends because simply we cannot afford, we don't have time to think sequentially. So it's rather a set of three trends we are exploring in parallel. And the objective of this roadmap is to assess uh, the way we will reach our 2050 carbon neutrality. <coughs> Trend one, is what we call incremental. On that topic, Airbus Helicopter is leading the way with more electrification of their solutions. And here, the idea is to use electricity to ease the auto rotation in case of a single engine helicopter failure. And there is also everything that we mentioned around the SAF uh, compliance and our capability to reach 100% of uh, SAF compliance by 2030. For, Air, for Airbus commercial, Airbus helicopters, but also for Airbus defense and space. The second trend is what we have called our modular electrification ambition. And here we are exploring a sort of common building blocks that we want to assess around a common voltage, which would be around 800 volts, synergies in terms of electrical motors with a range between 300 and 500 kilowatts, and also the energy storage. This is the common denominator that we want to explore, having in mind that it could help us to fulfill in a very modular way the needs of our different uh, aerospace solution. Here again, Airbus Helicopter is leading the way for us, for the Airbus team, uh, and the first uh, application is a parallel hybrid helicopter on which we are combining two paths, one electrical path and one linked to the thermal engine. I'm not going to talk too much on that one because you will see in the next plateau with Bruno Evin and Thomas Krizinski the important insights that have been done on this demonstration. 
Then we have our EcoPulse, which is a small aircraft that we are exploring together with Safran and Daer. And here the objective is to make fly uh, a, a battery, a high voltage battery that will be around uh, 300 kilowatts and also a, a voltage network that will be around 800 volts. So again, the, this demonstration will allow us to secure the way we see this modular uh, approach. For much more transport military aircraft, we are also exploring the benefits of electrification. This time, it could be done with a module that will be around 600 to 1 megawatt, which is basically twice our module or building blocks of 300 to 500 kilowatts. The same module could be used for uh, the next, our next generation of aircraft with a very light hybridization on which we are exploring the potential of electrification at the aircraft level to reduce the fuel consumption, the fuel consumption up to 5%. This is for the modular approach. This modular approach is not only made to secure our different decision or technology decisions toward uh, a, a possible entry to service in 2030 to 2035. It is also made to uh, pool our needs and demands in terms of electrical parts to be a credible player on the market. So this is very important for us because this electrification topic is allowing us today to have such an approach. So this is for the modular electrification ambition and then we can move to the third trend which is 0E and I won't comment on that because you've seen already the plateau uh, on, on 0E uh, and, and you will see later the one on UAM. But the objective here is also to use those synergies uh, in terms of electrical part to ease or at least to transition towards our zero E ambition. So this is very important for us. Th this roadmap is not, um, it's not a communication roadmap, okay? <laughs> Everything that is depicted there is whether already flying will fly next year or will fly in the next three to four years. And this is why it's important to secure the different decision in a very stage way. And this is why working as an Airbus group team with Airbus Helicopter, Airbus Defense and Space, and Airbus Commercial is really important. It's our heritage because it's based on 10 years of electric flight or electric demonstration from Cricri uh, to Vahana to the IFAN Saga to IFAN X. And therefore, we learn a lot on that. And this today, the, the, we are leading to that because we did all that in the past. And finally, in South Future, we will have all together to fly in formation towards our 2050 carbon neutral ambition. And we won't do it alone, or at least at the Airbus Group level, we will do it together. Thank this is you. it, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Karim. And now we're going to go over to Frank we can see that a combination <coughs> of electrical <coughs> sources with gas turbines is essential for hybridization. And propulsion is at the heart of all of that. So we've spoken about sustainable aviation fuels, hydrogen fuel cell. Could you remind us what the key challenges are on the propulsion side? Okay, thank you very much for that question. Yes, propulsion is clearly at the center of the decarbonization of aviation, and we've seen that in, in all the discussions today already. So um, it's the exciting time for us to make decisions on, well, how do we go there? So we have three different routes, you could argue. So clearly, first of all, driving the technology of the gas turbine engine itself via propulsive efficiency and cycle efficiency. That's, that's what we do and what we have done the last 60, 70 years. And uh, of course, the next one is sustainable aviation fuel. So that is, cutting through uh, the open cycle fossil fuel sort of burning we have today and closing that cycle. What does this mean? So we're taking um, carbon sources of today via feedstock, biofeedstocks, wastes and so on and uh, sort of um, develop them, manufacture fuel from those carbon sources of today. That actually is a closed cycle and we don't add CO2 to the budget of the planet. 
We won't do this just with biostocks alone. We will actually also need green energy and produce some uh, green hydrogen and use some uh, captured CO2 to then fish a drops uh, uh, synthetic fuel, so power to liquid. So that's overall the sustainable aviation fuel. That's the first trend. No change to the gas turbine itself, <coughs> but uh, new fuels. The second trend is hydrogen. We talked about that a lot today already. And hydrogen clearly is um, just fundamentally taking green energy from solar, tidal, or wind, and uh, by uh, um, <coughs> electrolysis sort of uh, produce hydrogen and then use it uh, as uh, a fuel in the gas turbine, or uh, with all the, 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 the complexity we talked about earlier in terms of storing it appropriately in the aircraft, distributing it in a cryogenic way to the engines and so on, or effectively use it in a fuel cell by generating again electrical uh, energy, which you can then use via uh, motor generators and power electronics to drive a propeller or a fan. The interesting bit for us here is that the technology bricks in that fuel cell engine you've seen earlier today are also technology bricks we can use for adding the off-design behavior of gas turbine. And this is where the electrification on the hybrid electric approach comes in. So what you could do there is take the power electronics and the motor generators in the territory of 500 kilowatt to a megawatt and effectively put them onto the spools of the high pressure spool and the low pressure spool of a, of a gas turbine and then help things like starting the engine, closing the engine down when it's very hot, um, um, doing step climb accelerations, um, supporting a little bit of takeoff and, and, and climb if you want, but clearly, it's all about helping the transients and the off-design optimization, which also lends itself to shorter missions as the biggest benefit. Before we go into more detail about hybridization, let's have a look at a video that tells us what it's all about. <clears throat> as passengers board, the batteries are charging. A battery-powered electric motor located in the undercarriage allows the aircraft to complete its autonomous pushback phase when it moves away from the terminal. The aircraft continues to operate under battery power while taxiing to the runway. Using the electric motor in the undercarriage means the engines are not switched on, so no fuel is consumed. The engines are now running. The aircraft is ready for takeoff. Getting an aircraft off the ground requires a lot of power. Its engines have to operate at full throttle. Electrical energy is used to generate thrust, reducing fuel consumption at this stage of the flight as throughout the mission. Once the aircraft reaches cruise speed, the batteries are deployed to temporarily relieve the engines and power certain functions of the aircraft. And that's not all. Energy from the engines can also be used to recharge the batteries. During its descent, the aircraft may enter phases that require engine thrust. As with takeoff, electric power takes the strain off the engines. Then, once on the tarmac, the aircraft taxis to the terminal and the electric motor in the undercarriage takes over from the turbofans again. It's the end of our flight. One where electricity helps us to better manage energy use and achieve a reduction in fuel consumption of up to 5% compared to a standard flight. Very clear, fantastic. Let's pick up the conversation with Frank. Tell us a bit more about how you work with engine manufacturers. Oh yeah, so the engine manufacturers are absolutely vital for us to actually make progress on this journey and uh, we will see that we have uh, activities ongoing with all the major engine manufacturers and, and suppliers in the aerospace business. So to give you an idea, so we just uh, um, announced yesterday the, the program switch uh, where we're working with NPU, Aero Engines, uh, Pratt & Whitney, GKN Aerospace, and Collins on, a, on an engine concept, uh, which is a water ingestion and electrical hybrid-assisted GTF. So the interesting bit on that program is uh, that we're not only looking at optimizing the off-design of the GTF uh, with the electrical hybrid, but we're also looking at a cycle optimization. 
uh, of the engine by collecting the water vapor from the combustion process, condensing it, and then <coughs> compressing it back in order to actually feed it into the combustion chamber. That is a big cycle advantage, and overall, the project is aiming for a 25% change in fuel efficiency uh, for, the, uh, for this engine. We have a second uh, program um, together with uh, Rolls-Royce, mm -hmm. and uh, that's led by Rolls-Royce, that's the uh, program HART. So that's uh, hybrid electric uh, aircraft technology for regional aircraft. That is a, a huge uh, po uh, portfolio of uh, uh, sort of partners from the European countries uh, and the United Kingdom. And um, here we're looking at technology bricks, uh, which ha will help us to uh, develop the key elements for a regional uh, sort of air aircraft. And last but not least, we had uh, a while ago already announced that we're working with CFM uh, on the open fan concept, and we will have a demonstrator on this with the A380. That open fan concept will also have hybrid electric elements in it in order to also harvest and also get energy transferred from the HP spool to the LP spool and vice versa. All of those things are, again, in the electrical hybrid world, it's off-design optimization, and in the other areas, we're tackling either cycle efficiency with the water ingestion or propulsive efficiency with the open fan. With this, we are tackling technology overall for the, um, for the decarbonization journey, and then sustainable aviation fuel or hydrogen. Thank you, Frank. Very clear. You mentioned three projects that benefit from EU funding. Um, Sabina, as, as co-chairman of Clean Aviation, how is that program supporting us and what is its goal? Yeah, thank you for the question. So indeed, if investing into the research and development to develop the disruptive technology is essential if you want to meet the Green Deal objectives. So. The European Clean Aviation Program is key because it's really helping the aviation ecosystem to align with these objectives, enabling, therefore, as well, future generations to enjoy flying without worrying and really going forward. So as a co-chair person from the industry, I'm, I'm really proud to be able to, to also help pushing the right program out. So Airbus, with our partners, and we've seen uh, three examples here, are carrying out research and engineering work in hybrid electric <coughs> propulsion with the goal to accelerate the transition into sustainable aviation uh, from 2035 onwards. So this is, and, and we all know that the challenge is that big that we need programs like the Clean Aviation Program, but also in combination with national programs in order to be able to, to face the challenge. And this is Clean Aviation here is really the biggest step change program which will help uh, aviation to yeah, really reduce the climate impact by 2050. In the first phase of Clean Aviation, we are talking about 20 projects which have been decided, which are in the negotiation of the final uh, uh, contracts at the moment. And it's all built around three pillars. Three pillars, which are, the first one is hydrogen-powered aircraft technologies as a basis pillar. And then two application pillars, hybrid electric regional aircraft, so that's the smaller type of aircraft, where we're driving research and innovation into hybrid electrical power architectures and the, as well the project that we've just heard about. Um, then their integration, maturing the technologies towards demonstration of the configuration itself of an aircraft, but also onboard energy concepts, the whole flight control and, and management of the energy. And then the third, third pillar, which is the ultra-efficient short and medium reach, uh, range aircraft. So there we're coming to the little bit bigger aircraft. <clears throat> but here we are um, actually is addressing the needs of this yeah, short and medium range aircraft with innovative aircraft architectures as well, making then use of very highly integrated ultra-efficient thermal propulsion, as we have just heard from, from Frank and as well providing yeah, really disruptive improvements in, in fuel efficiency. So if the European aeronautics community is really committed, and that's what they are, 
we are acting now to work towards climate neutral aviation, building the crucial industrial leadership together with the research um, areas in order to really go well beyond the capability and investment that we can alone bring together. So this is why it's so important to have this private-public partnership in order to bring our common goal forward. Thank you. Thank you. And so staying on the European theme, um, I have a question for Jane. Um, how is the European Commission working with industry to deliver on the European Green Deal's goals? Thank you. Uh, yes, um, first of all, I want to say I'm happy to see that uh, the industry is really committed towards uh, this change and towards uh, the political EU goal of achieving uh, climate neutrality by 2050. Uh, and also, it's important to look into disruptive technologies like uh, what you already explained and mentioned, hydrogen, hybrid electric. Um, concerning the, the framework, uh, as Sabine explained, we have clean aviation where um, we invest 1.7 uh, euros EU public money and the private sector uh, much more. So I think it's really uh, something serious where we are really uh, also from the EU public side uh, uh, committed. Um, another important element is a regulatory framework, and it was mentioned this morning, uh, especially in the SAF panel. I mean, as you know, we have a new legislative package uh, called FIT for 55, well, uh, where we have some legislation also which can help to reinforce this legislative framework. Uh, the revision of the EU ETS, also applying to the aviation sector, where you will have more incentives to use uh, decarbonized uh, energy technologies. Uh, the refuel EU uh, legislation, which also is about targets for uh, sustainable aviation fuel, and this morning uh, it was mentioned, so I think Guillaume Fourie said he wants 10% for 2030. The industry also, well, we have right now uh, uh, 5 to 6%, it's still in negotiation for 2030, but it's already something, and it should go up to 63% for 2050, so it's also an incentive, a real uh, legislative framework. And the last element I want to mention is the alternative <coughs> fuel infrastructure regulation, which is important, especially to supply these new fuels like hydrogen, electricity <coughs> at the airport, and we had a lot of examples uh, in the previous session uh, with hydrogen. Uh, a last uh, instrument I want to mention, which is also important, it's called the Innovation Fund. Um, it was created, well, we started giving or, uh, the money uh, three years, two years ago, it's a, it, we take uh, EU ETS allowances from the market, we sell them, and with this money, we want to help the industry to invest into new technologies. Uh, and it's also open for the aviation <coughs> industry. Uh, the next call uh, has already started, or starts in a few weeks, I'm, I'm not sure, but it's about 3 billion euros, so it's not uh, small money <laughs> for one call. Uh, and we have now created a special windows on pilots uh, also to be able to have uh, the aviation, or I'm also dealing with the maritime, that kind of industries to, to, to apply. Uh, and finally, as uh, was mentioned, I mean, it's about having all the stakeholders working together. It's not only about Airbus, the guys producing the planes, it's also the airlines, it's also the airports, it's, uh, it's all this uh, ecosystem working together. Uh, and for this, at EU level, we created what we call the Alliance on Zero Emission uh, Aviation, where Airbus is also participating. Uh, the General Assembly took place on the 14th of November uh, in Brussels, and it's now ongoing with working groups, so I think it's also a very important instrument to, to make sure everybody works together. And the last comment from my side also about these disruptive technologies, what will be needed is a huge production of decarbonized electricity, be it uh, for electricity, well, electric, hybrid electric directly, or hydrogen, to produce hydrogen. Uh, and I think it's very important uh, to consider um, putting all this in place, uh, and of course it's not only wind, solar, it's also about nuclear, because in the EU we need this, we don't have so much space, uh, and it's also very important not to go from one dependency to another one, uh, in terms of all this change we, we have uh, in our system to, to be climate neutral by 2050. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. So there's a clear need for deep systemic change. And um, aviation is not the only sector looking for disruptive technologies. What do you think we can learn from other transport sectors, Jane? Yes, from other transport sectors and also other initiatives I think we have uh, at, uh, at EU level. Uh, for, for instance, uh, well, we talk a lot of, 
about hydrogen uh, <laughs> this morning and now. Uh, we have this clean uh, hydrogen uh, partnership. It's the same principle as clean aviation, but to, on hydrogen, to produce, distribute, and use hydrogen. Uh, and here we manage already to have some topics, so some which are linked to the, the aviation sector, like uh, cryogenic storage system, for especially for, for, for aircraft, or uh, fuel cell for aviation. So I think it's quite important also to, to coordinate uh, these different programs. And electrification in there? Yes, electrification. Uh, we also have a, a partnership uh, for, for batteries, uh, where, of course, the main uh, player is the uh, automotive industry. But uh, we also look into uh, uh, topics which are also very relevant for, for aviation sector, like energy density, voltage of the batteries, uh, life cycle, uh, also the supply of the critical raw material we need. And here we mentioned we will launch um, an initiative called Critical Raw Material Act at EU level, where we also uh, expect uh, input from, from all the industry. Uh, so it's very, very important. And especially in this partnership, uh, Battery for EU, we invest uh, in um, advanced high performance, high voltage batteries, which are very relevant uh, for, for, for the, um, the aviation industry and, of course, the automotive uh, industry. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm noticing um, some similarities in the energy roadmap um, with what's happening in the automotive industry. Um, so maybe Patrick and Karim, can you explain those synergies to us? So indeed, uh, Jennifer, there are synergies, and I can see there that you are driving a hybrid car because you noticed it, so that's <laughs> perfect. I hope it's a Renault one, I don't know. But yes, there are synergies, of course, and, and this is the beauty of electrification because we see the trends moving in the same direction, be it on the energy storage, but also the electrical motors, the energy management, all those topics that are key to make electrification something that is beneficial. And I guess, uh, Patrick, you would agree with that. Yes, uh, yes, Kaim, you're absolutely right. So um, let me give you some examples of uh, common topics about that. So. First of all, when it comes to electrification, for sure, energy storage is probably the toughest challenge that we have to face. Um, <coughs> we can say that the very limited driving range of electric vehicles um, has been the main roadblocks for their development for about 100 years. And the reason is very simple. If you consider one kilogram of battery or one liter of battery, the amount of energy <coughs> that you can store inside is much less than what you can store as energy in one liter or one kilogram of gasoline. So, of course, lithium-ion technology has closed the gap a little bit uh, and as much as possible, and we have constantly improved the technology of lithium-ion batteries, and uh, we have improved the energy density of these batteries, for sure. So, if uh, battery storage capacity uh, had been a, a showstopper for electric vehicles development for 100 years, uh, it finally became possible uh, for us to market, to market uh, sorry, our first electric vehicle, <coughs> uh, let us say 10 years ago, in 2010, uh, 2012. And uh, it, it was really thanks to the lithium ion uh, battery technology. Of course, at this moment, these vehicles had a limited driving range but however, it was okay for many of our customers. And today, uh, 10 years later, we have been able to more than double the energy density of the batteries compared with what we could do 10 years ago. And uh, this progress has been uh, made uh, thanks to impressive um, improvements, I would say, uh, in all the fields of the battery. So not only electrochemistry, of course electrochemistry, but also <coughs> the pack, battery pack design itself. And however, despite all of this progress, uh, keep in mind that today, uh, in one liter of battery, uh, you can store, let us say, five times to seven times less energy compared with gasoline. Yet. So, uh, of course, um, the, the, the situation is not ideal, and uh, when it comes to the weight, uh, the situation, the comparison between gasoline and battery is even worse. 
So uh, we can say that there is room for improvement for uh, lithium ion uh, batteries. There is, room, there is room for improvement, but also for disruptive technologies. But I'm absolutely sure that all these parameters, I mean <coughs> driving range, maybe I should say flying range <laughs> here, uh, and the weight uh, for sure are even more critical for a plane compared with, uh, with a car. But this is typically a domain where synergies between aeronautics and automotive industry are probably plain to see. I fully agree, Patrick, and, and, and indeed the uh, flying range and weight are, are really important for us. Uh, and as you know, we, we, like in a, a hybrid car, we cannot recover the energy when braking, and therefore it's important for us to, to ensure that the, the benefits that we can get from electrification are not killed by the, the overweight of the different uh, uh, technologies or technobricks. And, and this is key for us. This is why it's important for us uh, to, to rely on the energy management approach. And, and I can give you a very simple uh, example, Patrick. I, let's imagine that we have in front of us today one kilo of uh, nowadays battery, which will hopefully, under your control, uh, Patrick, uh, deliver uh, 200 watt hour, okay? which is the energy that needs an EV car to, to run a few kilometers, I guess. If you, take, if you take this energy, one kilo of battery, and you put it into Frank's A320 <laughs> aircraft, what will happen is that the energy that the aircraft will need to carry this one kilo of battery over 1,000 kilometers is equal to the content of the battery. <laughs> it's simple maths, and therefore when you realize that, you just say to yourself, if, if we need to do something to make it beneficial. And the idea to make it beneficial is really to think a little bit differently the way we can use electrification and the way we will design uh, the, the, the electrical architecture. And the hint is just to say, instead of designing the system in such a way that it has to provide a propulsive effect, let's think of it completely differently. We have non-propulsive needs inside our aircraft, we size the systems to fulfill those needs, and then after we will frugally and opportunistically use this energy and power to relieve the thermal en engine in some key operation. And this is the video that you have uh, seen uh, before. This is the way today, together with the improvement of the technology, especially in terms of energy density of the next generation of battery, this is how we will make it beneficial. But again, the, 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 when we talk about energy management, you, you may think that it's a little bit uh, a rabbit out of the hat uh, topic or uh, even rocket science, but energy management is exactly what you, we are doing on a daily basis, or at least what our kids are doing today. When they, you know, imagine you have your mobile and it's running out of battery, you have two solutions, whether you continue like that and you will carry the weight of your mobile in your pocket, <laughs> or you switch off the mobile and you use it opportunistically, sorry, depending on the situation, sending messages of whatever. Energy management within a car, I guess, and within an aircraft is exactly the same approach. And we are talking here of a sort of jewelry approach. It's not an easy game. It's refining the design in such a way that we, 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 are, we are having a sort of frugal design. And this is how we need to make it uh, uh, beneficial, and so far, uh, this is why today our position is that we can have up to 5% of, uh, of uh, fuel uh, efficiency with this approach. So this is very important, and, the, the, and importantly, th there is, you know, we talk about the energy storage, we talked about the architecture, okay? So let's think of the architecture as roots you know, that will carry the electron from the batteries towards the different function that we want to electrify. We need now to ensure that those routes, or at least the way the electrons will move, that this will be done in a very efficient way. And this is what we call the voltage, nothing more than that. The voltage is how efficient the electrons will move into the cables. And you know, and if you think of it completely differently, it's like water in a pipe, you know, if you increase the pressure, of course, the water will flow much more efficiently. But it's not an easy game. If you increase too much the pressure, and you can see it, you don't know, when you're, you're using water in your garden, 
you can create leakage because you destroy the, the tube. And what we call <coughs> leakage of electron in an architecture is what we call the arcing effect. And this is something that can be very destructive. Therefore, there's a need to increase the voltage, but we need to do it in a very pragmatic way. And we've been with Ifanix, and I think Glenn mentioned that previously in the, the previous plateau. We, we explore up to 3,000 volts uh, uh, network in an aircraft. It's too much, of course, we know it, but we learn a lot on that. And today our position is to say we need to, to stick below 1,000 volts and even to stick around 800 volts. And this is where also, Patrick, we are, I think, having some strong synergies. Yes, clearly and clearly, uh, Karim. So as you uh, explained very well, in fact, the voltage is a way of increasing the power. So basically, the power can be seen as a product of the current by the voltage. So if the power has to be drastically uh, increased, either for driving uh, power, for example, or for quick charging uh, power, it may be necessary to increase the voltage if you want to keep the current in a reasonable limit. So that's the point. So of course, voltage alone uh, is not enough to increase the power because you have also to check both the battery chemistry, I mean, the, the battery has to accept such a high power, and you have also to ensure that the charging station will deliver the power you need. So voltage is not enough by itself, but it, it can really be considered as um, a mandatory uh, enabler, especially for high-range batteries or for big batteries. So in the automotive industry today, 400 volts uh, DC is a standard, but 800 volts is an option, and we are more and more studying this kind of, um, of uh, voltage increase, I would say. So, but more generally speaking, um, behind the voltage itself, I think that what is very important is the optimization of the electrical network and the optimization of the energy management. So, the way energy is managed is really very, very important for the automotive industry, and it is also for the aeronautics industry. Uh, and I can say that in this domain, Renault has more than uh, 10 years of mass production experience, and also 10 years of experience, including a unique field experience, because we started to sell our electric cars 10 years ago as a mass production car and not only as a niche car as we did previously. So, and, and this feedback, of course, is very valuable, for sure. Yes, thank you, Patrick. And I would like also to, to add on the, the energy storage uh, topic, because I didn't mention it previously, that our needs for uh, 2030 or 2035 horizon is to double the energy density that we have today in the current batteries. So it's, it's an important topic, an important challenge. But again, it's not rocket science. We know that there are technologies existing today at low readiness level. Uh, we need to work on, the, to, to create the momentum on those technologies to be eligible at the, the entry to service we are expecting. So, so I guess battery technology is going to continue to evolve and develop over the years. So how do you see that evolution in the coming years and decades, Patrick? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, first of all, first of all, it, it's very important to be fully aware of the challenges that we have uh, to face when developing batteries. Um, roughly speaking, of course, uh, you must check, first of all, energy density. We already discussed this because energy density is absol absolutely key in the performance of, of your battery. But it's not enough. You have also to check the durability of the battery. You have to check also the capability to deliver the power, the capability to accept uh, the power for fast charging. You have also to check the industrial feasibility of the technology, because you may have some technologies which will be almost impossible to produce as mass production. So it will be okay for a lab experience, but not for mass production. So the, the industrial feasibility from a process point of view is also uh, something very important. And above all, you have also to check the safety. And I say above all because we never compromise at Renault with the safety. So whenever we uh, choose a technology, safety is the first criterion. 
So in addition to these technical, purely technical criteria, of course, uh, the cost is also a major concern. Uh, just for your information, battery cost can represent today about one third of the total cost of an electric car. So it's a huge uh, portion and of course we have to, to, to take care about the cost for sure. And um, I mentioned we have to, to, to check many, many criteria and unfortunately most of these objectives, so durability, energy density, cost and so on and so on, most of these objectives are not fully compatible with each other. What does it mean? It means that we have to make a technical choice uh, to find the best trade-off. And uh, this is our job, of course. So we have to make the best trade-off, except uh, for safety, which can never be compromised, as uh, I explained uh, previously. So let me sum up. Battery is an area where many different technologies uh, exist and where trade-offs have to be made where economic stakes are huge. So what does it mean? It means that all over the planet, you have many labs, startups, uh, suppliers, car manufacturers who are leading research efforts in order either to improve the lithium ion uh, technology or, or to disrupt battery technologies because the stakes are so huge that you have many, many people uh, who are working on this topic today all over the planet. So, of course, lithium-ion batteries uh, are the most well-known uh, battery uh, type today. But, however, behind this word, um, lithium-ion battery, behind it, many different competing technologies are in competition to incrementally improve the performance. So, today we can say that in the field of lithium uh, lithium-ion battery um, progress is not as impressive as, as it, it was 10 years ago, for sure. Uh, and there, but there is still much room for improvement. And when it, when it comes to more radical uh, disruptive technologies, all solid-state battery is a kind of grail we are all looking for, for sure. So basically, the principle is very simple. The principle is to replace the liquid electrolyte which is inside each cell of a battery uh, with a, a ceramic electrolyte, for example. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, most of the time we use also a lithium metal anode instead of the graphite anode as of today. Mm. And as a result, we can double or more than double the energy density of a solid state based battery compared with the best lithium-ion uh, batteries of today. So there is a great uh, benefit from an energy density point of view and many other uh, benefits also about the maximum temperature, the safety, intrinsic safety, and so on and so on. So today, here again, labs, startups, uh, tier ones and so on are working on this topic and they are able to produce small coin uh, cells or small pouch cells at at the lab scale, and what is very difficult today is to scale up in order to go to mass production. And uh, this scaling up is really a concern uh, as of today, and, and there is probably a long way before we can go to, to mass production. So, frankly speaking, we believe that, we, we, we know that it will happen, but we believe it will not happen before 2030, I mean at really mass production scale. <coughs> And um, for, I'm, I'm absolutely sure that this is also a big stake for, uh, for Airbus uh, carrying this kind of technology. Fully agree, uh, Patrick. The, this is what we are aiming uh, to, to reach by 2030. And I think we share the same vision. And it's not uh, an internet review vision. It's uh, based on uh, our Airbus Defense and Space uh, cham battery chamber of reference. We have there a team dedicated to battery topics testing cells, prototyping uh, uh, batteries, and, and we know uh, today that those technologies on which we will rely by 2030 won't be fully industrialized before that date, and this is why we need to push the market towards that. It's not an easy game, but the future is there, and we as Airbus, if we step into more electrification of our next generation of aircraft that will be exploited for 20 years, 
we need to be ready with those kinds of technology at the starting point. This is very important for us. So just to be a bit more down to earth, um, we're also going Sorry, to need Jennifer. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> we're also going to need to explore <laughs> ground infrastructures for recharging. We need to think about how we how we um, how we recycle and reuse batteries as well. So is that something that we can also maybe learn from the automotive industry? Patrick? Yes, yes, of course. So um, I'd like also to, to emphasize on um, on recycling and the, on the complete uh, life cycle of the of the battery, you know, um, because fr from from the day we decided to go for mass production at Renault, uh, we also decided to study recycling. So of course, ten years ago, we had no battery to recycle. You can imagine, but we knew it would happen, and we knew it would be highly strategic also from an economic point of view, from an environment point of view, also from a regulatory point of view. And uh, for example, today European regulations <coughs> on this topic are challenging uh, when it comes to recycling and also recycled uh, materials. And based on this uh, more than 10 years valuable experience, two years ago, uh, Renault uh, decided to, to launch a cutting edge initiative. In fact, we began transforming uh, one of our oldest production sites, Flan, near Paris, uh, to ready it for circular economy. So it was an, an incredible decision, I can tell you, <laughs> but it's, it's uh, really, really uh, necessary and it, it was, uh, it was uh, also a quite impressive uh, transformation of the, of the company uh, towards circular economy. And recently, we even decided to go further, and we decided to create a new business unit, uh, which is called uh, The Future is Neutral, fully dedicated to circular economy. <coughs> also, I'd like to add that between the first life of the battery and recycling of the battery, uh, there is room also for what we call second life of the battery. So what does it mean? It, mean that it means that the battery uh, can be taken out of the car and used in stationary applications, for example. This is a second life uh, business that we are developing also. And in addition to that, of course, when it comes to infrastructure, charging infrastructure remains also a key challenge uh, in the switch from gasoline to uh, electric cars. It's a challenge not only for us as car manufacturers, of course, it's also a challenge for public and private stakeholders, for sure. And uh, the development of infrastructure is ongoing, <coughs> is ongoing, but there is still a long way to go uh, before we reach uh, the, the target in terms of, uh, of infrastructure. Thank you, that's very concrete. So all these improvements have one common goal, to reduce the environmental impact of our products. So do we have some figures to illustrate the progress we're making there? Uh, yes, of course, Jennifer, and I think uh, Nicola Chrétien mentioned our, our scope three challenge this morning, and this is very important, and for us, it's, it's a driver. It's a driver for uh, all Airbus group. So I already mentioned that with those approach, we will be able, in terms of electrification and hybridization, to reduce our fuel consumption up to 5%. For helicopters, it could be even better, but I will let the next plateau explain all, all, all those numbers and figures. And in terms of uh, life cycle, it's not uh, nice to have. It's a must that we want to handle uh, uh, at the beginning of those, uh, those exploration. And, and again, for us, the idea is not to reinvent the wheel. We will first try to see what are the synergies and benefits that we could get from much more mature market, like the automotive one, as mentioned by Patrick. And uh, our aircrafts are already uh, recyclable at 92%, and for the engine, I think it's between 90 and 95, something like yeah. that, Frank. Yeah, okay. So uh, we will continue in the same trend <coughs> because you know we cannot afford doing differently. So that's, uh, that's the key message here. How's the automotive industry doing on that? Well, about uh, life cycle uh, assessment, um, of course, recycling is an important uh, phase, as I already explained. But I would like also to, to stress out that electrification is an effective way uh, of drastically limiting emissions of both pollutant particles and CO2 if you consider the global life of the car. So 
let us focus on CO2. Um, an easy way to illustrate the benefit of electrification is, for example, to consider a middle-sized car, like a Megan, for example, and uh, then to compare the two versions, the gasoline version and the electri electric version. If you want to make this comparison, you have uh, to consider a comprehensive analysis from cradle to grave. Um, of course, um, this is not an easy uh, study because from cradle to grave, it means that uh, you have to know exactly all the steps of the, uh, from the mining to the, the process and recycling of the car, battery, and so on and so on. So to proceed, uh, Renault has created a team, a dedicated team of life cycle assessment experts uh, years ago, and these experts uh, work closely with the global value chain. So they work with tier one suppliers of Renault, but also with tier N until the mine. And as a result, uh, we can also we, we can um, check uh, <coughs> the reality of the benefit of electrification today. So as a result, uh, the electric Megan's carbon footprint today is about one third lower than uh, the, the, the carbon footprint of a gasoline version of the Megane if, if you consider uh, the European electricity mix, because the way you produce electricity, of course, uh, has a, a big influence on the result. So if you consider the global European uh, <coughs> power plant uh, as an average uh, CO2 emission due to electricity uh, production, the benefit of electrification is about one third. But if you consider the French electricity mix, for example, the benefit is two thirds. So in both cases, it shows you that there is absolutely no doubt about the benefits of uh, electrification, especially in the case of small or medium sized batteries. And, and to come to this conclusion, we have made a lot of very, uh, very precise studies with experts who are fully dedicated once again uh, to this topic. Thank you very much, Patrick and Kareem. Thank you. I Thank think you, we have Jennifer. firmly established that there are um, many challenges that are similar to the automotive industry and to the aviation industry. Jennifer, I hope we will get an A grade after this. You will. You will. I will. I okay. will make sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yes. Yeah, so yeah. So there are a number of, of synergies and opportunities. And so now I'm handing over to Sabine and Jean-François. I believe that you have an announcement to share with us today. Yeah. Indeed, Jennifer, you've seen once engineers <laughs> the start the enthusiasm. to talk together, My goodness. <laughs> <laughs> they get excited and so many <laughs> questions go into the same direction. So it's been for a couple of months that our engineers have been together. And yes, after all these good exchanges, we've finally concluded that there was no other way than going forward and doing something more. And this is why, together here with Jean-Francois, Patrick, and Karim, we are, we are really proud to announce that we have signed a cooperation agreement just a couple of, month, uh, of, of weeks ago, which is concerning the research and development projects on the electrification of Airbus and Renault, both groups, in the respective products, and in particular, the storage and the management for electrical energy. So you've seen it's all about the next generation of batteries, but then as well about the overall architecture, the energy management, and then not to forget circularity and everything which is going along with it. So this partnership will enable both companies to deepen the electrification roadmaps, enhancing, building on the synergies and transfer facilities that we can have across the sectors. And I think this is really an example for cross-sectorial playing together. And it will, of course, help Airbus to mature our technologies that we want to associate to future hybrid electric flying, uh, which we have detailed in the summit so far. So Jean-Francois, I leave the floor to you to give us a bit more of the details. Yeah, thank you very much. <coughs> so uh, first of all, I just want to uh, mention that this uh, partnership that you are mentioning is absolutely a great opportunity. and. Uh, outmost uh, a great honor for, for Renault to be part of it. Uh, and indeed, over the past uh, <coughs> few months, uh, I guess it's, uh, it has been for about uh, the past six months, more or less, 
uh, both teams uh, have been discussing together. And uh, we have been uh, absolutely astonished by the, uh, the quality and the expertise and the competencies of, uh, of, of you, ga you guys, I mean, uh, at, uh, in the aerospace industry. And so, yes, we've said, yes, we have to learn from those guys. Uh, so its skills are remarkable. Um, so let, let's uh, maybe reset a, a few figures for the audience in the room here, just illustrating why um, it is so important for us, uh, why electrification is so important for us. So first of all, as, as uh, mentioned by Patrick earlier, uh, Renault is a long-lasting uh, pioneer uh, into uh, automotive electrification. And uh, we did first launch uh, electrical car about 10 years ago in mass production with the Zoe, and um, it came along with the uh, uh, e-tech hybrid technology, which uh, resonated with uh, uh, what Karim wanted to do um, in, in, in the aircraft. Uh, last year, so we, talking about mass production, we have produced about 82,000 uh, vehicles in France, electrical vehicles, 100% um, of them produced in France. Um, in three years, by uh, 2025, uh, we will produce half a million uh, electrical cars uh, per year in France. And uh, we will do that owing to the uh, entire ecosystem that we have uh, at Renault, uh, and especially due to the uh, Electrocity uh, Industrial Center, which is set uh, in north of France, next to Douai. So it's a big, big uh, industrial <laughs> center that we have there. Uh, 2020, uh, 2030, sorry, uh, if we move forward, uh, we will have 100% of uh, Renault vehicles in Europe uh, being electric. Uh, so uh, we will beat, in fact, the, uh, the uh, uh, European Commission objective uh, that set electrification uh, in 2035. We will beat this objective by five years. Um, so, as you can see, uh, electrification is absolutely, absolutely a strategic topic for, for Renault. But uh, as mentioned, it's also a very, very uh, challenging uh, journey. Uh, to begin with, in terms of cost, uh, as reminded by uh, Patrick, um, due to the uh, electrification of the car, about one third, one third of the cost of the car has shifted into the battery. So it's a big chunk of money there. Um, and it's, it's, yes, you can guess it's a massive, massive modification that we have there. So one of the first challenge, of course, as a, a car manufacturer is to maintain the control of the cost and especially of the, the cost of the battery. And we do that through a vertical integration. Uh, nowadays, we, we do control about 10% of the uh, battery value chain, which is under our control. Um, and we control that either by uh, you know, a production of some, of some parts of the battery pack or uh, through assembly of, uh, of those parts. And we have as well some exclusive partnerships uh, to, to control more or less the, the cost. In fact, over the past uh, 18 months, uh, we have developed an integration strategy. And uh, we will be able to regain the, uh, the control of uh, about 50% of the, uh, the cost of the battery pack uh, by 2027, more or less. Concerning the, so we have the pack, the, the battery pack, we need, of course, the electrical engine, and we have developed similar, uh, a similar type of, uh, of strategy. Uh, and we will uh, control um, quite quickly about 70%, 70 percent, 70 percent of the value chain. And we will do that by uh, integrating a, a huge amount of activity, of course, about the uh, electrical motor itself. Uh, but as well uh, by integrating uh, capabilities for what concerns power electronics. To, to, to drive the, uh, the, the motor. And all that is being achieved with uh, two major suppliers that uh, are along with us, helping us uh, to, to, to bring up the competencies. So overall, uh, we do uh, consolidate our industrial leadership. Uh, we further develop the uh, muscles of the company uh, around electrification and, of course, the skills about uh, energy storage uh, and, and uh, electrical engines. Beyond cost, and this is not, this is not the uh, only challenge, um, we, we have also to control the cost, but as well, uh, we have to make sure that what we are producing is safe, uh, and as well that it is light. Uh, safe, uh, in fact, we have, as mentioned by Patrick, we have a very impressive track record, maybe a unique one, in, unique one sorry, in the uh, automotive industry. 
uh, over the past 10 years of uh, uh, mass production, we had zero, zero fire uh, with the battery pack uh, in, in the field. And, and we have uh, nowadays about half a million cars running every single day uh, in the field. So I, I would bet that this is of some interest for the aerospace industry. For what concerns weight, uh, bear in mind that in average, uh, electrical vehicles are 1.5 times heavier uh, than the gasoline version. Uh, more weight, it's a little bit like the same, same story as for uh, airplanes. So more weight requires more energy to move the car. So more cost because the energy comes from the battery and, and battery brings more weight as well. So, so it's uh, some kind of a vicious circle. So electrification, um, it's as well uh, becoming a concern in terms of weight, a little bit like just in uh, aerospace. So, so yes, many uh, challenging uh, challenges sorry, uh, for us in terms of electrification. And so the, uh, the cooperation agreement that we are announcing today with Airbus uh, is part of this overall electrification context. context and I'm convinced that the uh, discussions that uh, we will have between our two companies, uh, Sabine, will be extremely uh, valuable. So how will you address this partnership concretely? Well, uh, so we will... Uh, we will put in place uh, teamwork around uh, eight different domains that we have identified. Um, I'm not going to uh, go through all of them, and we are running out of time, I, be I believe. Um, <laughs> sorry? Yeah. We, are we, we are running out of time, so you have been too talkative. So <laughs> <laughs> so Maybe you'll only get a B. But I got an A grade. <laughs> uh, not yet. So, uh, yeah, a few, few domains. So the first one will be uh, around the cell-to-pack integration. So we'll share uh, existing design rules uh, in both companies, material use, type of connectors, and so on and so forth. A uh, second example I can give is the uh, battery management system, which is a critical um, part of the, uh, of the overall uh, powertrain. Um, and and uh, we will, uh, because of, of uh, driving efficiency, but as well uh, in terms of safety, it's, it's a critical part of the, uh, of the system. So we'll have uh, common teams around the architecture type of hardware solution being used. <coughs> I'm talking about safety. If I take this third example, we'll have as well uh, cross uh, teams around that, uh, sharing best practices, methodologies in this uh, very critical field. Last example I can give, it's life, as, life cycle assessment. Uh, we have a huge experience on that uh, topic with many years of uh, mass production. Uh, and I'm sure that we can share, uh, I mean, common uh, knowledge on, on that one as well. So Sabine, I, I guess it sounds good to you, uh, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you, Jean-François. <laughs> I, I think really that this partnership between Airbus and Renault Group will, will play an important role in bringing about a change in the transport uh, landscape, not only in the flying ones, but also in the automotive side of things, and, and really bringing the sector towards net zero by 2050. And the streams that you mentioned are, are really key for us. I mean, we are, we are having in Airbus a dedicated chamber of reference for batteries uh, for years already, and it's coming actually out, out of the space sector, where we are scouting, um, producing, testing representative uh, aerospace um, uh, yeah, batteries and, and little samples, and bring that into the scaling mode. These are things that we bring in as well into the partnership, but then it's also about life cycle assessment, which is, which <coughs> is one of the tools which is completely now integrated in our strategy, that we are, of course, not only looking to the product, but to the overall chain from cradle to grave of the product. We are doing that today in our range, and that will be even more important for all the technologies we want to bring in for the future. So here it's equally important for us to really pull together. So as it's all about the next technology advancements and, and the next steps in the, in the batteries, it's huge investments as well to create the sustainability energy supply and rolling out the support infrastructure. And, and I think this really requires the cross-industry partnerships. So our partnership in this way paved the way. And uh, I think really joining forces in, in all different directions make us more powerful, and that's what we are up to here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sabine. I, I do <coughs> absolutely totally agree. Um, and to 
conclude with, uh, I would just like to restate once again that we are absolutely excited and delighted to, uh, to be part of this uh, partnership with Airbus. For the first time, we have two uh, different industries, aerospace and automotive, leaders of those, those industries coming together and pooling knowledge and capabilities together to shape the future of, the, uh, of, of, of uh, transportation. Um, aviation is uh, extremely demanding, as we know, in terms of safety, weight, fuel efficiency, just like automotive. So we have a similar type of uh, technological challenges. Um, we, you, we are facing, sorry, a huge uh, carbon neutral, uh, uh, you know, challenges and, and, and milestone in front of us. So uh, the good news is that Airbus will uh, be able to rely on, uh, on more than 10 years of expertise uh, and experience from Renault Group uh, in electrification, battery management, uh, recycling, and so on and so forth. And for Renault, uh, we know that uh, at Airbus, you have absolutely passionate uh, engineers, technicians, highly skilled technicians, uh, that you have cutting edge uh, capabilities, uh, be it in terms of know-how, in terms of tools, in terms of um, validation means that you will use for the future Airbus uh, hybrid electric uh, aircraft. So getting access to all that, it's absolutely exciting. And uh, I'm absolutely delighted to, uh, to be part of this story uh, and journey, uh, Sabine. Thank you very much. So to make it short, we have a common ambition. We have a plan. We have engineers, the young, motivated engineers besides me <laughs> that very, are very fully young into it <laughs> <laughs> and want to make it happen. So let's go for it. Let's do it now. Let's go for it. On y va. <laughs> On y va. <laughs> Thank you very much. And congratulations. Congratulations, that's a great announcement. We've gone a bit over time, but we do have time for some questions from the room. So who wants to go first? Gentleman down here. And then we'll grab you there, over on the left-hand side. Thierry Dubois, Aviation Week. A question for Frank. Mm -hmm. uh, in the video explaining how the hybrid electric architecture works, I heard that uh, the hybrid electric system may, during the cruise phase, relieve temporarily, I think the wording was temporarily relieve the engine. Can you give us an example? Yeah, it's more in, in, in situations like a step climb in cruise, that you can actually sort of help the, the sort of uh, the, the, uh, the partials of acceleration you need to do in order to get <coughs> to the next altitude. It's not just in continuous operation in, in cruise. I believe there's a question over here. Yes, hello, um, Mary Kirby with Runway Girl Network. Um, can net zero 2050 be achieved with the combination of more efficient engines, hybridization, 100% SAF compliance, massive SAF production increases, carbon offsets, and more efficient air traffic management without hydrogen-powered aircraft? Can it be done without hydrogen? Who wants to take that one? Sabina? Okay, I'll take this one, I think. <laughs> So in our view, it's really about the mix. All the things you listed are completely necessary, but we do think that we also need to open the path for more growth afterwards. And, and this is only possible to really go net zero if we also go into new technologies. And, and here, the most powerful for us is hydrogen. Yeah. So we need it all. Yes. Thank you, Sabine. I have a question from an online viewer for you, Jean-Francois. Um, will your collaboration with Airbus replace the ongoing work you're doing with Nissan on solid state batteries? Okay, thank you for the question, which is a good one. So yes, Nissan is working as well uh, on, in, uh, on solid state battery uh, within the alliance that we have with Nissan, uh, investing very significant amount of money on, the, on that topic. Um, the uh, the sh sh short answer is no. I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it comes in complement with what Nissan is doing. Uh, as mentioned by Patrick, the, um, the uh, solution, the technological solution for uh, ASSB, so solid state batteries, uh, is not identified uh, yet, going towards mass production. And so we want to have, we don't want to put all the eggs in the same basket, <laughs> short, uh, short answer. And, and we believe that working with uh, uh, an industrial uh, leader such as Airbus will help to, uh, to, to find uh, other uh, ways and other uh, technical solutions that uh, will further develop the technology. Thank you. Another question from the room? Andreas? Um, <clears throat> We've heard briefly about aircraft recycle end of life. I think you said it's like 92% of aircraft that can be recycled with this uh, 
circle being in full motion. My question is also about what can be improved in aircraft recycling and also especially about batteries. We're talking about batteries in cars, batteries in aircraft. How about battery recycling? We as ordinary users know how difficult it is to bring batteries, small batteries, back to a special place to get them collected. So how is that going to be dealt with? Who wants to take that one? Maybe I start and then Patrick or Jean-François, you probably want to add on this. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, all our aircraft are going through kind of recycling at the end of the life. 92% are, are possible today. If you're looking into the battery recycling, this is one of the topics clearly that we will also look at during that partnership. And as Patrick has stated, that's one of the important things that we want to explore together and where I would hope that we can really take the experience of, of 10 years of much more intensive use in, in the automotive industry. Yes, um, <coughs> concerning battery recycling, you have to consider two different topics. The first one is uh, the amount of recycled material you will use to, uh, to manufacture your batteries. And the second point is, what is the percentage of the battery material that will be recycled at the end of life of the battery? And in both cases, material by material, I mean for the lithium, for the nickel, for the cobalt, and so on and so on, we have some targets for both recycled material and percentage of recycling. Uh, we have some targets wi which increase uh, constantly year after year. Uh, and this is the reason why we work uh, closely with some partners industrial partners in the field of recycling in order to increase this level uh, of recycled material and recycling percentage. So we are confident uh, because we know that there are technical solutions and this is not rocket science. It, it's feasible from an industrial point of view. And this is the reason why we are fully confident in this. And. Um, you know, th this is a stake, a, a big stake for environment, uh, for cost of the battery as well. So we have many reasons why uh, recycling has to be pushed, and it is uh, by the automotive industry, and of course by Renault, because we were pioneers in, in the electrification of cars. So it means that we will be the first ones uh, to collect some uh, old batteries in order to recycle these batteries. And this is also the reason why we were probably the first ones in Europe as a car manufacturer to start the studies about uh, how will this battery be recycled in the future. Uh, just uh, if I may add a very short uh, answer on that one. So uh, as all what we do in the in automotive industry, we are developing a, a totally uh, in, uh, a total industrial process around that very specific topic. So. Uh, so we are going into mass production for recycling, in fact. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, what is being done at FLAN uh, within the automotive industry is recognized as cutting edge uh, capability that we are developing there, extracting the, uh, the, the, the materials so through the, what we call the black mass and so on, uh, making sure that uh, we are able to, to, that, to do that in a very um, you know, ma mass production uh, type of approach. So all that is happening now. So it's, uh, so it's not uh, rocket science, uh, <laughs> something for, for the next uh, 20 years. No, it's happening now. So, it's, um, so we have the capability uh, within the automotive industry around that. And to, to, close, the, to close the loop, uh, I think this is probably much more clarifying what I mentioned when I said we, we won't reinvent the wheel. For sure, for us, uh, we need to stick to what is already ongoing with the right momentum to do it, because by 2030, the, the, the electric cars will be will be the standard and therefore the question around the recyclability of the battery will have to be fixed so far so this is ongoing and we are confident on that thank you tim hi uh, tim robinson uh, aerospace uh, talking of reinventing the wheel uh, electric taxing was in the your, your video uh, and about three years ago, you had a electric taxing partnership with Safran that was ready to go. Um, what's changed this time around? What, why did you get rid of it in the first place? Okay, this is a very good one. <laughs> <laughs> so I will start and I probably I will let uh, Frank uh, complete the answer. A and again, I will do it very simply because I was not part of the discussion and the work with Safran at that time. And, uh, and the, the answer... Uh, my personal answer to that is that um, 
when you have something that is fully optimized, okay, the, the answer of a fully optimized architecture to any turbulence is rejection. <coughs> okay? And therefore, adding something to an existing architecture was a little bit complicated, technically probably, and in terms of value creation too. Okay? The beauty of the approach that we're having today is that we are reconsidering all that. And I mentioned in a previous uh, interview that uh, it's no more around adding more sauce into the salad, but it's around creating the salad around the sauce. <laughs> Uh, and this is what is making it today eligible. Frank, I don't know if you want to do I add something. I don't know what to add. <laughs> <laughs> Other than pepper and salt, maybe. Um, not need to be careful. But the, the key there is, of course, there's always a balance to strike. If you do e-taxing and you sort of have the engine off and so on, you end up also giving the engines shorter warm-up time. So there's a balance of what you're going to do with the gas turbine, sort of limited parts, life, uh, critical parts, and so on. So all of these elements come into the consideration when we're looking at these, uh, these things today. Uh, that's one element. Uh, and again, so all of the uh, sort of uh, uh, things we mentioned today are technology bricks, and we're currently realistically at tier level two with them in that, uh, so in early days. So we're looking at the bricks and trying to see how can we bring them together and get an overall system which is uh, uh, better than what we're doing on single optimization. For instance, you also will have to open up and ask yourself, so how do you do the energy management overall on the aircraft? And not just look at the engine and engine to battery and so on backwards. Do you need an APU in that world? Uh, do you need um, a, a rot? All of these questions will actually have to be asked and answered in that process. Yes, I think uh, Karim's uh, point on was was a very good one. We, we, we added on to an existing architecture with all our attempts, and I think the, the research again in that phase was, was very good. Now, if you're creating a new architecture when it's a completely new balancing of the energy flows and the energy across the whole mission, then it's opening up a lot of other opportunities as well. Yeah, so it would be in this integrated architecture that we are using right. electrical energy for certain phases, and why not taxiing, rather than adding something on top of yeah, an, a sized engine, a sized overall energy system. Thank you, Sabine. I think we're going to wrap it up there. Thank you very much to our very enthusiastic panelists today. Thank you for that. Congratulations on the partnership agreement. And it's time for us to take a break here in Toulouse. So for our online audience, if you could connect back at 3.30 Central European time, and we will pick up for the last session of our summit today. Once again, thank you very much, and uh, enjoy the break. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Jennifer. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back from the break. Welcome back to the Airbus Summit 2022. We are now here at the last panel of the day one of our summit, Towards Clean Vertical Flight. We hear a lot from Airbus helicopters about their efforts to decarbonize their products, being it flying with SAF, where there is a goal of certifying the use of 100% sustainable aviation fuel by 2030, or last year Airbus helicopter just talked about the very first flight of the engine backup system, the premise of hybridization, as well as improving on the fuel burn efficiency of the current range, like with the H160. But is this really necessary? Because helicopters account for less than 1% of aviation CO2 footprint, and they perform essential, often life-saving missions. So is this really something that our customers are asking for? To discuss this, I'm very pleased to have here with us today two customers. First, the CEO of LCI, Jasper Jandu. Thank you. The general manager of Blackcom Helicopters, Tim Boyle. Thank you. And very happy to have on my left the CEO of Airbus Helicopters, Bruno Evan. Good afternoon. And the head of research and innovation at Airbus Helicopters, Tomasz Krzyzynski. Good, uh, good uh, uh, afternoon to everybody. So let's directly jump into the first panel and looking to our customers. Um, can you please tell us a little bit about your company and why decarbonization is so important to you? So maybe, Tim, you would like to go first. Uh, Blackwell Helicopters is a mid-size operator um, of light, intermediate, and medium helicopters in uh, the region of Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. We uh, operate for a very diverse group of customers. We, uh, the private sector as well as government agencies, we support um, the BC Forest Service and wildfire suppression. We worked for uh, BC Hydro, keeping the lights on uh, to the best of our ability and doing things like replacing uh, aging structures and uh, modernizing the infrastructure. We also do emergency work, a lot of search and rescue uh, work in the sea to sky. And uh, of course, we're a little bit unique in that we have a very active tourism market. Uh, being centered in Whistler, uh, British Columbia, the home of the 2010 Olympic Games. Uh, we have a vast number of products that we provide uh, in the tourism sector. And I th think really uh, that is a big part of what prompted us to become carbon neutral. So along with that type of work, we also work with the energy industry as far north as in Nuvik in the Northwest Territories doing a reclamation work uh, for the majors in the oil industry, as well as supporting customers like the Coast Guard. So uh, we are part of the McLean Group of companies, uh, which has been established in Vancouver in the early 1970s by David and Brenda McLean and their family. And uh, yeah, we uh, love what we do and we enjoy uh, the industry. And thank you for the invitation here today. We are very happy to have you here on board, and thank you for the short explanation. Jess, what's about LCI? Yes, thank you, Tim. Um, so LCI is an aviation leasing company, and uh, rather uniquely, we're invested in commercial fixed-wing aircraft, helicopters, and advanced air mobility sectors. So we have quite a broad view of uh, aviation generally. Um, just in terms of helicopters, we're one of the largest helicopter leasing companies in, in the world. And we tend to focus on young, efficient, new helicopters, such as the H-175, H-160 family. And they are deployed in a wide variety of missions around the world. And something I hope we can press on later on in this chat, which is um, we have, for example, helicopters serving uh, search and rescue missions in Spain. We have EMS helicopters in the UK and in Australia. We also actually have helicopters serving offshore wind farms in Germany, and that's something certainly to discuss. But even broader still, um, helicopters in humanitarian work, uh, fire surveillance, uh, fire suppression. So I agree completely with, with what you said there about helicopters provide a vital social tool. 
Um, we're part of the Libra Group. Uh, Libra Group is quite forward-looking and innovative itself and has investments in shipping, renewable energy, real estate, and, and aviation, of course. So I'm very uh, happy to join you and uh, look forward to this debate. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Jazz. Bruno, we have two customers here on stage, but looking at your entire customer range, is the topic also for others becoming more important, the topic of decarbonization and sustainability, or is it even becoming a buy-in factor? It's clearly a topic of interest, uh, but uh, frankly, I've been impressed how much it has changed in the past years. Uh, Jazz was mentioning uh, the type of uh, missions that the helicopter are delivering, critical mission, protecting life, uh, and, 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 and somehow, because these are critical mission, helicopters are contributing to a more sustainable world by definition. Mm. And also because at the end it's a small market, some could think uh, that the challenge to contribute to the CO2 reduction would not be a priority for the helicopter market. It's not the reality. It's first about uh, individuals, leadership. And I think Jazz team, uh, for your participation today, you just demonstrate this, uh, this, uh, this commitment. Uh, but also because most of our customers are also organizations. Uh, they have to also demonstrate that they are good citizens in terms of attractiveness uh, to the talents. Uh, to demonstrate to their shareholders, to their customers, because end customers, it's also about uh, corporation, organization, oil company, which have also an agenda in terms of uh, ESG, sustainability. So the reality, things are changing and changing uh, quick. I will just uh, take the example of uh, Shell communicating 18 months ago about the selection of the H-160, or uh, new helicopters to deliver mission in the Gulf of Mexico one of the criteria and one of the elements to justify this selection was the contribution of the H-160 uh, to the environment in terms of CO2 reduction. Uh, we have created a user group uh, to work on uh, uh, the SAF, the deployment of the system of aviation fuel, creating the condition of the ecosystem. And, and, and we see many customers participating to this uh, user group. So yes, clearly things uh, are changing, probably not at the point where today it's uh, what I could call a hard criteria mm. in, in the tender, but the trend is there and, and it will come. The commitment of all the industry is there. That's great to hear. Um, Tim, you're offsetting all your flights. Can you maybe explain to the audience how you measure the CO2 output of each helicopter in your fleet? What kind of mechanisms are you using? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, we, of course, are experts in operating helicopters, and in order to do the best job of deciding how, how much, and how to offset, uh, we work with a partner uh, out of Victoria, and uh, they apply a proven auditing system to our company, and they look at all aspects of operations from Number one, obviously, the consumption of kerosene is our number one contributor to our carbon footprint. But we also look at commercial flights that our crews take, um, repositioning, uh, transport, ground transport, and all aspects of our business from how we handle recycling to uh, electric, providing uh, charging for electric vehicles for our, our employees at our facilities and modernizing our own fleet towards electric as well. So with that process, we establish um, exactly, as, as close as possible, how many tons of carbon we're emitting. And uh, I can use the example of we just completed an audit here in the last few weeks, and our organization consumed 4,600 tons of CO2 equivalent, and we will offset 100% of that. And how we accomplish that, we work with the Nature Conservancy of Canada on a project in the West Kootenai Mountains, where a large area, it's referred to as the Dark Woods Conservancy. And it is um, setting aside this forest for the next 100 years minimum. This would have been logged. It is pristine forest that the logging industry was very interested in. Uh, the Nature Conservancy took the steps of protecting that and managing that. So for now, it's the first step. We all know offsetting isn't perfect, but it's what's available to us at this time. And of course, we're looking forward to the availability of sustainable aviation fuel as our next step. That's great. 
Um, Jazz, what about LCI? What are the different sustainability elements you're looking at when you are up to deciding for new helicopters? Um, it's a great question. Um, I'm sure many people know of the leasing model, but um, we have a broad range of criteria. I mean, I listened to uh, many of the presentations today, they were excellent, but we really have to distill what we learn here today and allocate billions of dollars of capital one way or the other. And uh, sounds easy, but it's quite a job. Um, because technology, particularly disruptive technology, can act as a power amplifier. Um, if you get it right, there are huge upsides, and if you're on the wrong side of it, then you've got issues. Um, but I find, I am finding, in my personal experience, uh, sustainability and efficiency becoming more and more important. Uh, as Bruno and Airbus will tell you, any increases in operating performance of assets is a good thing, uh, be it payload or range or whatever you're measuring. But we are also taking a longer-term view. We are trying to work out or trying to triangulate how attractive an asset may or may not be in 25 years' time. And so if you were to say, well, the entire sustainability arguments is, is currently at a certain volume and it's only going to get louder, well, it's very, very important to us. So for example, we uh, have just recently made an order with uh, Airbus helicopters for the H175 family, which is incredibly fuel efficient and can do missions that uh, older technology can't do, for example. Um, we are part of uh, Airbus Helicopters Sustainable Aviation Forum. Uh, which looks to provide feedback on how we're going to use SAF in uh, the technology products and what it means for a long-term residual value play. So I can only speak from experience by saying sustainability is becoming a very important factor in how we allocate capital in this sector. That's really great to hear, and it's fantastic that you are both here role modeling the industry, clearly sharing that decarbonization and sustainability is really a key factor for you. Um, Tim, do you feel the same from your customer base? Are customers coming to you and say, I book with Blackcom Helicopters because you're doing fantastic stuff? I think you have to divide that question into two areas, really industrial customers and then the general public. And first I would speak uh, to our relationship with Shell Energy. Uh, it's a relatively new uh, relationship. We've been providing services to Shell for about four years and we, uh, only fly the H-135 for Shell in Canada. And of course, one of their concerns uh, when we originally approached them to, to work with Shell was directly our sustainability um, efforts. It was very important to them that we were offsetting 100% our carbon emissions. And then we have the general public who take tourism flights uh, from Whistler and other bases and do everything from get married which has been very popular to get married on a mountain during uh, the pandemic when there were very few other options, to skiing and, and mountain biking and all the exciting things we do with our adventure tourism. We have been offering our clients the opportunity to be carbon positive and actually contribute more and really double the offsetting that uh, their flight would require. And we're counting the customers in the hundreds now that uh, are taking that initiative uh, on their own. So it's surprising to myself that in the first year of offering that, it was that popular. So uh, yes, I think that it's uh, very timely and, and very important to our customers. Great to hear, great to hear. Um, Jazz, um, as, as a leasing company, you were a facilitator. You work with investors, you work with operators. When you now talk to them, do they have different expectations when it comes to the sustainability topic? And if so, how you manage them? No, it's, it's a great question. Um, if you look at the entire value chain, both sort of upstream and downstream, let, let's just start at, at the very beginning. End users. Um, so whether we're providing a helicopter to, let's say, a local regional government, a national government, an oil company, whatever it may be, um, you're finding uh, ESG-related criteria quite high up the agenda now. Um, they certainly want to know how you're running your operations, what sort of equipment you're using, and this wasn't necessarily the case. And as you start to move down or towards closer, let's say, the product, um, OEMs, we've had a whole day uh, describing how Airbus are getting their head around the whole sustainability challenge. 
And now the lessors and the operators themselves are finding their shareholders, their investors and boards are pushing in a certain direction too. Right? If you want to access capital, for example, in today's world, well, there are table stakes. And you'll certainly need to prove your credentials in terms of scope one, two, and three emissions uh, as a starter. And that's where I say the biggest push is. If you look at the financing and investing, investment community, uh, rightly or wrongly, I mean, the, we are living under this ESG rubric. Uh, there's probably a better name for it that we could, that we could come up with. Um, you're now getting rated. Uh, there are rating agencies that will uh, assess you on certain criteria, and this was never the case. This is all brand new. Um, and it really is pushing us all in a very similar direction. So far from divergence, again, only in my personal experience, I've never seen a convergence around an idea like this one. And if you look at aviation, uh, let, let's take a longer term view, uh, 50, 100 years, um, we adapt to challenges. That's, that's what a, uh, an industry of engineers uh, does. So whether it's passenger safety or fuel burn per passenger on fixed wing aircraft, this is very important. So we have a challenge ahead of us. We want to provide all the missions that we just discussed, but now we want to do it sustainably. Mm. And I am sure we're going to do it because we're all working in convergence rather than divergence. So that they are my views. So what you just said at the end, obviously you're looking for future helicopters with lower CO2 emissions to be, again, a responsible company today, but also for your long-term business strategy. So you now have the unique chance to be at the Avis Summit. So the key question is, looking at the CEO of Avis Helicopters, what do you expect from Bruno and his team when it comes to future helicopters? Well, we're, we're very fond of the H-135. Uh, it has had an amazing impact on our business and allowed us to grow to service clients like Shell Energy. Uh, for us, the next step will be the big brother. You know, it'll be the H-145. I think the technology and the aircraft um, are meeting our requirements in the short term. Uh, the next big step for us is uh, the ability to have a locally available supply of SAF uh, that will make the uh, biggest, have the biggest impact on our uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, I know that great progress is being made there, but we look forward to being able to use SAF in our aircraft. And I'm also excited, uh, I know new technology that we haven't even envisioned yet is on the way. And uh, so I'll leave it to Airbus to uh, do the designing, but uh, very happy with the product as well as uh, the support on other areas like SAF. Mm. If you look at these, uh, my view, if you look at any real transportation sector, be it rail, shipping, aviation, helicopters, it doesn't really matter. Um, the OEM is generally at the hub uh, of that industry. They are incentivized to keep products moving. They're incentivized to keep financing alive. They're, looking upstream, downstream, they've got all the research. So the OEM provides a uniquely important role. And I sort of split it into two. One, at the product level, I mean, clearly Airbus and Airbus helicopters have made tremendous ad advancements, and may maybe we will hear about them in hybridization, and battery technology, aerodynamics, systems, propulsion. That's their job. So we need them to carry on doing their job. We will provide friendly input where we can of course, but um, there's a broader, possibly more important role, which is, um, rightly or wrongly, as you said, CO, uh, CO2 emissions from aviation is, let's say, 2.5%, and helicopters is a fraction of a fraction. Um, but it has a disproportionately large impact in the world. Um, if you listen to COP26 and 27 and some of these big fora, um, I mean, it's, it's way down the list when compared to sh shipping or um, concrete manufacture or agriculture or even, you know, fast fashion. I mean, the, many sectors have very high emissions, but there's a perception in some spaces on, on fixed wing in particular that it's discretionary mm -hmm. and no matter the fuel efficiency per seat, it's uh, growing in absolute terms because more passengers are using it. So rightly or wrongly, we, we do have this spotlight and that's where a manufacturer really earns their spurs. 
because we need to speak together, we need to be consistent, we need to be harmonious in what we say, and, and, and an OEM can do that. Um, because there's a wonderful story, and it's a human story. It's not about metrics or gigatons of CO2 behind aviation, which is just look at the COVID pandemic, uh, the lack of business opportunity and interaction, the lack of VFR visiting friends and relatives, the lack of healthcare provision around the world. And in helicopters in particular, um, the pro literally the provision of life-saving emergency services uh, when all of us were locked down at home, <clears throat> excuse me, it was helicopters and helicopter crews that put themselves in harm's way and moved patients around the world. Uh, it was search and rescue crews who were still out there providing the services they did. It was humanitarian work in Africa. It was the United Nations World Food Program. It was some of our helicopters which were being used on census and polling um, information from around African countries to bring them back so governance could be counted. So all I say is that an OEM is hugely incentivized at the product level, but also as an industry champion level to help us get our message out. Thank you very much again for sharing your customer view. Ladies and gentlemen, a question to you. How aware are you about the helicopter decarbonization roadmap? If you don't know, we have two experts with us. So, Bruno, Thomas, please give us now an overview of what's being done at Helicopters. Innovation is uh, clearly at the core of the strategy of Airbus Helicopter, and CO2 reduction environment is at the core of uh, our innovation, uh, innovation uh, roadmap. Uh, we clearly want to contribute to uh, the ambition of Airbus to be carbon neutral by 2050. So 2050 could uh, give uh, the message that we have time, reality, there is a lot of uh, transformations, there is a lot of challenges in terms of uh, innovation, and we have defined a, a clear roadmap with the objective to uh, mature the technology, demonstrate that we can deliver this level of ambition, uh, but not only in terms of uh, performance, but also in terms of uh, maturity, because what uh, our customers are telling us every day, and just, Tim, you confirm today, it's not only about innovation, it's about providing mature technology the day we enter into service. So this, uh, this roadmap is really based on uh, uh, clear uh, deliverable demonstrator to demonstrate that we can step-by-step uh, step deliver this uh, ambition. First level, working on what I could call, I know Thomas you not, does not like this, uh, this word, but on classical innovation. H160, we demonstrated that we are able to bring additional 15% uh, CO2 reduction with a, a new generation of helicopter, working on the efficiency of the helicopter, working on the efficiency of the turbine. Uh, we are convinced that we still can deliver for the next generation uh, a, a, a significant level of CO2 reduction, 25, 30% for the next generation. The second level is working uh, on the architecture, the architecture of the global helicopter, the architecture of the propulsion system, in particular, uh, bringing electrical uh, uh, power, uh, uh, power capability. First step, probably hybridization, uh, but final step, and it was, I think, uh, well illustrated last year when we unveiled the City Airbus Next Gen, we are convinced that uh, we can uh, bring to, uh, to the market uh, full electrical uh, uh, power, uh, power platform, uh, in particular for the urban air mobility, but also for uh, helicopter market. So that's the second levers working on the architecture. And the third one that we can start now is the deployment of the sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, uh, all, uh, today, our helicopters engine are already qualified for 50% blend. Uh, we have to demonstrate that we can reach 100%, and the demonstration that we did with the H225 uh, last year, uh, powered by 100% SAF, I think it's just, uh, just uh, 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 an example, uh, but it was also mentioned this uh, morning, the challenge is at the ecosystem level. Uh, let's do what we have to do, but uh, we'll have also to embark the global ecosystem. So clear on map to deliver this, uh, this ambition to be carbon neutral by 2050, but I think, Thomas, you can tell us more about uh, the detail of the different technological bricks that uh, we are working on. So the um, best energy on the helicopter is energy you don't need. 
So really, the essential is to reduce the energy you need for flight. And this is the first target. So Bruno was speaking about the H160. So our CEO is very proud of, the, of this aircraft because we strongly reduced the CO2. But I would like to explain you how it was done, OK? Because we discussed uh, here about the partnership with the Renault, for instance, just mobilization. But we have enormous partnership ecosystem also by the research center. So this nice blades you see on the H160, which uh, we call the Blue Edge, was invented and designed by Honor and DLR, which are the research center. And we just transformed the, your dream with all the steps, the levels, to the, make them flying, make them industrial. And these blades reduce strongly the energy need for flight, but also reduce the noise. Okay, in the distant flight, and this helicopter has half a noise of the previous version. So uh, just a small clarification, you know, how our system open to the external world. So uh, what is on the slide? I will tell you that now uh, the first target is really to reduce the, really uh, what Bunot calls incremental innovation, 10 to 15 percent working on dynamics, working on the materials, on integration. It is uh, 10 to 15 percent compared already on what we have on the market, what the reference, which is H160. The second step, okay, when we want to reduce by 15 to 25 percent, is working on powertrain, working on neurodynamic, uh, thermodynamic cycles, working on the integration, working with the engine manufacturers, and it should bring from 15 to 25 percent. And now we uh, enter into the marvelous world of hybridization. I think uh, the roadmap uh, presented before is really very, by Airbus, is very, very clear. And we are the, at Airbus helicopters front, front runners in hybridization. <clears throat> the first step is uh, we will test very soon on uh, Racer, which is our high speed formula. The, St stop, stop and start system, which is uh, we switch off one engine in flight and we make flying the aircraft just on the one engine at full power. And it really can, redu it can reduce the fuel burn by 15% uh, uh, because the turbine uh, consume much less on full power, the two turbines working on half power. And uh, the latest test is hybridization, so Karim Okane explains the roadmap, and we are very proud to be in the group because we take a lot of advantages to have this clear roadmap through all the divisions where we can ta very easily take the, all the techno bricks we need, okay? And, uh, well, uh, here, uh, this 10% will be obtained with parallel hybridization. So we tested already the serial one, but parallel is really magic because we can combine electric motor with the turbine, taking energy from the turbine, giving it into the battery through the motor in one flight conditions and doing it back in other flight conditions, roughly like automobile is doing. So, and this will give 10%, but story is not finished there. Also with the hybridization, we can also reduce the noise. And Tim was speaking during the break about the noise. The, our customer is very sensitive to it. And why we can reduce the noise? Because we can reduce the rotational speed. When Nikola Tesla invented the induction motor, he was always impressed by the speed of reaction of this motor. So it's completely much quicker than the turbine. And we can slow down the rotational speed of the rotor working close to the stall, and when it is needed, the electric motor can increase rotational speed. So this will give 10% fuel burn reduction, but it will also make pleasure to team because it will reduce the noise. And then, uh, It's very important. Yes, that's, we know, that's we know. And, and I think this, uh, all these techno bricks allow to reduce the energy needed to fly by 50%, and it opens the door to hydrogen, to other source energy of energy, and also to SAF. And in SAF also, we are a front runners because uh, on our production line in Marignan, we use already 30% of SAF. We do it with Total. And Donna Word is even better, 36% with British Petroleum. So, you know, uh, 
any transformation, we must always start by ourselves. It's the best example. Really impressive what you have just explained to us, many different aspects. Um, but a little bird has told me that this isn't really everything um, that you have been working on. Am I right, Bruno? Indeed, I think you are right, Alex. I'm really happy and excited to present to you today this uh, new demonstrator, which is at the core of our uh, roadmap. Actually, it's more than a demonstrator. It's a concept uh, helicopter that we call a disruptive, uh, disruptive lab. Uh, it will combine, and Thomas uh, will tell us more uh, just after, it will combine uh, several technology, technological breaks that we already talked about, but new one. Uh, with the objective and, and clear ambition to reach a reduction of minus uh, 50% in terms of uh, CO2. It's, it's a strong level of ambition that uh, will deliver uh, uh, by working on all we know we have to work on in order to reach this objective, working on the aerodynamics, working uh, on, on the weight, uh, uh, working on the power uh, on the power plant with the hybridization. Uh, but we know that uh, we have to do more so we'll work uh, with this uh, uh, concept helicopter, not only on the technological brick, but on the global architecture of, uh, of the helicopter. And when we combine this uh, techno bricks and this evolution, disruption on, this, uh, on the architecture, uh, we are convinced that we can uh, deliver this uh, high level of uh, ambition. So this uh, concept helicopter is really complementary to the flight lab that we have already presented to you, where we really focus on, uh, on, uh, on Technobricks. And uh, again, I think it illustrates uh, well the commitment uh, that we have in terms of innovation, in terms of sustainability. We want to pioneer a sustainable uh, aerospace. That's clearly, I think, a, a, a good example. But we want to do more through this uh, demonstrator, concept helicopter. We want to facilitate the transition also from innovation, R&T, to development. And that's what we will be able to do with this demonstrator, flying this uh, uh, concept and demonstrator. So yes, it's really exciting to, uh, to be at this time of the story of uh, Airbus helicopter with this challenge and this uh, demonstrator. But I think, uh, Thomas, you can tell us more. <coughs> with, ple with pleasure. So uh, uh, first, uh, something what is nice flies well look at the nice baby. Uh, so uh, I will point out really some uh, main innovation which allow us to reduce the uh, uh, CO2 emission. Look on the hub of this rotor. How integrated is its end now? So uh, hub of the helicopter is roughly 40% of the drag in a forward flight. This uh, uh, hub is our Intel blade concept with uh, Intel blade lead like dampers, which is completely compacted, and it gives to the other helicopters we made in the past reduction of the 40% of the drag. Yeah? So it is uh, really uh, an enormous step forward. Look, then also it's not visible very well on the landing gear, which is really highly integrated. A landing gear see, on a helicopter is always a mixture, a compromise between the rotor and, uh, and, the, and the landing gear due to the uh, ground resonance. And we managed here to test completely new concept, which we call three points. And, uh, really it allows to still reduce strongly the drag. Thomas, can I quickly ask you to be careful with the microphone? Okay, sorry. And uh, I would like also point out to the shape of the fuselage. We tested in the wind tunnel 40 configuration of the fuse to reduce the drag. And the reduction in the wind was 20% compared to the previous version. So look on the tail. Uh, is uh, tail without maintenance. So everything is integrated. You, uh, is just a simple cone. 
So there is a, a shaft inside, you don't maintain it at all. And the fenestron is also good in the mechanical part. The best mechanical part is the part you don't have. So we reduce the number of the pi part in the fenestron by 40% compared to the previous version. And uh, we celebrated uh, uh, two years ago 50 years of fenestron. And uh, this is uh, really our uh, uh, our invention and we uh, improve it all the time, keeping our own tradition. So this is the modulated fenestron to reduce the noise, but the number of pieces is strongly reduced. The um, diameter of hub is strongly reduced. It reduces global part of the tail, and of course, it reduces the drag. So you can see all these points we did in the uh, in the pre-design to reduce uh, to reduce the diacant. And uh, what is uh, uh, important also in the powertrain system. So we can tell what we can tell today in this room is this is really the powertrain hybrid design. So we learn also from automobile that hybridization is really strategic, but the design must be done deliberately for the hybridization. You cannot do it in the old version of helicopters because it's. Uh, uh, is everything is strongly integrated, okay, in, and this, uh, this is the case. So we introduce it here as reversible hybridization, allowing transmission of the power from, uh, from the turbine to the batteries and vice versa, and it's, uh, it will allow very strong reduce, reduction of the CO2 emissions. A truly amazing reveal. Uh, the disruptive lab is really a fantastic new concept helicopter. Um, and this was also, I think, a very interesting discussion listening to Abbas customers, but also learning again about the entire decarbonization roadmap of Abbas helicopters and how the industry is really working together to achieve clean vertical flight. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, it's again now time to get questions here from the audience or through our live stream. Um, as usual, when you have a question, raise your hand, microphone will come, please state your name and your publication, and then we can start. Do we have a first question here in the room? Yes, please, here. Hi, quick question for Thomas or Bruno. It's Dominic Perry from Flight Global. Um, what's your commercialization roadmap for the EBS system? And do you need to do any more testing towards that? Uh, well, uh, to put something on the market, you, we are really very, very pragmatic, and uh, really we must supply to the customer something to a robust and have affordable cost. So we are now validated uh, the complete the function, and we are now uh, evaluating and working with the supplier on the costs of all this function and the mass of the global system. And this is something what uh, we uh, want to get, get the Terra 6 by the mid of the next year. So uh, all the studies really must generate the value. It's not uh, enough to demonstrate something in flight, but you must, it must be affordable. And another question from the room. Yeah, Tim. Hi there, uh, Tim Robinson. Uh, a question to Thomas, I think. Uh, what are the challenges of... Um, making a hydrogen-powered helicopter. I mean, if you're thinking of the, you know, kind of, uh, you know, the, the sort of hydrogen tanks for liquid hydrogen on a helicopter, does that even work? Well, uh, of course, you know, in the hybridization, we are the front runners. For the hydrogen, our colleagues from the fixed wing are front runners, and we follow what uh, Glenn presented uh, uh, today. But... Uh, what is fundamental for helicopters is to reduce the energy for flight. You notice that our target in coming 10 years to reduce it by 50%. And we know the hydrogen is more voluminous and we can not uh, uh, reduce the mission done by our customers, they will not accept it. So we are perfectly in the logic 
first step reduce the energy for flight and the hydrogen will come later. We also have several questions from the live stream and to you, Tim and Jazz. Um, are you using SAF in your operations today? And if it's not the case, why? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, we don't have in Western Canada a sufficient supply of SAF to incorporate it in our operations at this time. Uh, we're very much looking forward to that changing. And uh, as soon as the supply is available, then we'll directly start to integrate it. Um, yes, we're a, a leasing company. We don't operate the aircraft, but many of our operators are asking about SAF, so I'll just give some ob observations here. Um, I think many of the Airbus helicopter helicopters are already certified to 50% SAF already. Um, and it's one of those things where you need the entire network to develop to make it really efficient. So, for example, if you're an operator in Nigeria, uh, currently it's quite probably more energy intensive getting the SAF down there for them to burn in lieu of Jet A1. So we just need to overcome, I think, some logistical challenges. And then number two is just the supply. Um, if you looked at some of the fixed wing roadmaps, around 65% of the path to net zero um, will be SAF or SAF like fuels. Uh, and we're just not producing them in the quantity that we require today. Uh, and even then, you can subdivide further and say, well, the power to liquid ratio is a very good way of producing fuel. Um, but let's try to avoid some of the analogous things that happened elsewhere with things like ethanol, where um, I'm sure you've done it before. You've, you solve one problem, but you create some, another one somewhere else. Um, so I can just give you the observations from our many, many customers that they are very interested in SAF, but just want to understand some of the log logistics and details behind it. Yeah, here in the front, another question from the audience here in Toulouse. Andreas Speet, German aviation journalist. Um, just a more bigger picture question. What I really ask myself is, with all the upcoming UAM technology, I suspect that this new, totally new field of aerial vehicles will probably take some of the business and the, um, the tasks that helicopters uh, do for us so far. Can you, have, or can you give us any estimate of yeah, how the helicopter industry will be faring with this new um, league of vehicles coming up and maybe also competing in some way? Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a question for you both, yes, as you have UM and... Of course, it's a question we ask uh, ourselves. Today, my answer would be that uh, I see the urban air mobility business being more a complement to the helicopter uh, business. Uh, if we take the example of the urban environment, uh, today one of the limitations we, we, we identify for the development of helicopter is the noise, is uh, the CO2, the fuel consumption, which is perceived in some urban uh, environment as a, uh, as a limitation. We could see also the question of the perceived safety, which is not always justified, because when we look at uh, the performance and the safety of a uh, helicopter, it's at high level, but the perceived safety could be also a limiting factor. And that's really what we want to address, because you know that uh, Airbus is totally committed to uh, the development of urban air mobility. That's what we want to address with new type of uh, architecture, new type of propulsion system, like City Airbus Next Gen, reduction of the noise, full electric power system, so carbon, uh, carbon neutral, and at the same time, full redundance of uh, all the equipment, no single point of uh, failure. And we are convinced that uh, by uh, certifying such a vehicle, we'll be able to develop, uh, to develop the business uh, uh, in urban environment. Uh, at the same time, when we look at the performance of the technology, uh, in particular some uh, critical one like uh, the battery. Uh, when we see that the performance that this vehicle will uh, deliver, we speak typically about uh, uh, 100 uh, nothing miles, 80 nothing miles, speed 120, 125 uh, uh, for, uh, for city Airbus next gen. We directly understand that uh, this is a type of mission that will not be able totally to replace what the helicopter are delivering, all weather conditions, 
uh, uh, in terms of uh, useful load, in terms of uh, range, in terms of polyvalence. So we really see this as an opportunity, not today as a threat in a sense where this uh, market, this uh, architecture would replace what the helicopter are delivering. We could imagine areas where uh, there will be overlap, but in my point of view, they will be very limited. Mm. And Jess, from a... Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. We have directed uh, capital there, as, as I said. Let's just understand each one very quickly, and then we'll see how they dovetail or not. Uh, on the eVTOL or UAM space, it's quite a broad church in itself, right? Small autonomous drones, um, cargo uh, logistic eVTOL, air taxi. It's an entire day in itself, and I think you're discussing that tomorrow. Um, helicopters, yes, they go from very small to very large. And when you start in talking about the drone part of uh, UAM, let's just say um, 100 to 200 nautical miles, 100 to let's say 300 kilograms, that could be quite useful. I mean, that could deliver um, engineering tooling to wind farms and uh, provide fire surveillance and so on and so forth. But once you start getting bigger, um, nothing can really do what a helicopter does in a modern, regulated, safe environment. So if you're looking at, let's say, six to nine ton MTO helicopters, essentially in the EMS space, essentially flying ambulances, um, that is just a unique piece of technology. That, any sort of disruption there will take many, many years. So I possibly see some complementary uh, overlaps. For example, in Australia, we've been asked by operators whether they can augment the helicopter rescue service with smaller drones, so these would go out Let's say you're on a nice beach in Australia and someone's in trouble. They would go out there, possibly drop a, drop a small life jacket, locate GPS where the, the person is, and then a helicopter comes with a winch and, and does the big business. So um, possibly at the lower end, but at the higher end, not for a long time, is my comment to your question. I would just like to add to that that as a commercial pilot for almost 25 years, um, a lot of the simpler tasks have already been replaced. We used to patrol, even as, as recent as last year, pipelines. And that uh, type of work for helicopters has gone in a different direction. But if you uh, have an injured person in the mountains who needs to be located, uh, you need a professional team. You need a hoist operator, a skilled hoist operator. You need a pilot that knows the terrain, knows the weather, and can get there in the last hours of daylight and perform a rescue, I don't see a threat uh, to that type of service uh, anytime soon, as well as uh, other specialized operations like forest fire suppression. There will be some impact there, but uh, the expertise that's developed in that industry um, is going to remain uh, a viable um, space. Great question. So do we have another one here from the audience? I'm just looking left and right. Not yet, but I have still some in the chat from the live stream. Bruno, um, you just revealed Disruptive Lab. Looks like a brand new helicopter. So why have you gone so far to just announce a demonstrator concept? Yeah, as we were just uh, mentioning, it's not only about uh, developing, maturing new technological bricks. Part of the performance to deliver this ambition will come from the new architecture of the helicopter. And this cannot be delivered through uh, an existing helicopter where we would uh, add some technological bricks. This is what we are doing with the Flight Lab. And uh, in terms of uh, autonomy, in terms of hybridization, we are validating some techno bricks. But this was clearly not achievable. The ambition we have was clearly not achievable uh, with this uh, flight lab. We had to go for a full uh, scale demonstrator with this new uh, architecture. Thomas, I don't know if you No, want it's to uh, clearly, clearly the case. This technology, we have several techno bricks. They will go. Uh, Someday uh, will work perfectly well, like usually. Someday we must improve them. Some the, of them will apply to, because they are very good on some uh, improvement or new projects. So it's really the um, association of dif different techno bricks that we must test on completely new architecture. And again, perhaps to complement one of the objectives of this uh, 
uh, disruptive lab is not only to demonstrate the ambition, but to facilitate the transition from innovation to development. The day we would decide to go for a program, it's really important to be able to demonstrate that we can mature the technology and the architecture. This is also one of the ambitions. Mm. A question here from the audience. Yeah, Tim here in the front. The microphone is coming. Uh, sorry, me again. Um, how much your, how much of the, the hybrid or the, the techno bricks are retrofittable into your existing legacy fleet of uh, people who are out there who might want to, um, you know, kind of make the hel helicopters greener? Uh, this is very, very simple. So we have uh, two kinds of demonstrator. Uh, uh, flight lab. Every what we test on the flight lab, we can retrofit. And disruptive lab, we change is completely new Afri Af architecture. This sum is something is completely new. So it's completely comp comp complementary logic. Huh? So we have 12,000 helicopters flying all over the world, so we know we must have the improvements on the flight lab, for instance, we tested recently the AirSAS rotor strike alerting system. We, will, we, we are testing also detection of the cables. We are testing advanced HAMS function with uh, uh, numerical accelerometers. And this, uh, all this technology, if uh, validated, if affordable, we can retrofit on the fleet. And uh, this adaptive lab is a completely different story. But I would have the same answers and. Uh the one you had in the previous round table when you were discussing about uh, the taxing. I think the, the challenge we have for uh, this new uh, technology, new technological bricks, not only to demonstrate the performance, but at the end, uh, uh, to bring value to the market. And bring value to the market in this case means also to be able to optimize uh, the weight, to optimize the cost. And this, most of the time, when it comes in particular to new innovation like hybridization, uh, means that you have to design from the beginning, not only at the subsystem level, but at the global architecture level. You need to think from the beginning with this uh, innovation. If not, then you come to a challenge in terms of, just to name a few, in terms of weight, in terms of, uh, in terms of cost. So you demonstrate the feasibility, but uh, when you have to go to uh, the development, then the value uh, is more difficult to demonstrate. So, I would say that for most of uh, this uh, techno, the question of the retrofit uh, will be difficult. We still have time for a last question, if there is one here in the audience. No? Then we are closing this amazing session with the reveal of a fantastic new helicopter concept. My dear panelists, thank you very much for joining us. It was a pleasure having you. You may now leave the stage. Big applause for you. And we are now coming to the end. And ladies and gentlemen here in the room, please stay seated also after we have closed the live stream because there's still further information to come. Ladies and gentlemen, sitting in front of your computer or having your smartphone in your hand, this closes the day one of the Airbus Summit 2022 under the motto, Gathering Pace Towards Sustainable Aerospace. Thank you for joining us. Don't forget, there is a second day. Um, please reconnect tomorrow at 9 o'clock Central European time and all the different sessions will be made available on Airbus.com. Thank you very much for joining us and all the best from Toulouse to the world. <laughs>